So I will, Bonnie, are we all good on your end? Yes, we're good to go. Thank you. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1215 session of the April 27th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. And I would like to please ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins? Here. Calentari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor Myers. Present. Thank you. The first uh, items this afternoon are proclamations. The first of which is the mayoral proclamation declaring the week of May 2nd through May 8th, 2021 as professional municipal clerk day, week, excuse me, week, and I'd like to just read a few items off the proclamation just briefly. This is a mayor's proclamation. Um, whereas the office of the municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local government bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, and whereas municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the offices, of the Office of the Municipal Clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, province, county, and international professional organizations. And whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the Office of the Municipal Clerk, and whereas as one of the only departments open during most of the pandemic, clerk administrative staff continue to assist members of the public both in person and over the phone. And whereas during 2020, when a worldwide pandemic hit, our city clerk and deputy city clerk worked tirelessly to make the transition to virtual meetings of the city council and commissions as smooth as possible while maintaining an open public lobby to provide uninterrupted service to the public while following COVID-19 protocols. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 2nd through the 8th, 2021, as Professional Municipal Clerks Week in the City of Santa Cruz in recognition of the exemplary dedication to public service and extend appreciation to our City Clerk, Bonnie Bush, Deputy City Clerk, Julia Wood, and the amazing staff of the City of Santa Cruz City Clerk's Office. So congratulations, Bonnie, Julia, and all the clerk staff. You guys do make this place work and uh, you make us work. We couldn't do any of this without you. So many, many kudos to you all and very, very proud to proclaim this week as um, municipal, municipal clerk week here. So thank you all very much. And the next proclamation I have to present today is declaring April, the month of April 2021 as Psychedelic Assisted Therapy Awareness Month. We have today Ali Fiducia, co-founder and executive director of Project New Day. And Ali, I will read the proclamation and if you have a few words, we'd be happy to hear from you. 
framing for this. So uh, council approved this project concept in June of 2020, so just last year. And as you know, the project includes a modern library, housing on the upper floors. Um, you know, council uh, directed that there would be a minimum of, of 50 affordable units, but we are really hoping to maximize housing on this site. And then of course, we've got parking consolidated into a structure with no more than 400 spaces. The first update I have related to the library mixed use project is this update about funding that we received uh, $500 million for affordable housing from the California Housing and Community Development Local Housing Trust Fund Grant Program. And this funding will be used across three city-led affordable housing projects, as you can see there, Pacific Station North, Pacific Station South, and then the Library Mixed Use Project. So that was really exciting news that we've gotten in the last couple months. Uh, next uh, update, we had a meeting with Congressman P Panetta, um, Council Member Cummings set up that meeting, and Vice Mayor Bruner was also able to be there, and we had an opportunity to share with the Congressman a little bit more about the project. We met him on lap four and talked him through the concept and how it was progressing forward, and I'm sure um, uh, Council Member Cummings and Vice Mayor Bruner can speak to this too, but he was very excited, very engaged, he asked really good questions, um, and really seemed excited by the opportunity, um, in particular the affordable housing and the uh, resource that a, a modern library can really be for a community. So that was a very exciting uh, development to happen over the last couple months. And then uh, we participated in the Downtown Association's Downtown Recovery Big Plans for the Future webinar, which uh, had a number of different projects uh, that brought a number of different projects happening in the downtown to kind of give updates. And this was a really exciting opportunity to really frame the library mixed use project in the larger picture of everything happening in downtown. There were updates on both Pacific, uh, Pacific Station North and South, the Pacific Front Laurel development, and other housing developments happening along the river in addition to the Warriors Arena. So that was just a really good opportunity for us to share more about this project and, and really within the larger context of all the really exciting things that are happening in downtown right now. Um, and then really getting to the meat of what we've been working on behind the scenes, um, we released two RFPs just this month. So the first one we released was an RFP for a master consultant, which is our affordable housing developer partner. So that went out earlier in this month and is due, as you can see there, May 12th. And this will be the partner that helps us to really pull together the affordable housing piece, help, help to figure out what the project's gonna look like, how many units we're gonna have, what funding do we need. They'll help us to pursue additional funding and really make um, um, that housing piece, that housing component really starting to come to life. And then the second RFP we released is for the master architect, and uh, this is will be the design team that'll help us to design what the, build, the exterior of the building really looks like, and then they'll have a real hands-on role to play in designing the interior of the library. And next steps and kind of where we're at, so um, last fall, as you know, we hired on the owner's representative, Griffin Structures. Um, April, as you can see, I'm very proud to have that checkbox there. We released two RFPs. We'll be looking to bring on both of those teams, both the affordable housing developer partner and master architect um, sometime around June. And then our goal is to launch a community engagement process around design this summer. And so there's gonna be a lot more coming before you and just a couple other time frames there for you that can kind of help to wrap your head around where we are in the process and what's to come. And then, as always, there's more information. Um, I'm working very hard to keep our project page updated, cityofsantacruz.com slash mixed use library. There's a button on there that says project updates. I've highlighted it for you there in green. And that's just a great place for the community to go to get up-to-date uh, notifications on what's happening. And, and um, I'm you know, posting there quite frequently. Every time something happens, it goes up on that page. And then the second set of updates I have for you are on the site reuse envisioning process that we launched this um, this month. We're working with the Project for Public Spaces and Group for Architects. And uh, this is sort of our engagement process so far. We've had, uh, we had a couple of stakeholder group engagement meetings. So we met with 14 representatives from nine different groups. Um, yesterday and Sunday, we hosted two community workshops. We had over 135 people sign up um, and 80 people attended those meetings to provide input on uses and activities that they would like to see on the site. And 
And we also set up a project web page that has updates, you know, next steps, recaps of all the things that have taken place so far. And where we are in that process, um, this is a little difficult to see, but this column says March, April, May. So the yellow circle that we have here um, is what we just finished, so those, those workshops. Um, and we have a number of other community engagement opportunities that we'll be bringing forward. Um, there's going to be a survey, and then we're creating a pop-up sort of in-person engagement opportunity. And that will allow us to be a little more nimble and flexible about where we're able to bring that engagement and who we're able to engage. Um, my goal is to really part with us, partner with other organizations and you know, we can put a kiosk in the library or um, you know, out in the community. So it allows to get a little bit more um, engagement from different demographics and people who may not have been aware of some of our other opportunities. And then the goal is to return to council on June 8th uh, with a report out of the whole process and then some recommendations for you to consider. And again, uh, the project webpage there is cityofsantacruz.com slash site reuse, and there's lots of information for the public there to access about the process. And that is my super quick update. Happy to take questions, or you know, I'm also always available if you want to email me things. So I'll defer to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I'm happy to have, um, we're right on time, so I'm happy to have any questions from council members. We do not um, take public comment on presentations, but if there's any council members with questions. Like not. Okay. Oh, wait, I've got a question from council member Brown. Thanks. Yeah, I just have uh, one question for now, and um, I, I guess I'm trying to wrap my mind around the um, the consultant work around this engagement process and kind of the other pieces that are being are moving forward. And so I'm just wondering, is this part of the? This is not part of the master contract. So it is. No, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not, okay, so you're, yeah. you're correct that they're two separate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just yeah, and so that those funds are coming from. Um, this, are we using funds for, for um, people are asking where the money is coming from to do this engagement process and some yeah. of the other aspects. So I'm just wanting to be able to answer questions about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So these are, um, while the projects are, are, sort of are interconnected and one is dependent on the other, they are very separate processes. So we hired a group for architects and project for public spaces to for an outreach and engagement contract around visioning for the library site. And that funding came out of economic development budget. The funding for the library mixed use project is a separate project that divides costs between um, Measure S and the parking fund and the affordable housing trust fund and, and other ED sources. So those are very much separate. They're budgeted separate and the funding sources they come out of are, are separate. I, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I was. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that's super important to clarify. So I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Okay. Any other questions from council members? Seeing none. Okay, we will move on. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, um, I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items the council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be opened for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 12 through 40 on the agenda. I'd like to ask council members if they have any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I will ask our city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to the agenda today. If there are none. Great. Uh, this is an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item 40 today. 
If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item 40. Okay, I'd like to call on our city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, thank you. Um, Mayor Myers, members of the city council, this morning the council met in closed session at 10 a.m. to discuss the following items. Um, pardon me, one second. The first item was uh, public employment. Uh, the council discussed the city manager recruitment uh, uh, in closed session. Second item was a conference with labor negotiators uh, pursuant to government code section 54957.6 involving uh, the following groups, fire, IAFF local 1716, fire management, OE3 mid manager and supervisor employees, SEIU local 521, and unrepresented employees. The council met with its uh, chief negotiator, Lisa Murphy, and gave direction. Um, there's also an item on your afternoon agenda that relates to this uh, discussion. Third item was a conference with legal counsel involving anticipated litigation. Council met to discuss one item of potential initiation of litigation. And then um, the fourth item was real property negotiations. Council met with its uh, negotiator, Parks and Rec Director Elliott, uh, to discuss the Poganet property and uh, potential lease uh, for the homeless garden project. Lastly, the council met with its legal counsel on an item of existing litigation. That is the Regents of the University of California at all versus City of Santa Cruz matters currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. There was no reportable action uh, at the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Kandati. We'll now move on to item number nine, which is our city manager's report. And I'll have uh, city manager Martin Bernal make his report. Thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, City Council. I've got uh, two updates this afternoon that I'm gonna ask uh, be provided to you. Uh, one is on the COVID-19, the latest on COVID-19 from uh, our party. And then secondly, uh, Lee Butler will provide an update on the uh, San Lorenzo Park encampment and the move over to the bench and the status of that. So I'll start with uh, uh, Chief Hyduk uh, giving an update on the latest on our COVID situation in our county. Thank you. Welcome, Chief Hyduk. Hi, Mayor, City Council. Um, so I have an update on uh, COVID, and I'm gonna start with uh, showing um, the slide that's worldwide cases. And I think if 16 months ago, you know, I think if, if you were like me, you were watching this going, oh, you know, we were at 10,000, we're at 100,000, we hit a million, that was a huge milestone. And worldwide, uh, we're approaching 150 million cases. And um, that's really significant. And um, obviously within the news, you can um, read about other parts of the world, specifically India, that are, are growing. Um, so we're not done with this, um, but I do have some, um, we, we have kind of a good news, bad news as far as where we're at. We can go to the next slide. So locally, our numbers are holding fairly steady as far as going in the right direction. Uh, and specifically, the number of COVID deaths um, has not uh, increased all that much since my last update two weeks ago. Um, the bad news is, is that I was optimistic that we were going to uh, be moved into the yellow tier today, and we just missed the metrics for that. And so our next opportunity for that will come in two weeks. And I'm optimistic that we will hit that benchmark uh, at that point. Um, but our cases are holding fairly steady in the county as a whole, and we are moving in the right direction. Um, it's just, uh, we're not done with it yet. Um, next slide, please. So this really shows um, the, the change that uh, we've been having here in the county over, it's a rolling 14-day average. Um, the last update two weeks ago, that 14-day change was uh, minus 20%. We're now at minus 32%. So if you're looking at uh, graphs as far as growth and, and uh, decrease, this is the right direction. So as a whole, compared to other parts of the nation and the state and the world, we are heading in the right direction. Um, but I would caution everyone that we're not done with this yet, even though um, the news is optimistically good for us here locally. And the next slide. 
this is um, taken from the California COVID website, and it shows the number of people statewide that have been vaccinated. And here locally, um, over 75, uh, we've got about a 90% vaccination rate, and they are moving pretty aggressively with, um, you know, uh, with giving vaccinations to anyone who's eligible. And there's been 237,000 doses of vaccine given out within Santa Cruz County. Now, obviously, that's not um, the entire population because of the, the single dose and uh, the subsequent follow-up uh, for the two shot for Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, had a few um, really negative uh, impacts in a really small group of people. And today, they re-released it after looking at the numbers and, um, and what was going on with that. So that vaccination is going to be our pathway out of this. Uh, in India, one of the, the issues that they're finding right now is that they have about 20% of their population was vaccinated, and they also had a huge portion of their population that early in this pandemic got COVID. And so they were kind of thinking that potentially they had that herd immunity. What they're finding now is within that people that did not get vaccinated, they are getting uh, COVID now from a new variant that's much more virulent and uh, transmissible. And so uh, that, that's why they are where they are at right now. Uh, their population has about 20% that's been vaccinated, and they're having a huge surge for almost a million cases in three days. And so that vaccination component, if you've had uh, COVID in the past, you may not be protected against um, getting COVID again, which is really the kind of message I want to um, give out to everyone. Next slide. So with that being said about vaccines, um, all Californians 16 and over are eligible for vaccination. And the two portals that you can go to are myturn.ca.gov uh, or to santacruzhealth.org. Um, one thing with the MyTurn is if you log on to that and you enter into it, it may say that there's no vaccination appointment available. Keep scrolling down. There's a number of other entities that um, have vaccinations available. And we're now to the point here locally uh, within the Bay Area and within Santa Cruz that we have the supply to meet the demand. And now the challenge is finding people who um, are going to get vaccinated. So we need to push that message. So my turn, when you go there and they say there's no um, appointments available, keep scrolling down. Uh, they've opened it up to a number of different agencies, whether it's a hospital, whether it's Safeway, um, there's a number of different um, uh, mechanisms for you to get vaccinated and it is available. They're also optimistic that the under 16 crowd, the vaccination should be available by the end of May, beginning of June. Um, and so that will get that other um, population base that's here within our county. So we're doing really good, um, but really need to keep urging people to uh, make an appointment. Even if you've had COVID, get vaccinated. And that's what will get us out of this, um, you know, where we're at right now. And then next slide. And then lastly, um, I know I'm a broken record on this, but it's those basic things we can do um, as far as washing your hands, wearing a mask, keeping your distance, and just don't go out if you're sick. Um, the CDC is releasing new guidelines about what vaccinated folks can do for masking and whatnot. But really these very simple things, um, even with or without a vaccine are, are going to help us. And again, you can go to santacruzhealth.org for local information or to my turn uh, for state information about where you can get vaccinated. Um, that's what I have for you today. And I'm willing, uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Thank you, Chief Hedrick. Um, I see Council Member Cummings has his hand up and then Council Member Watkins and Council Member Collintari Johnson. Thank you, Chief, for that presentation. I was just curious um, with regards to um, moving into the yellow tier. I was just wondering what um, guess what what metric did we not meet that uh, prevented us from moving into that tier? There's a, uh, a it's an adjusted quartile as far as um, at risk population number of vaccines in comparison to um, the overall positivity rate, and we missed it by just a few tenths of a percent. Um, so we have to stay within that tier or those metrics for two weeks. And so that's why, um, you know, we're not moving forward uh, tomorrow. I was, like I said, I was optimistic that it was going to happen. Uh, a little disappointed that it didn't. But given uh, where we could be in relation to other parts of the world and the nation, uh, we're doing well. We're just not doing as well as we'd like. Thanks. Council Member Watkins. Um, I thank you for the presentation and for your work on this. 
Um, just to make sure I heard you correctly, so you're anticipating by May, June, under 16 will be eligible, or they're anticipating under 16 will be eligible for vaccines? Yeah, that, that's the latest information from the county health officer that um, they're hoping to have the guidelines and the vaccination rollout for that age 12 to 16. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, that once you get younger than that, um, there's some developmental issues as far as your immune system. Um, and probably better off asking a pediatrician or a doctor about that. But they are looking for under 16 toward the end of May, beginning of June, which um, will target that population that's been um, missing out so far. Great, thank you. And council member Calentari Johnson. Thank you so much, Chief Heidi, for the presentation. Um, I know that we had a, we continue to have a robust public health sort of effort around how to stay safe. Um, do you know of these efforts around getting vaccinated now that we have the supply that we need um, locally and at the state, uh, what's being done to push the message for vaccination? Well, I think this is part of it, but also this is coming from the you know county, uh, the county health officer, the state health officer, and they're also what they call their MCEs, which is uh, their multi-county uh, entities. So Dignity Health, PAMP, Kaiser, they've rolled this out into um, you know CVS, Safeway pharmacies, and you know they keep pushing that message to get vaccinated. I know that the county is also really um, targeting uh, what they call homebound. And so those are people who may not be able to travel to a clinic, they're going to travel to them. And so they're trying to identify um, that group. And what they've done is taken a very targeted approach to those who are most at risk, either because of age or medical conditions, try to meet their needs. And now they're trying to get the general population. And so that message is that getting vaccinated is what will get us you know, through this uh, with as little impact as possible. I know that um, when we were first moving out with public health campaigns around how to stay safe, the county funded some organizations in South County through the Community Health Trust to get um, culturally responsive messaging out. So I, I'm wondering if that if there's an opportunity for that, but, but that's probably a question for the county. Uh, might be a question for the county. I, I believe that they were funding Salud Parla Gente and some of those entities that are actually healthcare providers, not necessarily uh, a city entity. Um, mm -hmm. But they were trying to target um, specifically some of uh, the farm workers because uh, right. they viewed that as a high risk. And so they were trying to be language appropriate, culturally appropriate, and trying to overcome some of those barriers so they could vaccinate that population uh, quickly. Thank you so much. Sorry, Council Member Golder. I was wondering if there's been outreach or, or um, if there's been vaccinations available for the homeless population through the HPHP or what percentage of that population has had access to the vaccine. I don't have the specific numbers as far as who has been vaccinated within that population. I do know that the county has targeted that population specifically and has done outreach. And my understanding is a significant portion of those who are willing to be vaccinated have been vaccinated. Um, at this point, they have the supply, uh, 16 and older. And so um, that is, you know, that is a group that they were specifically targeting earlier on. And so it's available, whether or not that they um, have been able to uh, vaccinate that entire group. I don't know the numbers, but I do know that they've made significant outreach efforts uh, to, that, to that population specifically. I can add that uh, what I've heard is that uh, it's been offered uh, particularly to those in the uh, encampments, but uh, there is kind of a high rate of uh, not accepting it, uh, which is a bit of a concern, uh, is my understanding. I don't have the precise number, but th there is a bit of concern about, about that. Any other questions for Chief Hedrick? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry we missed the uh, tier also, but thank you for all the, for the updates. We appreciate it, Jason. All right, uh, we'll have Lee now uh, an update on the uh, campaign. Thanks, Martine, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, 
Lee Butler, I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development and Homeless Response for the City, and um, everyone's aware of the federal injunction in San Lorenzo Park and our need to allow campers to remain at that location. Um, in an effort to um, conduct maintenance and increase usability of the upper park area, we suggested at the last federal court hearing that if the judge was not willing to release the injunction, that we could move individuals who were camping in the park to the lower benchlands area. And the plaintiffs in the case and the judge agreed to that. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we noticed that area, the benchlands area, to vacate that area so we could begin preparing it. That occurred, um, and as of yesterday, we began moving individuals from the upper San Lorenzo Park down into the benchlands area. They moved about um, 40 um, people yesterday, and um, we've issued 100 vouchers. So um, today, we're looking to do another 40 or 60 people um, and have them relocate down to the benchlands from San Lorenzo Park. Um, there's been a lot of outreach to those individuals, and so that move was really successful and smooth yesterday. We are planning on closing the upper portion of the park on Friday so that we can begin that cleanup. Um, this is um, not intended to be a permanent location. The council has um, provided direction um, regarding um, having camps available, or excuse me, having um, uh, parks available for um, the broader community, but we are, during this injunction, um, looking at um, capitalizing on the resource that we have there at the Benchlands, um, and we'll be moving towards a focus on um, safe sleeping um, in sanctioned areas. Um, the next federal court hearing for this is on May 13th, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Are there any questions for Lee on these items? Um, I guess I have a question, Lee. I, this was mostly focused on San Lorenzo Park. Um, can you give us a very quick update on Highway 1 and 9? Sure, absolutely. So um, we are continuing to coordinate with um, the county, the state, both in Caltrans and um, CHP, the California Highway Patrol, and um, we're meeting with them regularly. Um, they have um, requested some additional information about outreach statistics from both us and from the County of Santa Cruz outreach workers, and so we're providing that. So they are um, moving forward with the um, steps so that they can close that area. Okay. And is there a projected timeline, or is it still sort of to be to be known as it kind of rolls out? It's still to be determined, um, but um, they are working toward gathering that information so that they um, can have a, a definitive timeline. Um, but we're um, we're providing that information as they request and um, expect that um, Caltrans is going to be, um, they, they do expect that, that they will get the green light from um, their, from both the, the Caltrans uh, folks as well as the governor's office. And I think, in fact, I think they've already gotten a green light from the governor's office, so they're collecting information to um, make sure that they've got all the, the background information for when they um, go out and request that people move. Great. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Council Member Cummings? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a question. I know that um, we provided direction for staff to kind of work on developing the safe sleeping sites and the storage program and that there's an ordinance that's going to be coming back on May 11th. And I'm just wondering if you can provide an update on, you know, whether there's updates on what kind of outreach has occurred um, with the community on the development of the ordinance and kind of where those safe sleeping and storage programs are at in terms of um, outreach that's been done with service providers, you know, RFPs, anything like that that's occurred since last meeting. Sure. So you'll, um, we are including an update on that as part of the May 11th um, agenda report on the ordinance. So you'll have um, some additional details related to that then. Um, but just very briefly, um, 
we have been working on the RFQ and um, went through some final questions that we had. Uh, we've been also been coordinating with the county. At this point, we are not going to release the RFP, or excuse me, RFQ as a joint uh, release with the county. That was something that we were um, discussing with them. Um, but um, we really want to move forward uh, quickly. This is this is a uh, the, the RFQ is a critical path item towards um, getting those safe sleeping sites up and operating. And so um, we have pulled some of the information that was uh, uh, county specific out of the RFQ and we were just this morning working through um, some of the um, final um, revisions that we have before shipping that off to the, um, the city attorney and our risk managers. And so we're expecting that that will be out in um, pending that uh, attorney review, you know, roughly in approximately two weeks, um, we'll be releasing that RFQ. And then we have also been talking about what is that outreach um, component um, going to look like. Um, there is going to be a um, an overlap um, in, in timing in terms of us going out to the community while the RFP is out there. And I think that that is, or excuse me, RFQ is out on the street. And I think that will be helpful because that can inform um, the um, information that um, we receive back. And it also, um, you know, we may be able to issue if we're hearing information that um, is helpful um, that some of these service providers may know, we um, could issue an addendum to and the RFQ, for example, and say, hey, we heard this great idea in the community. If anyone has thoughts about this, then that could be included in the response to their request for qualifications as well. So we are um, designing that outreach effort right now, and we'll have a few more specifics um, before the May 11th. I don't think that any of the um, outreach itself, um, maybe some of the targeted outreach, but not some of the larger outreach. We probably won't have that ready um, before the May 11th, but we may have opportunities to speak some of, to some of the specific service providers um, in advance of that May 11th hearing. And then just briefly, as it relates to the ordinance, I know that you know there's a lot of interest in community members wanting to weigh in on that before it came back. Is there, if we're, and I've gotten some emails and been contacted by members of the community who were wondering how they might be able to weigh in or you know what the process is and where things are at. And so if we're getting those communications, what's the best way for us to either, who should we direct those concerns to or you know are there opportunities for people to weigh in and how can we get this information to people? We will be, um, we are happy to post the ordinance on the website when it's available. Um, the ordinance, the council has directed um, changes to two primary sections, um, 6.36.040 and 6.36.050. That is the allowable areas and the prohibited areas um, that are identified in the ordinance. And essentially, the, the council has said that camping will be prohibited in all areas when a um, uh, when a alternative location for sleeping can be provided. So when we can direct someone to a safe sleeping location, to a shelter bed, to a managed encampment, then. Um, they would not be able to camp anywhere else in the city. So, so the ordinance is actually um, uh, fairly um, simple, uh, simpler than before, except there are some, some nuances that we're still working through in terms of the language itself. So um, if we have that information available in advance, we're happy to post it. We are still working through that right now um, in terms of some of those specifics, but um, it is feasible that we will have that posted and we can post it on www.cityofsantacruz.com slash homelessness. And um, it, there'll be a link to the, um, the information on that page. And just to add also that the it's also coming back, obviously, as a, uh, well, not obviously, it's coming back as a first reading uh, at the main meeting. So there'll still be the issuance of the agenda reports and the agenda packet like there normally is. And then there'll be a second reading two weeks after that. So there's a, a number of opportunities for the public to weigh in as well uh, during public hearings as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Lee on, on these items? Not seeing any hands. 
Okay. Great. Thank you, Lee. And thank you, thank Martine. You. Okay. So we will move on to item number 10, which uh, will be, um, I will now call on the clerk, city clerk, to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Great. And now is uh, time for item number 11. This is council memberships in city groups and outside agencies. This is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authorities meetings. For future meetings, um, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. So I will look for council members. Um, why don't I start with council member Brown and uh, I'll just have you guys go from there around the, the circle here. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am gonna start with the Regional Transportation Commission update. Uh, so we have, uh, at our last meeting, we had a, a bit of a stalemate. So we're in limbo here regarding accepting a business plan that was uh, developed to uh, consider the costs of uh, op building and operating a uh, light rail system on uh, passenger rail system on our right of way. And uh, so we, because that has already been adopted as the um, alternative, the the alternative, uh, preferred alternative, excuse me. And um, so we are now going back to uh, discuss it again at our next meeting. This is a pretty important issue. We have an item on our agenda um, for later today. So, and hopefully you've seen that. Um, so we have uh, a, a split RTC, um, spl a split among the commissioners and um, we'll, it'll be revisited. So if for people who are interested, watch for that at our next meeting. Um, the, uh, the Area Agency on Aging, I, uh, a couple of months ago, announced uh, a meeting for the Master Plan on Aging process um, uh, launch, our local launch. And um, I'll just say again that the, the state has now, um, uh, the state is in the process of developing a new Master Plan on Aging. And this is really like, very, very new thing. It's um, it's pretty exciting that um, there there's a recognition this, in this way that um, all of these programs and systems can be better coordinated to serve our seniors at the local level. And so that launch actually got postponed, and it will ha be happening on um, the Wednesday, May. I think it's the 18th. 19th, excuse me, uh, Wednesday, May 19th. Uh, check out the AAA uh, website if you wanna uh, participate and um, you can also contact me for more info. Uh, the, um, we, oh, I participated uh, in the, in a forum to discuss the uh, UCSC um, LRDP environmental impact report and I was there on behalf of the uh, city county task force on UCSC growth uh, along with the advocate who um, is funded through the city and county to coordinate our work and uh, we had a a uh, lot of, it was a great um, conversation in, in many ways. Um, we It was a lot of speakers who talking about different aspects. And so it was, um, you know, pretty wi wide ranging. There is a video of that, which you can uh, access. And I'm happy to send the link for anybody who's interested. Um, the last item I wanted to mention, although I kind of want to give um, Vice Mayor Bruner the opportunity to report on this if you want to, because you put together such an amazing uh, overview, written notes on uh, uh, the visit that we had to the um, Building Trades Construction Council, uh, several uh, apprenticeship training sites. And um, it, so we were able to see uh, what's happening at the electrical workers and the sheet metal workers. And um, it was really, really, I'm just gonna say it was really fun and we learned a lot. And I'm gonna let um, Vice Mayor Bruner uh, talk about the rest of it. And I think that's all I got, thanks. Okay, thank you, Council Member Brown. I've got Council Member Golder next. So I, on May 4th, or May, April 14th, I went to the 
stand by meeting and uh, there was two um, informational items. Um, the one I found most interesting was the climate action plan for transportation infrastructure that CAPTI was talking about the, the, this is kind of just an informational item, but talking about some of the um, steps that the state's working for creating kind of this, this holistic um, framework for infrastructure um, and looking at climate change and health and social equity. And one of the things, or there's three like kind of main things they were t discussing in one was um, building a integrated statewide trail, I'm excuse me, rail transit network and investing in safe and accessible bicycle and transportation um, infrastructure and investments in light, medium, and heavy duty zero emissions vehicles. And um, that was one of the informational items. And the other one was a, a, a creating a rural regional energy network. And so it, um, those were the two main informational items at the meeting I attended. Thank you, Council Member Golder. I'll uh, have Council Member Kalantari Johnson go next. Great, thank you. Um, so I attended with um, Council Member Golder and Watkins, the City Schools Committee, um, and it was a very robust meeting. I have my notes in front of me, and I'll, I'll try to synthesize. Uh, we received an update from uh, Executive Director of First Five, David Brody, on the County Thrive by Three funds, um, and he shared that um, the City of Santa Cruz funds, there was, let me see, $30,000 provided to child care providers um, serving 172 children. Um, the, the amount ranged from 1300 to 5000 uh, to really meet the needs during COVID, um, safety supplies, um, providing care. So that was, that was a really wonderful um, report to get back. And uh, with the city's children fund, we have distributed $20,000 in scholarships, and um, there's a little bit of surplus as um, we haven't had our, our camps to the, to the full degree that we've had in the past, so there's some discussion around the surplus funds. Um, we did discuss a potential partnership um, with the SEEDS program, uh, which is a program that invests, that opens up a bank account for every child born in Santa Cruz. Um, with a $50 account that goes towards a college fund. So we talked about what that partnership looks like. Council member um, Watkins and I serve on that seeds committee. And let's see, um, we heard from um, Superintendent Chris Monroe from Santa Cruz City Schools about um, their summer camp program. They received some funding from the federal government to do some care in the summer. Um, not many hours, so we're looking at what partnership could look like there. And our city summer programs activity guide has um, it's gone live. So thank you to the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, so the we looked at the flyer. It's in English and Spanish. Registration is this weekend, and um, there's opportunity for um, Loud and Nelson will be available for people who need internet access, um, and there will be Spanish speaking support available, and that's from eight to twelve. Uh, this Saturday, May 1st. Um, that's kind of the highlights, and I'll, and I'll let Council Member Golder and Watkins add anything to that if I missed big pieces. Okay, I guess not. Um, the other meeting that I participated in with uh, Mayor Myers was the Metro Board meeting just last Friday. Uh, let's see. So. No new COVID cases at the Metro since middle of March, so that's really good news. Uh, we have 62% of the Metro workers vaccinated and uh, the team is actively working on increasing that percentage. Um, we are continuing to increase our bus capacity and we'll reevaluate when the governor announces the green tier of, of what that'll look like when we're in the green tier. The intent is to go to full capacity by the time that college and university students are back in the fall. We have our fourth electric bus, which has arrived in our county, and so there's a lot of training for bus drivers, and we're hoping to put that uh, bus in circulation in the fall. And uh, bus ridership is heading in the right direction. Uh, we went from about 17,000 a week in March to over 
23,000 a week on the week of April 17th. So it's, it's not at the rate that it was clearly, but it's heading in the right direction. So those are my updates for the Metro Board and Mayor Myers, if you have anything to add. I think you covered you covered all the high, the main points. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I've got one more update. <laughs> it's been a it's been a wonderful month of being engaged with the community. Um, I met with the staff of the Youth Action Network, and they have been doing some wonderful stuff. Um, they're in a four phase planning process of really the Youth Action Network used to be the Youth Violence Prevention Network. They're really restructuring it, and without going into all the details, the main focus is really. Um, looking for opportunities to enhance youth leadership and youth voice, in particular around uh, community and city and county decision-making processes. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for partnership there. Um, they will be hosting a kickoff event in the fall, and they hope to come to each of the jurisdictions, including our city, to make a full presentation then. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you for those updates, Council Member. I will go ahead and call on Council Member Cummings now, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the first um, item I'd like to bring up is, so LAFCO, um, at the last LAFCO meeting, we had a couple of uh, action items that occurred. Um, the first one was um, the commission adopted a draft resolution approving the extraterritorial service agreement involving the city of Scotts Valley and properties on Pippin Way and Bellflower Way. Um, so this extended um, the, the sewer services uh, from Scotts Valley onto those adjacent um, properties that were outside of their sphere of influence. Uh, the next was that we adopted a draft resolution approving the draft budget for fiscal year 2021-2022. Um, LAFCO took a support position on uh, Assembly Bill 1581, and um, that bill, um, it made a minor non-substantive changes to the Cortese knox Hertzberg Local Government Reorganization Act of 2000. And then um, the last item that we had at our meeting was appreciation for Commission Clerk, Clerk Deborah Means. Um, Commission Clerk Deborah Means uh, had served as the Clerk of LAFCO for 19 years and uh, has now moved on to retirement. And so we had a nice little ceremony to extend our appreciation to her 19 years of service on LAFCO. Um, in addition to LAFCO, um, the uh, Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee has been meeting uh, almost weekly um, at this point in time. And over the course of the last month, we had a number of discussions, but to kind of bring it folks up to speed with where we're at, um, we have identified a poller who will be um, polling the community on a more or less, uh, if we move forward with um, a, a quarter cent sales tax increase, like what um, those, what that revenue would go towards. And so we've been discussing, um, you know, a number of different items related to infrastructure, homelessness. Uh, and so that, as we continue to refine that poll, um, which we've been working with the poller to identify the appropriate questions and um, to um, ensure that we're, the poll is gonna um, really be able to help people identify what they'd like to see the funding go towards um, as far as priorita prioritization. Um, that poll will be going out, I think, in the next couple of weeks so we can get feedback from the community on if we were to move forward with um, a sales tax increase, what would the community like to see that funding go towards? And hopefully in the next coming weeks and months, we'll be able to uh, bring something to council as far as kind of what our next steps will be um, with regards to a revenue measure. Um, and I'll, and uh, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor Bruner have both been in those meetings, and so if there's anything I missed, please feel free to, um, to chime in as well with that. Um, and then looking at the other appointments, um, tomorrow we will have our public safety meeting, so and I think that is going to be, I just want to look at the calendar. Um, 
that will be starting at 5.30 via Zoom. So if there's members of the public who would like to um, participate or would like to view the public safety meeting, um, it will be occurring tomorrow at 5.30, and you can find the details on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. And with that, um, I believe that concludes um, Actually, there's one more item I wanted to mention. Um, as a community member, I've been uh, working with the uh, uh, Criminal Justice Council's ad hoc um, public safety committee, and I just want to let members of the public know that we developed a survey that went out to all to um, every law enforcement agency in the, in the county, so Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, Capitola, the Sheriff's Department, um, and Watsonville really uh, asking about different types of policies that relate to use of force um, and bias. Uh, we And also we, we sent that survey to probation. We received responses from all of those agencies, so every agency participated in the survey. And um, we'll be having a another ad hoc meeting on the 30th um, in preparation for the next Criminal Justice Council meeting, which will be on May 13th. And so um, we'll be pulling those results together and determining steps forward. But ultimately, our goal will be to have some kind of report that will be released um, to the Criminal Justice Council, to the broader community around aligning uh, public safety policies across the, the uh, county. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Next up would be Vice Mayor Bruner. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, I will be reporting on um, uh, the two by two committee. We met and um, we had a lot of discussion on coordination on services. Um, this is for um, those experiencing homelessness and our unhoused uh, folks in the city, but coordinating on services and connecting to county uh, services, um, including release of info form to county services, um, public property management and how that relates to services and how staff can coordinate with services and clarifying those roles and responsibilities more. Um, looking at short term and long term, um, they were able to update us on, um, and Mayor Meyer sits on this as well, so uh, feel free to add on, um, but massive structural funding across California and, um, you know, looking at county, um, for example, their budget, a quarter of the behavioral health budget is on in-person hospitalization, um, talked about things like drug medical is great, but the county still has to come up with a 50% match. Um, so they're looking at next fiscal year, a lot of reductions and pots of discretionary funding to help cover. Um, so they're working on going through their certain pots is my understanding. Um, and, um, you know, because we, we brought up some of the mental health and substance use disorder treatments and services needed in addition to housing and the different types of housing needed um, and outreach efforts, um, including getting people to enroll in Medi-Cal. Um, so expansion of eligibility staff and the idea of a shared vendor pool for the city and county. Um, and, um, you know, and how it relates to city, for example, storage options, which could align with the pool of vendors, um, managed encampments, and um, uh, uh, working with the U.S. Integrity Agency on Homelessness to help bridge any uh, collaborations. Um, let's see. There was a lot in this. <laughs> um, so September, December, there's some one-time COVID-19 relief funding that's going away and um, looking at what locations to use for what purpose and what funding, also looking at exit resources. Um, they mentioned about 300 people a year have been helped from homelessness to housing. So how can we keep keep on that path, if not increase it. Um, 
and um, looking at resources of rental assistance, soft skills to get into housing, um, not having shelters be like a place for people to get stuck, and um, the resources needed to move to per more permanent housing, so shelters, transitional housing, um, you know, transitional age youth housing, permanent supportive housing, low income housing, um, and uh, resources for public property, like a management team, an outreach team, um, and uh, what else? Um, uh, we, we also talked about a joint plan on, or just the, the, the emphasis on joint working jointly uh, and articulating what the funding needs are in order to give um, direction and make decisions um, and with resources for county and city, knowing that it's all limited and um, setting those priorities. Um, so, Mayor Myers, you can add anything else to that if I missed anything. Um, um, Vice Mayor, is that the council will have a special uh, meeting on May mm -hmm. 18th. Um, excuse me. I think it's a May. Present, yeah, May 18th will be a presentation. Uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. and the county will be presenting the, um, the countywide plan to the council as well as um, a proposal for some change in governance as well. So just want to let the public know that that's from 5 to 6 on May 18th, and that'll be a special uh, city council study, uh, or excuse me, a special city council meeting um, with county staff coming to, to do that presentation for us. That's the only thing. I think you've got everything else. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so moving on, Council Member Brown and I attended um, the uh, trade, the building trades. Uh, we did an apprenticeship program tour. All council members were invited. They will be having future dates. Um, this past Saturday, Council Member Brown and I were able to go. It was um, a great tour and very um, informative and um, met some really interesting people and have a deeper understanding of the apprenticeship programs that are offered. Our first stop, they were all three in Coralitos. It was my first time leaving Santa Cruz in a year and several months, and it was to Coralitos. <laughs> Um, so it, our first stop was IBEW Electrical, and um, we learned that um, their apprentices received education through Hartnell College enrollment and attend classes two nights a week while, uh, while working out in the field with a journeyman and gaining that out in the field experience and earning a living wage. Um, um, they also receive health insurance, retirement benefits while in the program. It's a five-year apprenticeship program, um, and they're really encouraging women to join as well. They've had women um, throughout the years, but um, really trying to expand expand um, that. Um, our next stop was the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104, and um, their apprentices learn skills like architectural design, CAD detailing, um, testing, industrial, kitchen, HVAC systems, etc. Um, like the electrical, there are math tests and um, many subject books to get through. It's also a five-year apprenticeship program, also working in the field uh, with the journeyman um, uh, while attending classes two times a week. Um, it was really nice uh, while we were there, one of the third-year apprenticeships apprentice students was there and um, 
uh, turned out it was uh, someone that had gone to preschool and was in scouts with my son. So it was nice to see um, that progression. There were other apprentices there that spoke of their stories and the program, and um, the next stop was the Plumber 62. Um, they, besides water and pipes, they talked about how they learned medical gas installation, welding, rigging, cranes, uh, knots, OSHA, CPR certification, and all of the school locations we visited were very hands-on. Um, and I took a lot of pictures. It's very interesting. Um, they also have a lot of math and um, they have some interesting stats by zip code in terms of uh, uh, metrics and who, data of who's in their programs. Um, and there's also a pre-apprenticeship program that's a good way for um, people to see if it's a good fit. One of the interesting stats they said is it used to historically be primarily people out of high school around age 18 that would enter into these programs and now they're seeing a shift into more older um, apprentices coming in around you know 26 to 35 um, and um, they're just really trying to you know build the workforce and um, in this way so it was very interesting uh, also uh, we had a city manager subcommittee meeting and um, we also had the revenue, uh, the ad hoc revenue committee meeting which council member Cummings spoke to. Um, and so Donna, I will let you speak to the rest. Okay, thank you, council member. I mean, Vice Mayor Bruner. <laughs> I will call on uh, council member Watkins and then I'll go left. Did, did Councilmember Brown, I saw your hand up. Did you? Oh, yeah, sorry, Councilmember Brown. Sorry to interrupt. I, I just wanted to add two things. Um, so it was actually Castroville. I know they're, I get them con in unincorporated North Monterey County. Thank you. Uh, so that, and they have a huge industrial area there that, um, you know, where they have space. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say was that for those of you who didn't go, we got toolboxes. I don't know if you can see it here. You probably can't see it with my green screen, but uh, we got toolboxes that were made by apprentices in the sheet metal program. So um, that was pretty awesome. And I actually just remembered a third thing. The um, one of the reasons that the um, the folks that we talked with. Uh, said they, they believe that the later entry into the apprenticeship programs was in part related to the elimination of uh, industrial trade programs in the high schools. And so they've been working with the Workforce Investment Board and I believe the County Office of Education in Santa Cruz as well as Monterey and then Hartnell and, and Cabrillo to try to um, fill in some of the, the lost um, pipeline uh, pipelines that um, no longer exist. And so um, that was really good to hear as well. Thank you for adding that. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Great. Yeah, no, thank, thank you to my colleagues for all of their work in the community outside of our meetings. Um, thank you also to the update around visiting the different uh, trades and all of the work that's happening there and just really an exclamation mark on wanting to continue to stay connected on trying to get career pathways and opportunities for our workers here. I, I think a lot of what I was going to talk about has already been covered by my colleagues who share these various committees with me. Um, the only thing I would add to the city schools committee is the potential partnership between the city schools and the city parks and rec department for after school programming and really trying to look at how do we extend the day for our families and students um, in a way that allows them to have a really fun experience after school as well. And so hoping that uh, that partnership will uh, come to fruition and not only provide a good experience for the kids, but also support the working families that uh, could use a little extra care. And I know Councilor Boulder is um, 
part of that. So thank you, Councilman Gold, for what you do in education. Um, the other thing is, in regards to our public safety meeting tomorrow, I just really wanted to highlight one thing that's on the agenda, which is redefining public safety. And it's really exciting. It's something I learned about in Sacramento. And uh, other communities are really having an open conversation about really what to, to what, what do their community members think about when they think of public safety? And so we're all on the same page with shared definition of language. And um, I'm really excited to have that conversation tomorrow. So I just sort of wanted to highlight that as one of the agenda items that we have. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to highlight also what's on our agenda and it's uh, the proclamation that declares the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. It's in the agenda packet. Um, just wanted to kind of speak to that and really thank our family and children's services partners, my partners at the Children's Network, really looking to raise awareness about uh, child abuse prevention, but ultimately look at how we're creating conditions for families and students to succeed in, um, in the first place. So uh, really exciting work happening around uh, those social determinants of health, and thank you, Mayor, for uh, the proclamation declaring April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. And I think that's, that's where I'll leave my updates. Okay, thank you, Council Member Watkins. And my, um, most of my updates have been discussed. Um, they, I, we, we had a uh, Downtown Management Corporation um, board meeting a while back now. Um, actually, uh, one of those outcomes will be, is actually on our agenda today, the Downtown POP program. And um, so the Downtown Management Corporation continues to bring work with the Economic Development Department and property owners um, and tenants downtown to, um, through Downtown Association and other partners to um, really focus on uh, some of the um, uh, needs downtown in terms of getting um, downtown reopened, uh, getting some really uh, neat and creative uh, ideas going with um, the, some of the empty, uh, storefronts that are currently empty, but hopefully a little bit ago, much longer. And um, so, yeah, the Downtown Management Corporation has just been doing really great work the whole month, as has, as has the Downtown Association, uh, on really just visioning downtown and what's what we can be will be doing over the next couple of years to to. Um, to uh, really get downtown up and running again. So some really great work coming out of um, that group. And uh, our next meeting is on May 20th, the Downtown Management Corporation at 8.30. Um, the only other thing I guess I will just let's make sure the public knows as part of um, the subcommittee on the city manager recruitment is um, on the city's website. Uh, under the news tab, uh, there is a whole section on the city manager search, and there's a survey there, a community survey. So please um, get on there and uh, provide us your feedback on feedback on our next city manager. I believe we'll be taking input on that survey through May 1st. So we've already had hundreds of people respond, but please uh, go ahead and, and do that yourself and let other folks know, post it on Facebook, et cetera. Help us get this out so we can get as many people from our community as possible and uh, answering that survey. It's really important for us to uh, help us with our hire of our next city manager. And with that, I think we will um, call this item complete. So thanks uh, council members and vice mayor, everybody for your updates. Really good, great stuff. Okay, um, we are running a tiny bit early. So if folks are up for it, maybe we'll just take a 10 minute, we'll come back at 145 and just take 10 minutes to uh, get some water and, and take a, a quick break. So we'll be back at 145, everybody, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I, I did uh, text uh, Council Member Watkins. So, uh, let's see if we can get her. Okay. Okay, so we are now uh, 
uh, moving into our consent agenda for the afternoon. First up is the consent agenda. These items are 12 through 30 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 12 through 30. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any items? Comment on or pull any items. I will look for folks. I see council member Golder, then council member Brown, council member Kalandari Johnson, and then Council Member Cummings and then Vice Mayor Bruner. Okay, Council Member Golder. I'm just wondering, do we need to pull item 24 to make a change based on what we talked about? Yes, we do. The session. Yes, so 24 will be pulled. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Yes, I have a question, one question on uh, items 12 and 13. A comment on 18 and a question on 27. Okay. No need to pull. Okay. Question on 12, 13, and 27, and a comment on 18. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, a comment on item 19 and um, Question, comment on 23. Question, comment on 23. Okay. And Council Member Cummings. I had a question on item number 14. Uh, comments on item number 21. And then a, a joint comment on items numbers 22 and 23. And I just want to express my appreciation uh, for item number 18, which is the resolution denouncing hate crimes and bigotry targeting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And so just, um, again, want to continue to express my support of the council for bringing this forward and um, for all the work that we're doing to try to, um, you know, end hate crimes and discrimination in our community. Thank you, council member. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. I had a comment on item number 17. 17, okay. And Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I share the sentiments of Council Member Cummings on item number 18. And then I also have a comment on item number 21. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Watkins. I'm just doing a little tally here. Two, three, three. Okay. Um, why don't we start with comments? Um, there's only been one item pulled this afternoon off of our consent agenda, so we will take separate action on that. We do have several items that have been pulled for either questions or comments. And I'll go ahead and start with the items, at least as far as I was able to take them uh, in order for comments. And then we'll go to um, the items that there are questions, I would imagine, for staff. So for comments, I had item 17, which is for the public, the nomination of reappointment of Carol Bird to the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. So I had a note that that uh, was to be pulled for comments. And I believe that was Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, I know it's in the board 
Ford's packet, um, Carol's history with the Housing Authority. I wanted to point that out. Um, I have sat with her on this board for um, all of those years, and she is a very valuable asset to the board. And um, I just wanted everyone to know that the Housing Authority Board of Santa Cruz County, San Juan Batista, and the City of Hollister uh, consists of different seats on that board, and the City of Santa Cruz is one of those seats. There's also a seat for Watsonville. There's a seat for the Community Action Board. There's two tenant seats, and one of those is for age 62 and over. And um, so I just wanted to point that out, uh, the different seats, and I'm very happy to um, have Carol Berg for the City of Santa Cruz seat uh, for another term. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, I also had uh, next will be item 18 for comments, and this is the item. This is a resolution denouncing hate crimes and bigotry targeting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And uh, I believe just comments on this item. Uh, Council Member Cummings, I believe you pulled this item. No, I mean I made my comments earlier. Okay. Uh, any uh, council member Brown. Thanks. Uh, so th I just wanted to thank my colleagues for being willing and open to talking with um, members of the AAPI community to um, you know address some of the questions and concerns they had, or not concerns, but additions that they wanted to include. And that, thank you so much for uh, for doing that. I know they really appreciate it. That um, and I just have a statement here that um, uh, Kiko Minami wanted me to read because none of the coordinators of their group effort were able to get off work to be here to um, give this thank you. Um, this and just for so everybody knows, this um, the group that brought this did end up doing a survey, and they had 33 responses. So and incorporated um, all of the you know c the comments, and so it did take a little time. And I really appreciate again council members uh, for being willing to and the mayor for being willing to um, you know take that time. So I have a, just a very quick statement. Um, so, dear Mayor Myers and Council Member Kalantari Johnson and Council Member Watkins, thank you for working with members of our local AAPI community to develop a resolution against anti Asian hate. We appreciate your patience as we work with city staff member Ralph DeMarket to include our voices and historical background into the resolution. The inclusion of our local history of anti-Chinese movements is particularly significant. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with the city to support our AAPI community into the future. Thank you, Akiko Minami. So thanks from me and thanks from them as well. Thank you. And I'll um, also just make a comment. I just want to also thank um, all the community members who met with us and um, Councilmember Contrary Johnson and Councilmember Watkins, um, Ralph and Laura Schmidt, our assistant um, city manager, also um, were part, very, very involved in this, um, as well as some of our community members um, and elders in the AAPI community, who I know also met with council members. So um, it's such an important uh, resolution, and I'm just um, very pleased with the time that we took to listen to the community, and I hope that um, really the intent is that this is just the start of a, of a more um, broader relationship with the community, and um, we really want to work hard on these issues, obviously, in Santa Cruz. So just wanted to say that. Uh, other council members' um, comments on item 18 at all? Good to go. Okay, great. Uh, we also have comments on item 19, and I believe um, Council Member Brown, I believe you pulled that. No? That was me, Calentari Johnson. Okay, Council Member Calentari Johnson. Great, thank you. Um, first 
first, I wanted to thank my colleagues, Councilmember Brown and Cummings, for putting this resolution forward. Um, I, I wanted to further draw out um, one portion of the resolution that speaks to the wealth gap across our county and um, just highlight some additional data um, uh, around population and per capita um, income. So the city of Watsonville, I'm gonna look at my notes to make sure I get this right. The city of Watsonville is made up of 81.2% Latinx and 15.2% white, and their annual per capita income is 20,869. City of Santa Cruz is 21% Latinx, 61.6% white, with an annual per capita income of $39,653. City of Capitola, 24.9% Latinx, 64.8% white, with an annual per capita income of $41,438. And the city of Scotts Valley is 10.6% Latinx, 78% white, with an annual per capita income of $56,176. I know that's a lot of numbers that I just put out there, but I think it's really important to really specifically um, highlight these numbers. It shows the significant inequities across our county and the rail transit option gives us an opportunity to reduce um, some of these inequities. We won't solve them, but it gives us an opportunity to reduce them by increasing access to jobs and education and reducing household transportation costs. Um, it, this really is a social, environmental, and transportation justice issue. Um, so I just, I wanna thank my colleagues and, and bring those, um, the data out further um, and support us continuing to explore all options. So, thank you. Thank you, council member. Next, I have item 21 was pulled for comments. This is a resolution recognizing tobacco waste as a public health and environmental threat. I believe that was council member Watkins or Cummings? Both of us. Cummings, okay. Go ahead, Council Member Cummings. Um, first, I just want to uh, express my appreciation of this resolution coming forward. And I just wanted to put it out there for the council and maybe if there's um, other council members who are interested in working on um, you know, pursuing, because part of this is pursuing policies to mitigate tobacco waste. And one, you know, thinking about uh, some of the waste that's generated through the tobacco industry, um, plastic lighters, plastic disposable lighters are a big um, form of waste that comes from, that's directly associated with smoking and um, is a big impact on our oceans. And so if there's interest with other council members, I think it might be, a, be worth us working with other nonprofits like um, Save Our Shores um, and other groups, but maybe considering um, moving forward with trying to um, create some kind of policies around um, plastic lighters, given that, you know, people who want to smoke can still use matches, which are biodegradable. Um, there's also refillable lighters that could be sold in lieu of having these disposable lighters, and that may be another area that we can um, uh, create policy to address some of this ongoing plastic waste that really ends up in our oceans and our environment. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Watkins, did you have a comment on this one? Yeah, I did, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanna extend my gratitude to my colleagues who um, also brought this item forward and my appreciation to our partners in the county and uh, tobacco health and public health and their work on this as well. Um, and there's the Tobacco Education Coalition, could, which could be a really great uh, space to have further conversation about additional policy recommendations as suggested by Councilmember Cummings. Um, and, and just, and also in light of the fact that there's this new emerging um, tobacco product, which is the vaping products, and then they're disposable. So it's, I think, an ongoing uh, battle, really. And uh, just really wanting to really highlight how, at the local level, it's so important for us to be incubators, to really advance policies that are aligned with our values and hopefully get some state traction because we're not the only community impacted by tobacco waste. And um, nationally, it's, it's an issue. Internationally, it's the, uh, the most, and, I, and I, I will hopefully not get but my understanding is that it's the most littered item on the planet is cigarette butts. And 
um, what they do to our environment is devastating and big tobacco takes no responsibility nor uh, has any uh, requirement to do anything about this product that has uh, toxic chemicals in it and have no disposable uh, outcomes for it in a, in a really healthy way. So I think there is so much opportunity for us to advance policy that's going to support uh, the environment and can ideally move away from having these toxic uh, cigarette filters in, in our oceans and in our seas and, and impacting our animals and our communities. And then um, just also want to highlight that we had an event recently where uh, there's some folks who actually met in Santa Cruz and they created something called the Cigarette Surfboard. And uh, they took all of these uh, cigarette butts that they found uh, from the beaches and created a reuse for them around um, these really beautiful and, and somewhat disgusting because they're cigarette butts, but um, designs within the surfboards and just trying to raise awareness about the impact it has on our ocean. So uh, although this is a small action to try to raise awareness, to have us as a local jurisdiction say that we want to see policy change, uh, we are going to take it to the state and ask that the mayor send a letter to our um, representatives to uh, share our concerns and hopefully will lead to eventual policy change that will impact not only the city of Santa Cruz, but other communities like ours. So um, don't want to miss this opportunity to speak to that and just thank all the folks that uh, do the good work in our community to clean up the tobacco, the, the, the cigarette filters, but also just around awareness and prevention. So uh, those are my comments on that item. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I will also just chime in. I just want to thank the Tobacco Education Coalition. Um, they helped guide the language on this and we've been working with them for a couple months on this. So um, really helpful and also recognize our city attorney's office. They also helped put this resolution together and so they did a lot of research for us and uh, so just wanted to thank both of those and their input on this. Um, I have item number 22 and then item 23 as the next two for comments. 22 for the public is the theater business license taxes and I believe that was pulled well, whatever council member pulled that, please go ahead and raise your hand. Is that council member Cummings? Okay. Yeah, I had a, it was a, it's kind of a joint statement on the two items. So both of these items um, reduce fees um, for the theaters and for um, certain businesses that sell alcohol, primarily the ones that are on site consumption um, because they've been impacted by COVID. And I know I've mentioned it a couple of times, but just thought it would be worth bringing up, um, you know, and I'm not sure the best way to move forward with this, but um, last year we were receiving um, a lot of correspondence, or we received correspondence, I should say, from people living in the beach flats around parking and the impacts that they were facing because of parking. And I know it was brought up at the previous meeting, you know, determining whether or not um, we could allocate some of the revenue from the parking fund to help with um, different services and different issues that may be occurring in the beach flats. But I'm wondering if we might be able to agendize a separate item that would allow for uh, waiving the parking fees um, for residents in the beach flats community for the 2021 summer. Um, those passes are generally only about $30 per resident, but given that many of the low income residents who've lived in these areas have, have experienced uh, significant impacts from COVID-19, um, it would, I think it would be helpful for many of these residents if we, if the, if the city could discuss or if the council could discuss waiving those fees for this upcoming summer as people are recovering from the impacts of COVID-19. And so I don't know if that needs to be a motion. I mean, maybe the city attorney could weigh in on how we might be able to get an item like that agendized. And ideally, if we could have it at the second meeting in May, that would um, allow us to pass something before um, parking enforcement begins after uh, Memorial Day weekend. Well, um, you're right. That would have to be agendized for action at a, at a subsequent meeting. And um, I, I'm not sure what is all entailed in that, but um, I see the city manager's coming on. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so what I would uh, 
to refer back to is the council adopted policy of uh, when looking at adding items to the agenda to have three council members sponsor an item and to bring forward onto the agenda and of course working with the mayor to agendize those items. So it would be just, just the standard approach that we have for any item that uh, needs to be, that council members want to sponsor onto the agenda. That would be working with public works and parking, I assume, Martine, to understand the yeah, yeah, certainly. There's uh, background information uh, that is needed. Uh, council members can definitely work with staff. Uh, I think uh, working with the staff here in my office, whether it's uh, uh, Ralph uh, or myself, uh, and then we can work with the appropriate departments as this information. And we understand that the council member comes is interested in uh, just bringing forward a proposal that would uh, look at uh, setting aside uh, revenues from the parking fund for the purposes of uh, subsidizing or paying for permits for residents of the beach area, which is, a, uh, as, as the city attorney mentioned, it's a, it's a completely separate item that's what's before you, which is a, a rate increase in the parking rates. The, actually, the, what's, what's before us that's the, the subject of the discussion is the reduction in the business license taxes for theaters and oh, then right. the reduction in the um, alcohol sale permit fees. And so the reason why this came up is because we're reducing fees for these businesses um, and then, but for our lowest income residents, if there's something that we can do to support them as well, yeah. you know, if we can have a discussion around that. Yeah, that's right, there's another item on your agenda today on parking rates in the beach West. that's why I was uh, referring to that. So, but yes, yes. And so it just had to be agendized. Uh, uh, council members can work with staff and then uh, uh, like any other agenda item, you'd have to have you know, three council members response for it and then, uh, and then work with the mayor to agendize it. Um, we'll move on to comments on, was there any other questions on 23? I believe someone had a question on 23. I had a, yeah, yeah thank you. I had a sort of comment question. Um, uh, I'm glad to see that we're supporting our local businesses in this way. And um, this is sort of a comment question for um, Chief Mills. I, I noticed the DUI increases and that was alarming. So I'm wondering if Chief Mills can speak to how we will how our city will support our on-sale vendors um, so that they can follow best practices and policies and not over-serve, not serve our minors, and um, help address the DUI numbers. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Council Member Terry Johnson, and uh, good afternoon, Council and Mayor. Uh, we regularly work with the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission on uh, educating uh, off-sale and on-sale liquor establishments to make sure that uh, they're complying with the, the best practices and the law. We also run stings occasionally on those locations to make sure that they're not serving minors or over-serving other people. We've also allocated one person in our department as the alcohol enforcement officer so that any time we get a problem at one of the local liquor establishment, it gets funneled to that person for us to work with code compliance and others to make sure that we're paying attention that's needed to some of these establishments uh, through education, but as well as enforcement, uh, whatever it takes to make sure that they're complying. And, uh, and then also we work with uh, the California Highway Patrol. They do a post DUI arrest survey uh, to make sure that uh, if we're seeing that there's a particular bar, for instance, that has had some problems that uh, we contact those bar owners and we do so in, on a regular basis where we talk about uh, you know, them over serving people and the people getting behind the wheel and driving. So, and look at calls for service. We do a variety of things to make sure because alcohol is such a risky um, behavior when people are intoxicated. Thank you, Chief Mills. And I, and I believe in the past, um, your department has worked with community prevention partners, the countywide drug and alcohol prevention effort, and, and has done some positive upstream approaches, including recognizing merchants for responsible behaviors. So thank you for that work. You bet. Thank you, Chief Mills. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I have questions on three items, uh, number 12, number 13, and number 27. I believe those were all um, questions requested. I think it was Council Member Brown. Ah, thank you. Uh, so I have a question, which is uh, the same question for items 12 and 13 now. These, this is the extension of the emergency declaration. 
I am, I'm just wondering because the, um, the, we aren't getting in the reports any information about um, what criteria, if any, are being, or I'm sure there are criteria, what criteria are being used for making a ter determination about this extension, um, you know, how, how to, how to, I mean, what the plan is for moving in, you know, out of the emergency mode. Um, it seems like we are, you know, we have a lot of emergencies, but I'm not sure that they're necessarily directly related to COVID or the fire at this point. Um, so um, I'd just like to hear your thinking on that. Martine Bernal. I see Tony. Yeah, I can start off, I guess. Uh, the, um, and Tony can weigh in. Also, uh, Chief uh, Haidu can, uh, uh, can also weigh in. So part of the, uh, the rationale for it is that, well, first of all, we do have an existing uh, county and state uh, uh, health emergency in place. So it's consistent with what the county and the state has in place. So this is not any different. Uh, and, and so that's to be consistent with that. Uh, as a, on a practical matter. And then in addition to that, in order to be eligible for FEMA reimbursements of all the expenses that we're incurring currently with the SPAC and will be incurring during this public health emergency, we need to be able to have it in place. Uh, and so that's the other rationale, in order, again, in order to take advantage of FEMA reimbursements. Uh, and that really are, are the principal reasons uh, to respond to the active emergency that's currently in place at the county and federal level. Uh, I suspect that once the, those declarations are removed, then we would follow suit. Um, uh, but that's, uh, that's my understanding, at least. And I don't know if uh, Tony wants to add more or the chief. Well, I, would just, I would just add that um, particularly with respect to the item number 13, um, the fire emergency, as it affects the city, the primary rationale for that is to um, uh, to continue to remain eligible for potential FEMA reimbursement. So that's the primary issue driving um, that resolution. Uh, and I don't really have anything to add to what Martine said with regard to the COVID emergency, but I'm happy to answer any uh, further questions. Can you answer the question about uh, wanted to ask a question, Council Member Bound on item 27, which for the public is Highway 1 and 9 intersection improvements, a budget adjustment. Uh, thanks. So I have a question uh, related to the project itself, and I, it seems like now is probably a good time to ask it. Um, so, and I've um, been, well, I'll, I'll just ask the question. So I, I assume that, um, there's been some traffic management planning around the construction phase of this project. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's information that's already been developed around it, like a traffic management plan. And if so, could we, would it be possible for council members to um, get a copy of it and um, just know what's happening? I mean, this is, this is right now, we're not really thinking about it this way, but it is gonna be a major disruption and we're gonna start getting tons of questions from members of the community and complaints, I imagine. Um, so, you know, having having a way to respond to those with you know some level of, of understanding about what's happening would be really great. Um, it, uh, this is Josh Spangard, uh, uh, senior civil engineer, of Public Works, uh, Mayor Myers, member of the City Council. Uh, Mark, I'll just I'll just jump in here for a second here. Uh, there, Caltrans has mandated we have a. a a mandated traffic control plan throughout the entirety of the project. It's divided in about six phases. Uh, the majority of the work that will be disruptive to the actual traveling public is going to be night work. So I, that that is a positive thing. At least we can do that there because it's not located right in the middle of the residential area. So, um, and as you mentioned, this will be highly disruptive when the work will be going on, but I, I anticipate that the majority of the really disruptive stuff will take place uh, at night. And, and all those traffic restrictions, traffic handling restrictions are in um, some of the contract documents that have been uh, approved by Caltrans. So I'd be happy to get you what, what we have. I mean, a lot of the details will be fleshed out uh, during construction. Obviously, there are a lot of things that a lot of unanticipated things that can happen, but uh, I'd be happy to give you, at least to give you a framework for 
for traffic closures and whatnot, but the majority of that is, is at nighttime. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I, I didn't ask to um, suggest that I want you to put a whole lot more work into this, <laughs> um, but so. Oh no, I, know, I, I, I put plenty in, I'm happy to do more. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if it, just a, like a, some basics and you know, it does, I think just when it starts, when it's happening, it's gonna be important to be able to. Sure, yeah, Caltrans typically what they do is they'll, they'll give us uh, an envelope of time when we can set up traffic closures and when we can have to have them down by. The only work that, to my knowledge, will be taking place during the day. We'll just have uh, shoulder closures, uh, if if that, and and certainly not on the main on the main line there. But uh, yeah, I'll get you whatever information I have. Thanks. You're welcome. Did you have a question on this? Yeah, I just had a follow-up comment. I was just going to suggest to you if there's any information that you know when when the time comes, um, it might be worth having. Uh, some information on the city's website, so if that's on the Public Works Department's website. But so that way, if, if members of the public are contacting us with concerns around congestion or, you know, if they have concerns around how construction is going to impact traffic, we can direct them to that site and there's some talking points available or just some um, information that can help the community understand when those impacts are going to occur and when construction is going to be taking place and how the city is going to mitigate um, a lot of those impacts. Absolutely. As soon as we have a, a, a viable uh, schedule from the contractor and things are really beginning to move, we will keep our, our website updated. And I know the PIO for Caltrans District 5 will also have information on their website because it is two state routes. So, but, but we will absolutely uh, make an effort to keep everybody informed. Thank you. Okay. That does it for all the questions and comments on oh, the agenda. I had one. I had one question for on item number fourteen. Oh, okay. Um, so I don't. Item number fourteen is the minutes, and I just had a question, and maybe this could go to the city manager or city attorney. I think there was some confusion around um, the motion that was made at the last meeting. So. Um, this is the, um, the temporary outdoor living ordinance item, and um, within that motion, items number item number three and four. Number three was um, restrictions on daytime encampments with implementation of a daytime property storage program, and number four was enforcement of nighttime prohibition to be conditioned on availability of alternative shelter options and to be deferred until item one is accomplished and safe sleeping programs are operational, after which the city would prohibit camping in all other city areas other than city permanent indoor shelter, safe sleeping locations, and managed encampments to be run by nonprofit, faith-based community and county partners. Um, the, I think with item number, with both of these items, there's been some confusion because um, some people have reached out and asked if, you know, if the city doesn't have an ordinance in place, um, what are they enforcing as it relates to restrictions on daytime encampments with the implementation of a daytime storage program and then the nighttime prohibition. And so I just wanted to see if we can get some clarification. Is this largely going to take place when an ordinance is passed or um, what, like, what would be in forced and when would that occur? Because I think some people envision that we've been moving forward with creating, for example, the storage programs. And if those programs are created and then they'd have to um, impose restrictions on daytime encampments, but we don't have an ordinance, is that legal? And so I just wanted to see if we can get some clarification around, um, you know, when enforcement of daytime and nighttime encampments would be occurring and, and what that would be in, in, in conjunction with. So I'll, I'll be happy to take it crack at that one. Um, my, my understanding, and this goes back to the meeting in March where the, uh, I think the first meeting in March when the council introduced the amendments to chapter 636 that were later adopted um, with direction to bring amend modifications back. And my interpretation of the council's direction at that time uh, was and continues to be that we will have an amended ordinance in place and in effect before we'll begin enforcement. So. Uh, assuming that we're able to get programs operational before that, great, but we need to have the ordinance in, in effect in order to effectively afford, uh, enforce it. And so to add just a little bit to that, so essentially the what council um, directed come forward is not in effect because the legislation to make that happen 
hasn't been approved by the city council. So that will happen at your next meeting when there'll be a first hearing uh, with respect to the, uh, the you're referring to the daytime storage program as well as the night enforcement. So that is not in effect uh, currently because again, no legislation has been adopted by the city council. Okay, well, I'd just like to express um, my appreciation for that clarification because I think that that, um, I was a bit confused by the motion at the last meeting and I think that helps clarify the direction for myself and um, for members of the public. Okay. Okay, if there's no other comments on our consent agenda, um, we're definitely running behind time. Um, so let me just find my spot here. Um, so we are, I'm gonna take this now out. Uh, Council Member Golder, did you have a, no, nope. okay. Um, um, okay, I'm gonna take this out to the public now. So if there are members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of item number 24, which has been pulled, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I see two people in the audience with their hands up. Uh, and so this will be just for items um, on the consent agenda, except for item number 24. And uh, I see three. Um, okay, I'll go with Saina Siegel first. Go ahead, please. Hi. I just wanted to thank the council so much. I have so much appreciation for you, including the resolution on light rail in uh, this week's agenda. Um, it, you know, a lot of people in this county ran on an equity platform, but the uh, Santa Cruz City Council is actually following through. And so I just wanted to really thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. And next is Peter Bechet. Bechet. Hi, Peter. Press star nine. Oh, Eric. There you go. you go. Can you hear me now? We can. Hi, Peter. Good. Hello. How you doing, everybody? Hi. Thanks. Um, let's see. I wanted just to say uh, uh, thank you for uh, and just for talking for the community from Beach Flats. I wanted to have such an echo, is that better? Anyway, because um, uh, in general, they've had tried to give input, but it, uh, a, with the phone issue and just trying to dial and raise their hands with star nine, star six, there's been several time confusion, and also they're in the middle of work, like right now. So I just want to talk for them because throughout these months and throughout this pandemic, the, the garden has been a gold mine. It's been a great pressure a pressure valve like you know a lot of people when they couldn't go out to work uh they just their garden was really just like the place to be outside of their only room a lot of time i have one two families in one little room so their garden and of course the street but the garden was kind of like just a place where they could be breathing fresh air and you know ventilating their frustration and also obviously uh, growing food as well. So anyway, it's just a great news that uh, relief has been uh, extended and I will be glad. We're having a meeting on May 6th, if I believe with Robert Acosta from Parks and Recreation and we'll have a meeting and there'll be a great news. And uh, they've been asking already for almost a year, like what's going on, what's gonna happen? And this is a wonderful news and I appreciate what you all did for it. Thank you, Peter. Next up, I have a phone number ending in 1810. Yeah, this is Gary Phillips. On item 18, I am concerned by the progressive left's push to divide the nation over race and widen the existing racial divide, spewing anti racist racism to justify a Malcolm X blank check Marxist anarchist violent revolutionary war on America. Almost all of this resolution is thinly veiled, stale, regurgitated, anti white racial leftist dogma. Yes, there is a legitimate large percentage increase in awful animosity or violent attacks on Asians from what normally were very low levels. As to this stale historic group identity finger, 
finger pointing, including by the leftist propaganda monopoly machine known as the MSN, who never tires of suing partisan lies. It desperately wants us to believe latent racism by white supremacists is responsible, which needs instead uh, either a dispassionate analysis based on real current facts, or better still, just stop that. You don't need to be Lenin's version of useful idiots, and in one paragraph can simply state your condemnation of any violence directed toward Asians, but you just can't resist pushing the leftist dogma. Now, many people, MSM press, def desperately want to sell the Atlanta shootings as a hate crime poster, but so far the FBI says it wasn't. I know this. Violence is about violence, and violence is not about racism or hate any more than rape is about having sex or sexism. Race is a bad, non excuse for the violent ones. The most widely open represented violent people in America are black male criminals, but most all of that violence is normally directed toward other black people and skin color is an irrelevant statistic. If you must, search Blacks Assaulting Asians on YouTube, or consider a well-known white BLM activist was arrested recently for an Asian uh, felony hate crime charge plus a malicious harassment in Seattle in March. Not white supremacy, and not really the same as any of these historical comparisons. I don't care what the race of the attacker is, because the only important thing is they are dangerously violent. But if it comes up, deal with the current realities. I examined the study done by the New York Asian Bar Association, and I conclude it was very similar to this resolution as an irrelevant leftist regurgitated history lesson. The actual number of acts of violence is still minuscule compared to the anti-racist violence meted out by the BLM. Thank you. Okay, next we have caller ending in 7496. Just press star nine and you'll be unmuted. Star six. I'm sorry, star six. Sorry about that. Caller ending in 7496. You're ready to go. You just press star six and you'll be unmuted. Can you know? Yes, we can. Uh, council members, this is Matt Farrell. I just want to thank the council for its support of. Uh, Moving forward with the rail business plan and funding for environmental work to evaluate next steps. I think it's a critical opportunity for economic um, development of the region and for green transportation and social equity. Thanks again for your support. Thank you. I'll bring it back to the council now and I'll look for, um, we will go ahead and um, I think uh, Lisa Murphy, our director of HR. Lisa, do you have an update on item 24? I believe there's some language. And then yes, I'll have Mayor, Mayor Myers, we just need to do a vote on the remainder of the consent oh, I'm sorry. agenda. Yep, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so I will go ahead and look for a motion um, on the remaining items of the consent agenda before moving on to item number 24, which has been pulled. So I'm now looking for a motion on the remaining items on consent with the exception of item 24. And I see Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Colder. I'm happy to move the consent with the exception of item number 24. And then also just wanted to express my appreciation to the Seaside Company for working with the city to extend the lease of the uh, Beach Flats Garden. And in the past years, those extensions were for three years, and this one's for five. And given that this is a really huge benefit for the community, I just want to express my appreciation between the ongoing relationship between the Seaside Company and the city for the, the use of this land. Great. I'll accept it. Second by Council Member Golder, and I'd like to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote. Great. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. Okay, we will now come back to item number 24. That was pulled by um, Council Member Golder, and I believe our HR Director, Lisa Murphy, is here to present that item. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor. Council Member Lisa Murphy, your Human Resources Director. Item 24 
is the approval of the early termination of the cost reduction agreements with the various bargaining units, the city manager and the executives. We reached an agreement with all of the units to remove the furlough. However, we did not reach an agreement with the supervisors, but I am confident that we will, and we'll be able to bring back uh, an agreement at the May meeting. In addition, there should be before you a revised agreement with the SEIU unit, and I would like to be able just to highlight what those differences are, if I could take a moment and share my screen. I believe, let's see, I've highlighted them in yellow. Here, this is, in addition to the language we are adding to this agreement, the ability for SEIU members to continue the furlough if they decide to do so. That's a number one and number two. How they can do that, they can either uh, go voluntarily unpaid or they can use their uh, paid time off to make themselves whole. In addition, uh, the directors are, um, and department heads and supervisors are asked that they respect the needs of these employees who may have child care, elder care, or other time conflicts due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which pulling these off, the furloughs off, however great it is, may still have, create issues for these employees, and we wanna honor that and grant the request uh, for that opportunity to, to utilize the furlough time or pay time off. And then finally, they're just going to have to notify me so that we can make any operational changes that may be coming uh, no later than May 3rd. And these terms and conditions have been accepted by the SEIU members, or union, excuse me. Um, with that, that concludes my additions to this particular item. And just remind you that when you do um, make your motion to please remove the supervisors from that motion. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, uh, Lisa. So I will go ahead and see if there's any questions on this item. Otherwise, I would look for a mo. Excuse me, I'll take it out to public comment next, and then we'll look for a motion. Any other questions? Um, Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have a question? No. Okay. Okay, I'll call you when we. Okay, I'll go ahead and take this out to public comment. I'm not seeing anyone in the uh, audience with their hands up. So I'll bring it back to council for a motion on this item. And I see Vice Mayor Bruner and then uh, Council Member Golder. I'm happy to move a motion on item number 24, approval of early termination of the cost reduction agreements with various bargaining units minus the supervisor's unit. Um, for the fiscal year 2021. Okay. And a second by Council Member Gold. There's second. Sorry, Mayor, there's also a resolution that needs to be included. Part of the motion. Okay. Should I state that as well? Yes, to, yes. Yeah. And uh, to adopt a resolution approving the early termination of the 10% furlough for the executive unrepresented employees and the city manager effective May 14th, 2021. Okay. And the seconder, great. Uh, Director Murphy, did you have a clarification on that? I just wanna make one additional comment. It, it should be recognized and thanked for the employees that had uh, contributed to the cost savings for the city to help us through this recession. And I can't express my gratitude to the employees and my fellow colleagues enough for um, agreeing to these concessions. Thank you, yeah, and I'd like to add my thanks as well to um, all of our employees who uh, took, took these furloughs and continued to work under really stressful consider conditions under COVID-19. So just really wanna recognize your, um, your work over the past year and really pleased that we can get this done early. And um, so thank you to Director Murphy also for your work on bringing this to us. And with that, I have a motion by Vice Mayor Bruner um, and a second by Council Member Golder. And um, I will go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Do you want me to repeat the motion, Bonnie, or do you, it's right out of the agenda report. Do I need to repeat it? 
Um, no, just to clarify, it is the staff recommendation minus staff the recommendation. supervisor's bargaining unit. Yep. <laughs> yes. Okay. Councilmember Watkins? Yes. Okay. Aye. Calentari Johnson? Yes. Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to our consent public hearing. These are items 31 through 35 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming, this meeting is who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment on items 31 through 35, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any items on our consent public hearing? These are items 31 through 35. Seeing none, I will uh, go ahead and bring these out to um, the uh, public and I see we have one attendee who would like to comment on these items. Phone number ending in 1810, please. Yeah, this is Garrett again. Hey, with reference to item number 33, oh, wait a sec, I'm gonna off my sound. Okay, you seem not to realize developer fees are to charge developers for city services they are receiving but are not paying uh, for otherwise because sites under construction don't yet pay property taxes and are not occupied with people paying utilities or sales taxes, you know, paying their way like everybody else or directly receive city service related to actual construction. You tell me, exactly what city provided childcare services are these developers receiving that they're not paying for? I can tell you, absolutely none. Your resolution justifications are socialist wealth research distribution nonsense. You are just reaching into their pockets with no logical defense for your action. It is the Bill Clinton defense. When asked why he had sex with Monica Lewinsky in the Oval Office, he replied, because I could. That is your justification, because I could, using the monopoly power of project approval like the mob might. This and many other developer fees are questionable as to their justification or monetary amounts. This one has zero justification. Yes, it's really, really sad. There are parents who have defenseless children they can't afford to take care of. Who is at fault there? Not the developer. Maybe you need to find another pocket to pick that is not so obviously unjustified and tyrannical. I don't think the city should be charging any developer for this, uh, but your faulty idea, they are responsible, is double faulty by excluding 100% affordable developers because, and I admit this is a prejudice guess, uh, the people who occupy such structures are more likely to require subsidized child care services, not less than other market rate developer occupants would. As to the police and fire, I don't know if I can talk about that here, but uh, I suppose it's possible a construction site might need police for trespass, theft, medical emergency, and arson. But I would guess unoccupied buildings, especially during early construction, don't generate a lot of police fire response. And the amount charged seems like the full amount charged per capita for every citizen of Santa Cruz. I can't go on about all these other fees discussed last meeting because they're off topic here and similar to last week, who can address six different fees in two minutes, but they all have issues. Again, this seems like a shameless and no justification socialist money grab. Thanks. Thank you. I'm now going to look for a motion on the consent public hearing. This will be for item 31, which is the second reading and final adoption of the beach area parking meter rate ordinance updates. Item number 32, which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-09 amendments to the municipal code chapter 16.01 to align city code language with the recently council adopted 2021 interim water shortage contingency plan item 33 which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-10 child care impact fee and resolution setting the child in care impact fee item number 34 which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-11 public safety impact fee and implementing resolutions setting the new public safety impact fee and finally, item number 35, which is the 2021-22 uh, Housing and Urban Development Action Plan. I'd look for a motion on these items. 
uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Colder. I'm sorry for the sound in here. Um, I will go ahead and move our consent public hearing items, items number 31 through 35 as described by the mayor. And I'm second. Okay, great. I have a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Golder, and I'd like to ask the clerk to please take a roll call vote. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That, uh, that motion passes unanimously. Just like that, we're pretty much caught up on time. Okay, next up is our general business items. Um, and first item up is going to be the street tree master plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item, if you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Okay, I will go ahead and ask for a presentation by our staff. This will be Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks and Leslie Keedy, our urban forester. Welcome Travis and Leslie. Sure, they're on. Travis is. Good afternoon, Mayor. This is uh, Tony Elliott with Parks and Recreation. I'm just going to try to reach out to Travis and Leslie here. So, just one moment. Okay. Thank you. Actually, Bonnie, I misread. We are late, aren't we? <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. Hi, Travis, welcome. Thank you. I'm afraid this item has popped up sooner than uh, our team is, is ready to present on. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, should I go to the next item? I see that Chris Berry and Rosemary are on. Is it okay to go out of order? Take 37. Yeah, you, can, you can reorder it, yes. Okay. okay, Travis, we'll go ahead and do um, item 37 and then we'll come back. I'll get everyone lined up, thank you. Great. Okay, um, I will go ahead and um, ask for item number 37 to be brought forward. This is the Federal Endangered Species Act incidental take permit for operations and maintenance habitat conservation plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. And I see we have Rosemary Menard as the presenter and I also saw that Chris Berry was on the line. Hi, um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here today and introduce an item that has been a long time coming and I just wanted to make a couple of introductory remarks and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris Berry who's got a brief presentation um, for you on this item. Um, Mayor Myers will recall some 20 plus years ago when the city started working on this activity and I don't think we have too many items that have been in the, you know, on the 
on the burner cooking, if you will, for 23 years, as this one has done, and has um, obviously reco required staff to, you know, nurse it along through the thick and the thin, and imagine how many different um, federal administrations there were during that period of time, and, you know, the pros and the cons and the ups and the downs of whether people are for these kinds of things or against these kinds of things over those many years. But I do want to um, really acknowledge and congratulate the Water Department staff who started on this long before I came here uh, for achieving an outcome that I think is a long-term certainty relative to our operations and maintenance and the kinds of things that we do every day that you know require that we interact with the environment and some of the protected species that we want to be careful of. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Chris Berry to tell you a little bit about it. And then um, the action here is for you to authorize the uh, city manager to accept an incidental take permit for the um, Fish and Wildlife Services uh, Operations and Maintenance Habitat Conservation Plan for the city's uh, activities. Okay, with that, to you, Chris. Someone is texting me, I hope it's not Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I see him on, I see his name on the screen. I do too. Yeah, okay, there he Sorry. is. There he Good is. afternoon, Council. I'm uh, doing the typical Zoom shenanigans here, and pardon my fumbling through this, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today about the Operations and Maintenance Habitat Conservation Plan. Are you seeing my presentation? No, we're just seeing you right now, Chris. Okay. Well, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, I share the right screen. We see it. Yep. All right. Okay, I'm getting better at this. It only took a year. Um, okay, thanks again. I'm going to be real brief here. There's a, It's a long and windy road, and I could ramble on for quite a while about this, but I'm going to try to keep this brief and give you a chance to ask questions. So, um, in short, um, this is a 30-year permit, Federal Endangered Species Act compliance for the City of Santa Cruz Water and Public Works Department. So I think it's notable that um, we started out with all the city departments that had any interaction with endangered species, and we ultimately ended with just key activities engaged in by the Water and Public Works Departments. And I think that's noteworthy um, because for a long time, we've had sometimes our, our activities are not well aligned, and I think this has been a good vehicle to try to bring them into better alignment than they were in the past, so I think that's positive. Um, I'll also say this is the other HCP. We have the Imagine Some Wanted HCP still out there. There's quite a lot of overlap, but this is um, these are species that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has jurisdiction over, and I will get into that a little bit more further in the presentation. Um, again, it's a long-term permit, 30 years, so I think our, we have our work cut out for us um, in terms of this commitment, but also, as Rosemary alluded to, the changing staff. Um, not only will I not be here in 30 years, but we'll have different regulators. So we're gonna, we have, I think, one of the biggest challenges, just to sort of reveal some stuff I'm gonna talk about later, is that we need to be thoughtful about how we implement this in terms of our, our project management and record keeping and organization and just make sure that we're really on top of that because it's pretty unusual to have a 30-year obligation like this. Um, again, multiple species. Um, we started out a long time ago with uh, sort of a dream list of all the species that we thought ought to be included that the city ever interacted with and thankfully we had a little bit of a reality check and carried that down over the years. Um, I think a, another message along with the departments being aligned is that there's opportunities to leverage other natural resource protection goals with this effort, be there our drinking water source protection goals or otherwise. Um, and again, I'll get into that a little bit more as we go along. Um, along with doing this uh, presentation today, we have done presentations at international and state conferences the County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission. There's been quite a lot of outreach. Um, I will say that because it's been such a long process, it may be that folks have sort of forgotten about it or they're wondering why they haven't heard more about it, but there has been quite a lot of outreach. And then there's, of course, been the, uh, the official um, Federal Register notice that invited public comment and review back in September, which you see a screenshot of right there. Um, some of the
of the activities that we're covering are the, are the big ones that Water and Public Works are engaged in that have the um, potential to affect listed species and some non-listed species, species that might be listed in the future. Um, and of course, those are the ones that probably come to your minds um, being flood control, uh, water diversion and maintenance, um, and lots of other sort of nuts and bolts activities that the city engages in on a daily basis where we, uh, like a pipeline repair here, where we actually had red-legged frogs in the bottom of that pit. And we had to work with our, our maintenance crews to figure out a way to appease both our federal regulators and make sure we kept the water flowing to the North Coast farmers. So um, it's not all as glamorous as the title Habitat Conservation Plan. It's really you know down in the ditches trying to make compromises and meet sometimes competing goals with some of this stuff. So here's our list of uh, the finalists in our covered species list. Um, again, I think we had a list that was over 30 species when we started. Um, we pared it down to the ones that we really do have an effect on and that have um, resulted in big project delays with some of our work over the years. And I won't go into the, I won't give you the details on where they're all found, but if anyone wants to talk offline about this stuff, I'd be happy to do that. Um, the, uh, incidentally, when we first started, we had we were considering species as widely as sea otters, pelicans, uh, uh, an extinct beetle that used to be found in Santa Cruz 100 years ago. So we really did make a big effort to pare this down and make this a more manageable list of species that we're getting coverage for. Um, so lo and behold, on January 25th, we got a permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, I won't say how many years the draft document had been sitting in their email box, but it actually caught us a little bit off guard that we got the permit on January 25th. Um, we were, of course, grateful, but if you notice there's a couple typos in the document, that's because basically they, they, we finished this up with a draft document. Um, and lo and behold, as I said, surprisingly, I got a permit in my email one Monday morning, or I think January 25th was a Monday. Anyway. Um, it was a big surprise to get this permit after 20 plus years. Um, and Mayor Myers remembers well, I'm sure, thinking that the process was taking too long back in the early aughts. Um, she was the project manager back then and uh, is well familiar with some of the travails of working through a 30 year permit like this, whether it's the, what activities are recovering or what department doesn't have long term funding assurances or um, what federal regulator is. Um, getting in the weeds about things or what have you. So um, it's uh, really a great pleasure for me to be able to present this to the council with uh, Mayor Myers being seated where she is because she has that unique connectivity to this process that's really valuable and, and uh, I appreciate greatly. Um, so what are we doing for the conservation strategy? We're first and foremost, we're trying to avoid and minimize our effects on these species. And the big thing that of course you all have heard about is in-stream flow improvements, and that's one of the things that overlaps most with these species and the anadromous salmonids that we're also getting take authorization for in the other HCT. But then there's your sort of run-of-the-mill construction, maintenance best practices. Those are things that are typically already involved or already included in other permits that we have, so they're not really new to us. Um, we're just formalizing those for the next 30 years and getting take authorization which will presumably um, expedite some of our permitting in the future and also give us a little bit more certainty about what the standards in those permits might be over the long term, which is really pretty important when you're planning a big capital project. You can't have a shift in regulatory landscape that you're dealing with. Um, and then we have this compensation for remaining biological effects. And that's basically the stuff that we can't offset our biological effects with avoidance and minimization, we have to figure out a way to do offsite mitigation or somehow otherwise compensate for those effects. So this is another win-win um, collaborative um, benefit of this project where we're, you know, we're doing a lonely tiger beetle mitigation. Um, thankfully, Parks and Rec has been very cooperative and we're working with them to do some work on the Moore Creek Preserve which for a long time has been planned, but there haven't been, there hasn't really been resources to do. Um, and that, that supports work that they're doing elsewhere on the Moore Creek Preserve. Um, that's to basically mitigate for impacts we have related to our North Coast pipeline. And I'll speak a little bit more to that long-term obligation later when we talk about the cost of this permit. 
Um, the other thing that we need to get, uh, we need to compensate for remaining effects is for red-legged frog, and that's again because of our pipelines. They run through lots of red-legged frog habitat up the coast, um, and while red-legged frogs are prevalent up the coast, they're reduced probably more than 90% of their range is, is no longer occupied. So it's kind of a big deal, um, both for the red-legged frog and the tiger beetle. Um, we have the potential to affect 10% of the world's remaining population of tiger beetle, I'm told. So um, this, is, this is really kind of a big deal. Um, some of our obligations, this is a 30-year permit, which I, is probably scary to a lot of us. Um, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about things, but this is, I asked our attorneys to lay out a flow chart of how we go through evaluations of projects and what our permit obligations are, just to make it clear that in some cases we do have some expedited permitting, in other cases we still have permits that we, we need to get. Um, but we obviously need to implement the conservation strategy, and I should apologize because we've already started to implement it without getting your authorization. Um, we had a 90-day deliverable when we got um, the permit, and uh, frankly, to be able to do that, we had to start literally the day after we got the permit. So we've already started to implement this on the Moore Creek Preserve. Um, Reporting, there's a ton of, there's a ton of data management. Uh, the, uh, a lot of internal outreach. Um, we talked about external outreach earlier, but there's gonna be a lot of internal outreach, similar to what we've done in the past for general environmental regulatory compliance purposes. But there will be, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a nice to do anymore, it's a need to do. So we will have to put a little more rigor into our staff training. Um, funding assurances, I referred to that in terms of what departments were part of this earlier on, but funding assurance is actually is part of the permit. So you have to show your ability to fund all your obligations for the life of the permit in order to be granted the permit. Um, so that was a big piece of this. Um, and then of course staffing, we need staff to do all this and um, we, we, of course we have a lot of obligations as you all do. So we're thinking about staffing as a big deal and especially with the anatomy of some on HCP coming up, we'll be considering uh, very seriously how we're gonna staff this. So funding assurances, um, you probably saw in the staff report, it's about a $2.7 million commitment over the term of the permit. Most of that is due to staffing, but also the tiger beetle mitigation. Um, however, the tiger beetle mitigation can potentially be avoided um, once we determine whether we actually need to disturb tiger beetle habitat with North Coast rehab um, efforts, and, and there's a good potential we can avoid that. Um, that may not mean that we stop that effort. It may just open up some other opportunities in terms of a safe harbor agreement and alternative funding um, opportunities to continue the work that we're doing with parks out at Moore Creek. Um, and again, a lot of this stuff is stuff we're doing anyway. We just don't have the 30 years of assurances. So a lot of the costs that went into the funding assurances analysis were things that we were already planning to do. So. It isn't like this is a new $2.7 million obligation. It's just a projection over 30 years what it will cost for us to do stuff that we were mostly doing anyway. Um, and then hopefully there's gonna be some savings if we have expedited permit conditions and more certainty with what those conditions are over time, um, presumably that will help us save on project design. Um, it will help us build things sooner, which of course is generally good because prices seem to just continue to escalate. So. Um, I will say that because this was a municipal applicant driven process, our funding assurances analysis was somewhat less rigorous than had it been otherwise. Um, also because our, our remaining effects are not huge, Fish and Wildlife Service was not super um, concerned about our ability to pay over time, which was um, helpful certainly. So that said, I will just thank you for listening to me and thanks to all the folks that helped with this. There was a massive team of consultants and other staff and Mayor Myers and our former water director, Bill Coker, and my former boss, Terry Tompkins, um, who started this in 1998. Um, there are lots of hands went into this. So um, anyway, it was a good, good team effort and I look forward to the next 30 years of implementation. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chris. I will look for council questions and I just want to thank you um, and congratulate you. I know this has been a really long haul 
Um, Chris and I spent a lot of time crawling around in the mud trying to find these animals um, a long time ago. And um, so Chris is really, um, I mean, I, I, for my fellow council members, um, certainly a world that, that I work in. And um, there are very few cities that commit to this kind of um, conservation-oriented work um, in their regular operations and date. And so this really sets us again in a very solid place around the values that we have about our environment and about the unique species that make up Santa Cruz. So. Um, just really want to recognize Chris and the whole team. Um, we have some of the best biologists working on this, and um, really, this is really a standout situation with us as a city to commit to doing this. And uh, I know Chris will be bringing the um, anadromous uh, cell mounted uh, work forward as well. So it's pretty exciting for us biology geeks to see something like this come to fruition. Even though it took 23 years to get a 30 year old. It's a good lesson in patience. <laughs> Um, I will open it up to, let's see, Council Member Brown and Vice Mayor Bruner. Yeah, thank you for the uh, very um, thorough but condensed um, report on this uh, this habitat conservation plan. It's, I, I did read through the plan and it's just fascinating, all of the work that's gone into this. And I can only imagine how it felt to, when you saw that email in your inbox just kind of ha happened. So I'm, I'm just, I'm really glad to um, see this coming to fruition as well. Uh, my question is about the uh, potential um, the assessment of uh, what this is might do to change our access to um, North Coast water. So will, I guess, uh, and I, it's, it varies, it depends on the year, so I know there's no definitive answer, but um, will this change the amount of water the city can divert from North Coast streams? Um, and like, do you have any sense of what that might be? Um, yeah, that's a and not to question. say that I don't support this. I'm absolutely supported. I'm just wondering, you know, what, what it means. Yeah. yeah, that's a great due diligence question, Commissioner Brown. Um, and certainly um, for folks that understand the way the Endangered Species Act works, you would know that Fish and Wildlife Service needed to be aligned with the National Marine Fishery Service when they issued this permit. So that was literally one of the last things we had to iron out, and I, it's sort of a, an interesting experience to have had because it was this big contentious issue which was resolved with literally a sentence that basically said the minimum flows from the anadromous salmonid HCP will be the minimum flows for this HCP, which was enough um, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to feel like they were getting protection for Tidewater Gobi and Steelhead, or excuse me, Tidewater Gobi and uh, Red-Legged Frog primarily. Um, so yes, it will affect our ability to take North Coast water in the future. Um, those commitments are the same commitments that we're making in our water rights project right now, as well as our anadromous cell monitor ACP. So, but yes, this is the first time we've made a, a long-term commitment to any sort of flow agreement like that. Great. And uh, Council Member Bruner, you had a question? Thank you so much, Chris Berry. The report was very uh, thick and interesting. And um, learning about the San Francisco popcorn flower and western pond turtle, um, some of the you know covered species list was very fascinating. Um, my question is, uh, if you could maybe speak to the request for the 30-year permit and how that came about. You mentioned that was highly unusual and why 30 years? Yeah, thanks for your question, Commissioner Bruner. That 30 years is actually not unusual for habitat conservation plan. In fact, sometimes they're 50 years. It's just unusual for the city to make a commitment of that duration. We've, in my experience, which is almost 30 years now here, We've never, in my knowledge, had a permit that was a 30-year permit. So um, I guess for me that's meaningful in a way because A, it allows you to do more good things for the environment and provide more certainty around your operations, but it also um, begs the response to actually have some continuity and institutional knowledge and build 
a program that other staff can plug into. And I think that's, you know, if I wouldn't be a good manager if I wasn't thinking of that down the road, because obviously I'm not going to be here forever. So I, uh, against my uh, natural inclinations, I'm trying to be a much more organized and thoughtful long-term planner at this point, knowing that we have a, a fresh slate, so to speak. And uh, I just, now that we have this fresh 30-year commitment, I just want to be sure that everyone understands that and that we're setting this up and ready to go and have people be able to move forward with it after those of us who worked on it in the past years move on. So, so could I just add one thing to that, which is um, that I think that the benefit in terms of endangered species compliance is the long-term certainty you get with one of these long-term permits. And so by negotiating the agreement kind of up front, you do set a, uh, a set of terms and conditions that allow you to build that into your planning. And when you're a water utility, that kind of certainty about what your flow agreements need to be or what actions you can take, what actions you can't take relative to your operation or your construction projects, these are things that are really valuable to know up front rather than to to, you know, go down the road through a section seven consultation with every single project and have it be this way this in this administration and some different way in a different administration. So that's a real driver behind the length of these permits and why they're valuable, um, particularly in a water utility kind of function. Thank I would also you. add that we're lucky to have a water director who's actually developed an HCP and implemented an HCP as well. That's pretty rare that we have um, that much depth in-house among city staff to have the mayor and the water director and myself working on habitat conservation plans. So it's, we're set up pretty well for success there, I feel. You're on mute, Mayor Myers. I'll take this out to the public now. Uh, I see one person with their hand up and they end uh, in the phone number 3346 is your last four digits. And if you could press star six, you'll be unmuted. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I had raised my hand for the street Three master plan before you switch the order. So I'll wait for that one to make comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will bring this um, back to the council for deliberation and action and um, look for a motion from, uh, let's see, I've got uh, council member Cummings. Uh, are you, do you have additional discussion or are you ready for a motion? No, I just want to express my appreciation for all the work that's been done on this over the years by all the different um, people who worked in the water department have come and go and Mayor Myers for your work on this a long time ago. And um, I'm happy to move to authorize the city manager to accept the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services incidental take permit number TE 89655D-0, providing incidental take coverage under the Federal Endangered Species Act for various aspects of the city's ongoing water and public works operations as described in the Operations and Maintenance Habitat Conservation Plan. And a second, looks like Council Member Brown. I will second that. Okay. With huge thanks to all those involved. Great. We have a motion then by Council Member Cummings, um, seconded by Council Member uh, Brown to authorize the city manager to accept the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service incidental take permit, take, incidental take permit um, for the operations and maintenance habitat conservation plan. And could we get a roll call vote, please, Lauren? Council Member Watkins? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. Congrats, Chris. Thank you all. <laughs> that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. That. 
Okay, next up, we're gonna go backwards to another really cool project, which is our street tree master plan. This is item number 36 on our uh, agenda for general business. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item of by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'll turn this over to our presenters, our staff presenters today. That's Travis Beck with uh, our chief superintendent of our parks department and Leslie Keedy, our urban forester. Welcome Travis and Leslie. We've got them. Here. Travis, you're on mute. Got it, thank you. Um, well, good afternoon again, Mayor Myers and members of the council. Thank you very much for your flexibility. This afternoon, as we assembled our team and uh, to discuss the Street Tree Master Plan, uh, to get us started, I wanted to take just a minute to introduce uh, our team and our presenters today. Uh, of course, we have Leslie Keedy, our urban forester, who pushed this plan through on top of all of the regular urban forestry work in spite of all the challenges of 2020 and 2021. Uh, we're also joined by James Scheid, who's a forester with uh, CAL FIRE, and they are the grantors who provided the funding for this project, very grateful for their support, and Jimmy will say a, a few words in a moment. And then uh, the presentation, the bulk of the presentation will be conducted by our consulting uh, team from Davie Resource Group. We have Tina McKeon, who's a board certified master arborist with Davie, and also Rachel Sitz, who um, holds a doctorate in plant pathology. And so we're really lucky to, uh, to work with them on this project, and they brought a lot of experience from doing similar projects in other municipalities. Uh, Tiffany Wise West is also um, available if we have questions as she was a key uh, collaborator on uh, getting this grant and administering the project for us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Leslie to give us some uh, background on the project and how we got here. Um, good afternoon, uh, council and public. Uh, Leslie Keeney, Urban Forester. So uh, I worked with Tiffany in the Climate Action Office and we obtained this CAL FIRE grant. Originally the grant was to do the planting of 500 canopy trees in the community on public property and then to do a complete inventory with the Davie Resource Group to inventory all trees in parks and along streets and publicly owned, uh, excluding the green belts. Um, Tiffany and I uh, overestimated how many trees we had on public property in the parks and in the right of way. And uh, so we were left with a little bit of funding. So then we requested of um, Jimmy's group here at Cal Fire to be able to appropriate the remainder of the funds over so we could create a policy document for street trees. Uh, this is the first policy document that we have in the forestry program that captures the resource value, the benefits, um, sets policy and objectives, and uh, quantifies the benefit of, our, benefit of our urban canopy on public right-of-ways. And uh, it's just a really good opportunity to have some policy that unites all of the different departments that we work with together um, to actually have a document on hand that um, supports the inventory that we did and um, also sets as a baseline uh, so we can have funding for other forestry documents and programs and um, other grant opportunities as they arise. Um, so um, I'm here to answer any questions, but uh, our Davy resource team is primarily going to do the um, presentation. And then um, I'll uh, let Jimmy here talk briefly on uh, the CAL FIRE uh, process and uh, the value of this, this plan that we have. Okay, I think that's me, right? That's you. Yeah, oh, thanks. I appreciate being here virtually. Um, you know, just as a bit of background, our urban community forestry program has had grants in existence for about 20 years now. And in the last few years, we've had a more robust program um, that is largely focused on what we consider to be disadvantaged communities and low-income communities. 
That said, um, the city of Santa Cruz, while maybe lacking some of those, uh, was able to competitively um, submit a proposal that we found to be of great value. And while having that application approved and a grant created is one thing, to actually implement those goals is quite quite another. And as, as Leslie alluded to, um, you know, there were certain uh, expectations at the onset of the project, which then morphed as, as a savings was seen. Um, and with the last year of time that they had on this project, having an, an extension granted to the city, um, they were to make uh, good on, on what remained of those funds to make sure they weren't unspent. So they planted those 500 trees and, and had conducted that inventory that were very useful for moving their, the program further in the city, but to then take that a step further and to reallocate those remaining funds to create the street tree master plan that'll be discussed here in a moment. Um, was was very ad, um, was very advantageous to them and uh, something that um, you know in, in the time frame given uh, I'm really uh, proud to see come to light. Um, my hope is that after uh, the council and, and those that are gathered are witness to the presentation ahead, they'll realize the value of that tool. Um, not only in terms of assessing what the inventory laid out in terms of the um, the the, uh, the different attributes of the urban forest, but what those quantifiable values are, what, what those trees mean in terms of dollars and cents to the people that live and work in Santa Cruz. Um, and so I, I just hope that the council will, will pay it mind and um, you know ask any questions of me if needed or, or those that have worked on the plan. But um, in terms of it being um, uh, a tool that I, I hope that the city continues to reference for its own vision, but also to implement the goals that are contained therein and to realize that um, without um, you know, proper investment in, in this kind of program in the tree services and the urban forestry program and those that work and are related to it in the city, uh, it's hard to see the return on value of just simply planting a tree or saying that uh, your community is green-minded. Um, there are real dollars that grow on trees and these come from making that local investment. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm happy to answer questions if there's time and if not, um, again, I just hope that um, much value comes from this presentation. Thank you. So with that, we'll um, turn it over to the folks at Davy, and I will bring up the, uh, the slideshow. Okay, can you all see the presentation? Ten presenter view. Ten presenter view, yes. Yeah. Uh, I've seen other people have this difficulty. That didn't help. Yeah, we're only seeing a part of it now. I think if you press from current slide, it usually. How about now? I still have uh, your notes. You have the presenter view. All right, give me one moment. I'll sort out the technical difficulties here. Travis, I also have it if you want me to share. Let me know. Uh, give me one more second. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. well, okay, Bonnie, why don't you go ahead and bring that up? and um, our team can cue you. Hey, that Thanks. looks good on my end. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Rachel Fitz, and my colleague Tina McKeon is also here, and we're representing Davy Resource Group, as Travis said. This presentation is to introduce the Street Tree Master Plan, and we'll discuss the Street Tree Master Plan development process, give an overview of tree benefits, summarize the Street Tree Work Plan and Planting Plan, and highlight several of the goals for the Street Tree Resource, as well as the entire urban forest. Next slide, please. Since K 
kickoff, we have completed a resource analysis summarizing the structure, composition, and benefits of community trees, a tree canopy analysis, and a background and operations review that systematically reviewed existing policy and regulation regulatory documents as they relate to trees, including municipal code, the general plan, eight specific area plans, and other documents such as the climate action and adaptation plans, looked at current funding, staffing, and maintenance levels, as well as stakeholder views and objectives. And the project includes two street tree master plan drafts and a final plan. And we're in the stage of the final plan now. Next slide, please. Santa Cruz has 39% tree canopy and 38% impervious surfaces. There are a total of 13,917 public trees in parks, rights of ways, and on city properties. Trees in natural areas were not inventoried, but are included in the overall canopy cover. Of the 9,742 street trees, around 85% are maintained by adjacent property owners per municipal code. Next slide. Trees increase the quality of life for residents and support many other organisms. They provide wildlife opportunities for food and nesting areas. Trees reduce air pollution by intercepting fine particulate matter and gaseous pollutants. They reduce stormwater runoff into streams and the ocean. They also buffer noise, calm traffic, and improve pedestrian safety. Trees enhance property values and other aesthetics. Next slide. The street tree benefits were quantified using iTree Eco. In total, street trees have sequestered nearly 5,000 tons of carbon. They also provide around $44,000 in environmental benefits to air quality, stormwater, and carbon sequestration each year. To replace all of the street trees with those of similar size and health would cost $36 million. This is just a subset of the quantifiable tree benefits. Many of the benefits mentioned on the previous slide cannot be quantified, such as those to wildlife, property values, public health, and welfare. Next slide. The Street Tree Master Plan assessed the maintenance needs of the street tree resource. It includes annual work plans over the next five years. It prioritizes the maintenance needs of all street trees and programs, and the, it programs the highest priority first. I'm sorry, I'm distracted because I see the, the slides aren't showing up on your screen as, as they should. So sorry about that, but I think that you are still getting. We are. Missed. Yeah. There's a few little funny symbols that are showing up, but. Yeah, I'm sorry about funny. that. We'll keep going. Don't worry. <laughs> the work plan and planting plan are resource dependent. So that's what all those boxes are supposed to be saying. <laughs> And to, so they're resource dependent due to current staffing and budgetary shortfalls. The Urban Forestry Office receives $150,000 annually for street tree maintenance. The funds are used for reactive maintenance of street trees and regular maintenance for trees in the downtown area and along some of the main corridors. Of the 1,511 city maintained trees, the majority are in need of regular maintenance. If the city were to complete the program work, the annual budget shortfall is around $327,000. Of the 8,231 trees maintained by adjacent property owners, about 5% are in need of priority pruning or removals. Property owners responsible for the care of a street tree in need of priority work will be sent informative notifications. The current annual planting budget is $15,000 for all street trees. If the city planted approximately 750 trees each year and provided subsequent structural pruning, 
the annual planting plan budget shortfall is around $211,000. Next slide, please. The Street Tree Master Plan provides 22 goals to enhance the street tree resource and has consideration for the entire urban forest, but is not an urban forest master plan, as mentioned before. The goals are further expanded upon through comprehensive objectives and actions. A plan is important because it can better ensure that resources are in place to adequately manage the street trees. It details information on the street tree resource and can be presented to the community to allow residents to choose to support this resource if the benefits are value and the investments are deemed reasonable. The goals are organized into three focus areas. Street tree management is the first and the plan outlines the vision for street trees in this focus area. It aims to create consistent citywide planting plans and species recommendations. It provides avenues to attain more proactive and consistent management of street trees. The plan also includes goals for the entire urban forest over the next 20 years in the focus areas, urban forest policy and regulation and urban forest vision. These focus areas emphasize protection for the urban forest continued collaboration among city departments and community engagement and stewardship. Next slide. There are eight goals in the focus area street tree management. In the interest of time, we will highlight several of the goals from each focus area, and those are included in bold text. Goals four and five are to increase street tree planting efforts and the environmental benefits resulting from street trees. The objectives are to create a citywide street tree planting plan to expand opportunities for street tree planting and to retain large trees. Goal seven calls for predictable and sustainable funding for the street tree resource. As we discussed in the work plan, there is a budget shortfall for the management of these trees. The plan identifies some strategies to generate funding for more proactive management. Next slide. The focus area urban forest policy and regulation has seven goals. Goal 11 is to promote tree protection. The objectives explore enhancing methods for cost recovery in case tree removal or improper tree maintenance. Also continuing to implement tree protection during construction and exploring revisions to municipal code. Goal 12 is to strive for uniformity between city plans, policies, guiding documents and departments. The objective is to continue to communicate and coordinate with other departments. The existing area plans have all been incorporated into the street tree master plan. Goal 14 is closely related, and this goal aims to enhance the aesthetics and function of the urban landscape. It emphasizes incorporating trees in development and redevelopment projects. Also finding solutions to allow for trees in areas with hardscape limitations and incorporating trees to improve parking lot shade and stormwater capture. Next slide. The focus area urban forest vision has seven goals. Goal 17 is to expand tree canopy cover and the resulting environmental benefits. Goal 18 is to celebrate the importance of urban trees. This can be accomplished through celebrations, activities, and designations. Goal 20 aims to promote community engagement and stewardship of the urban forest. The objectives are to continue to provide multiple methods of outreach to engage a greater proportion of the community and to enhance citizen and volunteer engagement and care for the urban forest. This is the final focus area and concludes our brief summary and overview of the Street Tree Master Plan. I thank you for your time and we welcome any questions you may have. Next slide, please. Great. Thank you, Rachel. That was great. Thank you. So I'll
I'll go ahead and see if uh, council members um, have any questions on the material presented to, so far. Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I just want to express my appreciation for all the work that's gone into this. Um, as a biologist, and when I first started grad school, when I moved to Santa Cruz in 2007, um, there's a lot of interest in, you know, um, trying to get more cities to plant trees and to expand kind of these tree planting programs across cities. And Santa Cruz, given its commitment to environmental sustainability and conservation, has really been continuing to lead the way with these kinds of programs. And so I'm just really excited to see this before us today. And I want to thank everyone who has worked to get us to this point um, for everything that they've done. I did have one question, and this is just um, maybe for the future, we could maybe get a memo, but it'd be interesting. Uh, I saw on one of the uh, graphs um, the kind of percent cover of trees and um, uh, like green vegetation um, as it compares to impervious surfaces. It'd be interesting to know. And so, for example, I think um, just adding that together, it's roughly um, about, about close to 60% of um, of the land cover is tree canopy or um, grass and low-lying vegetation. It'd be interesting to see how this compares to other cities of similar size to kind of see where, is, where does Santa Cruz fall out and how much of our um, land cover is actually vegetation versus impermeable surfaces. Um, but that's, you know, I think that it would just be interesting for us to know. Um, but I, again, just want to thank everyone for all the work that they've done on this. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Golder? And also echo um, Council Member Cummings' sentiment, but I'd like to suggest if you're looking for places to plant some of these other trees, we partner with the city schools. We've lost several trees on uh, campuses due to storms, new construction, things like that, and um, with funding shortfalls with measures A and B, I know that's kind of like one of the last things that we've been able to do is replant some of those trees. Thank you. Thanks for that suggestion, and I know Leslie has worked with the city schools in the past. We'd be happy to collaborate going forward. Great. I have one question about um, the eucalyptus in, in town, and um, I mean, those are long living trees. Um, you know, they're problematic in some places. Um, does the, does the, do you guys, you know, some people say they're non-natives, they're invasive, and they are in some cases. Um, do we keep maintaining that population or do we slowly convert those those types of places eventually if those um, ukes start to break off and die? What's, what are, what's kind of the going from sort of a an urban forestry kind of, I mean, I take them, I've had big eucalyptus removal, but that's really around uh, restoring, repairing around anadromous fish streams. So just curious, like what is kind of the urban canopy or urban uh, street tree sort of mindset on, on eucalyptus? If there Unless is one. We may be able to best address that. Yeah. So. You know, blue gum, eucalyptus, um, you know, there's a um, very bifurcated set of opinions on that canopy. And I, I think that there's a large percentage of our urban canopy that, uh, especially in the Greenbelt areas and riparian areas, that is blue gum coverage. And so um, I don't think ourselves in parks and rec um, nor the fire department is on any um, mission to eliminate that canopy. I think that there would have to be some significant environmental review done in order to uh, reduce those eucalyptus growth populations and replant with natives. Um, also, there's a significant amount of funding that would have to be required, and then gaining a consensus with the public is also going to be quite a challenge um, because it would, in essence, in the short run, be denuding some of the areas that are currently providing habitat with raptors and canopy coverage. Um, so I think that um, with some discussion and policy and if we can unite those um, you know, bifurcating opinions uh, between people that want to save them and, and um, 
people that uh, would rather see those restored to Oak Woodland. I think obviously it would be a good long-term goal to have some target areas to start attritioning out some of those into more of an Oak Woodland or a healthier riparian community. Um, but there's obviously a lot of politics involved with that, a lot of environmental review, and um, really just um, the funding and our ability to manage um, what we replant with and make sure that those new trees actually grow. Um, otherwise, we don't want to remove anything unless we can actually sustain uh, the new trees to where they actually provide adequate canopy. Thank you. Understood. Yeah, it's a difficult one. So I'll go ahead. Um, if there's no other comments or questions by council members at this point, um, council member Cummings, did you have another question? I did. I had one more <clears throat> question. I'm wondering um, maybe if there can be a little elaboration on kind of how um, property owners might be able to deal with some of the impacts of um, some of the street trees. So um, last year, um, my landlord reached out to me because there were trees, there were city trees that have been planted that now they've grown pretty large and have started to buckle the sidewalks that are outside of, that are adjacent to the property. And um, through our conversations, it was, he expressed that, um, that the city created policy in the past that makes the responsibility of maintaining those sidewalks, um, the responsibility is on the property owner, um, even though the trees were planted by the city. And I'm, so I'm just wondering, maybe if you can elaborate on that a little bit and you know, what kinds of um, programs are in place for um, property owners to work with the city if trees, if city trees that are planted are then resulting in having um, negative impacts on the adjacent properties. So I'll, I'll take this also. Um, so outlined in our urban forest, or not urban forest, but our Street Tree Master Plan, you know, I would love to have enough funding to where we take over the maintenance of street trees um, in their entirety, repair sidewalks, and oversee that pruning so we actually have consistency in how our canopy is maintained. I think um, in the short run, um, the best we can do, and you'll see that on your upcoming budget, I know with um, COVID, et cetera, and the lack of tax revenue, you know, we're looking at some significant budget shortfalls into the upcoming fiscal years projecting ahead. Um, but um, you will see, uh, City Council will see in the Parks and Recreation proposal the continuation of funding to support the Heritage Tree Grant. And I think that that program is critical in assisting property owners with replacing sidewalks doing root pruning and um, pruning a lot of these significant trees that are in our public right of way. So um, if I have that funding, then I can at least do reimbursement of the um, property owner maintenance obligations. Um, I think also just educating folks uh, that are responsible for maintaining their trees that uh, we don't necessarily just want to cut these trees down. We want to do root pruning and then other strategies that are outlined in the plan to actually uh, be able to retain as much canopy coverage in the right of way so we recognize those benefits and realize those benefits of trees for stormwater, et cetera. Um, in not all cases do we have to cut down and replace trees. I think root pruning is a viable option and there's other strategies. Uh, also, um, I'm not an attorney, of course, but um, it is my understanding that this is state law that property owners take care of the public right-of-ways and that our community has adopted a very standard uh, state law. Um, but it would be my hope as the program continues to grow and we implement some of these strategies, goals, and policies that are outlined in the Street Tree Plan that we actually are able to obtain some more funding and um, that way we can assist property owners or ultimately have a goal of taking over more trees that are in the right of way. Great, thank you. Mark or Tony, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? No. I, I would just add that um, it is the property owner's liability if somebody trips on a broken sidewalk in front of their property, whether it's raised by the street tree or not. Um, so it's in their best interest to um, get that repaired. We're happy to work with the property owner to get them a proper permit. Um, and if there's a way to save or, or trim the tree, we do work with Parks and Rec on that. Um, but it, it's pretty common throughout the, the state is to have that responsibility on the property owner. So. 
if I could just add to that. Um, that the, uh, the state law places the responsibility on the property owner to, um, to, to maintain uh, its sidewalks in good condition and repair. But the provision that uh, assigns liability for failure to do so in the event of an injury is, uh, is pursuant to the city's municipal code. And the city has an ordinance uh, modeled after uh, other ordinances that have been adopted by other cities in California. Um, but, but the liability transfer is city ordinance, not, um, not the state law. Thank you, Tony. I'll go ahead and bring this out to the public. We are starting to run pretty late. Um, I've got, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, there's the person with their phone number ending in 3346. Just press star six and you'll unmute. Good afternoon, can you hear me, council members? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Uh, perfect timing also. Um, I'm a resident of Walnut Avenue, a homeowner, and I'm calling to ask for your help with renewing the, uh, the street tree program and the master plan. Uh, those of us that live on Walnut, we love and appreciate our sycamore tree, London plane trees, but they are such a nuisance that every two to three years they need major trimming. Big branches come down, not only on the sidewalk, but into the road, which I know is a li big liability for the city as well. In fact, last night, a, a tree limb the size of a man's thigh, I'd say, fell and hit a car and shattered its um, you know, sunroof. So these, these limbs are coming down, they're, they're very dry. Um, we constantly are having our sidewalks pushed up by these roots, and this happens because it, it grows so much that it happens you know, every couple of years. It seems like the, the concrete is pulled up yet again. So we're just asking, you know, the city did plant these trees, and Leslie will tell you that, that they were not the appropriate tree to plant on such a city street because of the damage that they do. We're simply asking to renew the program to help us share in the financial cost of maintaining these trees, which is you know thousands and thousands of dollars between the sidewalks and the the limbs that need to come down, um, you know we're you know we um, we just hope that you can continue to work with us. And I'm sorry that more people haven't voiced their opinion about this on Walnut, but I just found out about the meeting a short time ago. So I know that my fellow neighbors um, on the street feel this way too. We're, we're constantly battling with these trees. So thank you for listening to my comments. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'll bring this back to the council now for deliberation. And I would look for further deliberation or a motion on this today. Councilmember Cummings and then Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'm happy to move uh, to approve the street tree at master plan unless there are any other uh, amendments that need to be made. I'll go ahead and second that. Okay, great. We have a motion by Councilmember Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Watkins to approve the street tree master plan. And Bonnie, could I um, ask for a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously, and thank you to the staff and great redirection of all that funding to do this. So, super exciting. Congrats to everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, next up is item number 38, which is the Westcliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan, a public works plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. 
The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. And today's presenter is Tiffany Weiss West, and Tiffany is our Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. And I'll turn it over to Tiffany now. Thank you very much, Mayor, and good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Tiffany Wise, West, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. Um, can I confirm that you can all see my screen, please? All right, very good. Um, we are before you today um, to talk about the West Cliff Drive plan that's before you for adoption. Um, we've been working uh, for since we first obtained this uh, grant funding from Caltrans over three years ago. Um, collaboratively, we have an internal team, Public Works, uh, Parks and Rec and Planning really are the core team, um, along with a 17-person um, technical advisory committee of which uh, Mayor Myers and uh, City Council Member Cummings were both members of. Um, and we really coordinated closely with key stakeholders. Um, so West Coast Drive uh, plan, as you've seen the slide before, is uh, part of the Resilient Coast Initiative, um, which also includes the, um, LC, the local coastal program amendment, um, which will be expected to be adopted uh, in the fall uh, by the end of the year, the complementary work. Um, the technical work for the West Cliff Drive project was um, completed uh, by December of last year, um, and we're really grateful to Integral Consulting, our primary um, uh, consultant on that project for the technical work that really, as you uh, have seen, is integrated throughout the, the plan itself, um, the appendices, and um, a number of hyperlinks to some of the, the deliverables that I'll share. Um, the goal of this, this plan is really, um, you know, to document the community's vision for future resilient coastal management in the face of climate change, but also to set forth a streamlined and proactive way to manage our coastline. Um, I'll keep going. And uh, I also want to emphasize that this really has been the start of an ongoing conversation around climate change and coastal management that will be continuing through time along with community engagement. So this is just the, the start of uh, uh, what will be a long-term uh, commitment to this kind of work. We have um, brought forward a number of deliverables over the last two years um, that we've updated council and the commissions on, um, everything from the comprehensive existing conditions and future vulnerability assessment to the adaptation strategy analysis. Um, you will see the socially vulnerable populations impact assessment also integrated into the document, um, as well as the robust engagement that we um, completed to support this project, including the virtual reality, which is also summarized in the census document. We had the conceptual transportation alternatives report, a funding and a benefit cost analysis, and then of course the project and policy recommendations, all of which can be found um, at the website uh, cityofsantacruz.com forward slash resilient coast. And as I said, have really been integrated into uh, this plan document. I know you've seen this slide before, but I do want to emphasize um, the extensive engagement that's taken place um, since early 2019 um, with over 1,500 touch points in the community um, on the Resilient Coast Initiative um, in a variety of formats. <clears throat> in terms of the plan structure itself, Really, I thought it would be helpful to just kind of put a who, what, where, why, when. Um, chapters one and two, uh, the introduction and context, really set the why we're going about doing this, um, the regulatory environment and so forth. Chapter three are the plot project planning considerations, really the how we are gonna do this. For example, if we are going to upgrade um, a seawall, this tells us how we do so um, We to incorporate things like living shorelines as well as thing, uh, other habitat enhancements like bird perches and things like that. So it really spells out the how as well as the future conditions uh, that we are projecting in terms of erosion. So the considerations that are really important um, to the projects. 
chapter four, <laughs> excuse me, is really the meat of the plan, the what, and I'll be sharing more about that in the next slide, as well as the goals and objectives were, that were developed collaboratively with the community for the project and for coastal management of West Cliff Drive. Chapters five and six <clears throat> really spell out best management practices and um, potential policies for larger projects. So that's more of the how. Chapter seven contains the illustrative future transportation concepts um, of which uh, we are uh, recommending um, uh, one of the alternatives that I'll talk about more. And chapter eight is really the project review and authorization procedures, which is where we get that streamlined process for our maintenance and more minor projects that are specified. Um, and then chapter nine is the capital improvement program. Um, it really specifies the when and how much it's gonna cost. So it's programmed out over several capital improvement program periods out through 2033. And we're looking at a cost of about 19, 20 million dollars and I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. So really the meat of the, the projects that have come forward um, in this plan, um, there are a number of corridor-wide projects, so I thought I would start with those. Um, we are recommending transportation, the plan includes, I should say, transportation signage and striping, uh, improvements to further communicate uh, West Cliff Drive as a class three bikeway. Going along with that, some parking management strategies to encourage uh, maximum public access and promote parking turnover, which could include things like time limits, hours of operation, and, uh, residential parking permit zones and potentially user fees. So that would be something we'll be embarking upon um, in the near term to look at for implementation. Um, some addition of formal bike parking, which is indicated um, in, in the project by project, zone by zone um, uh, project list. We also um, are calling for uh, a comprehensive stormwater outfall and pipe televising. So what that means is actually put a camera in the outfalls to inspect the interior condition of the pipe. Um, and then a commitment to replace failed pipe. There are 44 stormwater outfalls um, on West Cliff Drive. Um, also a sand management feasibility study um, that would be corridor wide looking at is there the potential to place sand uh, say at Pier Beach and then benefit from that littoral drift down coast. Of course, there's a number of things that need to be looked at with that. Um, so we are calling out that study. Um, we're also calling out maintenance and upgrade of existing coastal protection structures, everything from restacking riprap to replacing um, non-engineered structures that are failing with actual retaining walls or other wall structures. We also have a suite of um, parks and recs, uh, parks and rec um, um, improvements projects, um, site furnishings, uh, things like uh, trash receptacles um, and uh, bike racks I've already mentioned, potentially benches and interpretive signage. Um, you'll see the next item is actually a master signage plan and design standards. Um, we need to think about not just the interpretive signage, but um, the the surf instruction signage, the, um, the corridors uh, signage in terms of um, speed limits and things like that. So a comprehensive signage plan and design standards. Um, also natural restoration planning. Um, this is areas where we could remove ice plants and um, look at uh, other areas which have been identified in, on maps um, in the plan um, where there is potential for natural restoration. And also the creation of scenic overlooks, so small ADA accessible scenic overlooks along the multi-use trail. And so those are really the corridor wide projects. And then just as an example, I'll show zone three, which is really um, Lighthouse Point. Um, we do have specific zone by zone projects as well. For example, here at Lighthouse Point, you can see the um, we're calling for uh, conducting a, a study of the um, cave uh, at Lighthouse Point, and we'll also be looking at uh, feasibility analysis of, of what do we do with, with the lighthouse at that point. So as you 
you can see there are a number of other zone specific um, projects that are called out as well. And of note in zone three and in a couple other areas, you see all this green area that state parks property. And you'll notice the green dots, there's uh, five and two. Those are areas where state parks is interested in working with the city on those projects and encouraged us to keep them in the plan even though it was their property. And they have a number of different projects going on uh, to improve accessibility at different lots right now. So really close coordination with state parks. Also, um, we call out in the plan the Coastal Change um, Charters Monitoring Program and development of a funding strategy. And we have already begun working on that to better flesh out our triggers. Um, we're working with partners like UCSC's Coastal Science and Policy Grad Program right now actively working on this. Um, USGS, Scripps, NOAA, nonprofits like Save Our Shores and Save the Waves, all these groups are already making coastal observations, whether it's by camera or live, um, you know, could they potentially be leveraged for a comprehensive monitoring system in addition to the city's annual inspection of coastal conditions, the future televising I mentioned, and some of these future studies that are called out, which will definitely be um, things that will be monitoring um, for triggers. And really the goal here is to create an efficient and cost-effective monitoring platform to help us track our triggers to initiate between between the short-term projects that are called out in this public works plan and more medium and longer term projects. I think that's important to remember that the, um, the lifespan of this plan is 10 to 15 years. So everything that's contained in it is to be implemented within that time frame. Um, and I do want to emphasize that there is not um, a project called out in the next 10 to 15 years that calls for going to one way on West Cliff Drive. I know that's been a question in the community and I just, I wanna be clear about that. With that said, we're not precluding that as an option in the future. Um, so uh, just wanted to make mention of that. Lastly, we have an NSF grant that's pending right now to help us develop out this coastal monitoring and triggers. And there's nearly, as I said, a $20 million price tag. Um, and as part of the interim recovery plan uh, process, we'll be developing the funding strategy, which really will be a combination of grant funding, uh, philanthropy, and potential new revenue streams, um, as well as prioritizing grants to pursue to implement this plan. So um, that brings us um, to the recommendation. And you know, it is important to remember that this is the beginning of the coastal resiliency planning process and not the end of the planning process and that these policies and plans will continue to evolve over time as science evolves, trigger points are approached and the public, in, public input evolves. Um, we did have a unanimous recommendation from Transportation and Public Works Commission just six weeks ago in March um, for council to adopt the plan. Um, and it's also really important to remember that um, the city, we need to adopt the plan today. Um, the Caltrans reporting period closes at the end of the month and we need to satisfy our grant obligations with this adopted plan. Um, with that said, our next step in this process after adoption is to begin uh, the Coastal Commission process. And um, there could be uh, minor revisions to the plan uh, based on that process. Um, so with that, uh, I'll conclude uh, my presentation. And I know that um, the public works and planning folks are also on the line in case you have any questions. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have and thank you so much. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the work on this really exciting plan. And uh, really the approach to it was very unique and I would imagine will become quite a model for places around, not just California, but around the world on how to look at uh, adaptation and sea level rise. So thank you for all your work in doing this. Uh, I will go ahead and open this up to council member questions. Uh, and then uh, we will take it out to public comment and then we'll come back for additional deliberation and action. Uh, I see Council Member Boulder has her hand up. Hi, thank you, Tiffany, and for everybody that worked on it. Um, I know it was a lot of work and I appreciate that. And thanks for being available to answer questions for me. And I know one um, that, that 
the, the notion about the one way. I'm glad you clarified that. I do have a couple of questions. One, what does a class three bikeway mean? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Claire. Claire's our Claire Globally Transportation Planner. Bikeways typically fall into four different classes. A class one is a multi-use path, a class two is a bike lane, a class four is a protected bike lane, like what you see in front of the boardwalk, and a class three is what we call it as a shared route. It's marked with sharrows on the ground, which is a little bike icon with chevrons on the top, and typically signage as well. So it's minor signage and striping, and it's appropriate and reflective of lower speed and lower volume roadways of which West Coast was measured as. Yeah, we, I think we have those on our street, actually. I've seen them on Ulta, so I think we have those. Okay. And then my, my next one was a question that I got from community members was someone was concerned about the removal of ice plant causing fur, further erosion. And so can somebody speak to that? Sure, I can. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, our ecologist, um, <laughs> has made the recommendation to remove the ice plant. Um, the ice plant, when it becomes uh, saturated, becomes a major erosion concern. Um, and with proper native restoration and maintenance, um, you know, we can achieve the, the, I think what some of the folks are saying is, well, it's mature ice plant, it secures um, roots, you know, secures the soil, and we can do so with, um, with proper restoration um, and eliminate that potential for that sloughing um, that happens when the ice plant becomes um, saturated. On the Ahogger, I have one more question. Does someone else want to go? Can I just go? Okay. So my other question, and I don't know if anyone on the call can even answer it, but we had um, the meeting last week and we talked about, you know, protecting the surf. And so that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but protecting a surf break, a break um, you know, I'm sure the waves broke a lot differently before the wharves were constructed, before the harbor was constructed. And so I'm just wondering, has there been any thought into like, you know, the seawalls and those sorts of things in order to protect, you know, spots that are really popular, like Mitchells and Cowles in the lane and along with Cliff? Yes, definitely. Thank you for that question. Um, that is top of mind most definitely. Um, at Mitchell's Cove, what's being called out is the design and there will be a, a very robust engagement process along with that, but a design of the seawall, not the construction, but the design, and that certainly will be part of that analysis. Same thing over at Lighthouse Point, that's why we want to, uh, in 2026, do the geotechnical analysis of the cave as well as the feasibility study of what do we do with Lighthouse Point because, you know, does filling the cave change anything? Does, you know, what, how does this happen? And we just don't have the information to answer that, but um, the surf groups have been really great and engaged in this process. Two um, leaders from the surf community participated actively in our technical advisory committee. So it's something we're really attuned to. Okay, I swear it's my last one. My last one is, has there been any talk, because um, there is at my house, about creating any sort of artificial reefs anywhere along West Cliff for fishing or for surfing with maybe some leftover concrete from the landfill or anything that would otherwise just go in the landfill looking forward into the future? That is the first time I've heard this idea. So no, it's not part of this. <laughs> okay. Maybe, but maybe it's part of the next West Cliff Drive plan in 15 years from now. Thank you, I'll tell my son that. <laughs> You're welcome, have him keep thinking big. <laughs> okay, I've got Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks for the presentation. Um, and Council Member Golder asked two of my questions around the ice plants uh, and um, the surf uh, tying into our green economy study session last week. Um, I know that in your plan, signage is included and there was a great example last week um, and I think it was Australia where they have signage, world class protected surf and um, I just wondered if that was also included in that and um, or those considerations um, really calling out the, the surf uh, opportunities there. 
And then the third, uh, the third question I had had was regarding the um, alternate routes. We've received a lot of community input regarding that, and um, I just want to maybe have you clarify and speak to um, what it means to approve or adopt this uh, plan. Um, would include, you had mentioned a phased approach with these uh, alternative routes one and two, and um, I even heard there was an alternative three, but I wasn't sure what that was, if there's only two, and what that means in approving, approving this with those alternatives, or if we can, I know you have a Caltrans grant deadline and you're trying to get this approved now, but um, you know, there's, we received very concerned emails um, from community members wondering about that piece of it and wondering, I'm wondering how that plays in moving forward to maybe if you could speak to that. Sure, yeah, you know, our engagement showed both an anecdotal support both for and against a one-way concept. And um, how we have proposed this is that alternative one, which is um, the enhancement of signage and striping is what is contained in this plan. We do mention that a medium-term possibility is a one-way option, and in fact, the illustrative transportation concepts do present what that could look like, just as a, a concept. So with that said, you know, we are, to, just to be clear, we're not recommending, and we don't have in this plan a project for going to one way. However, that is a long-term planning process that needs to happen um, and design process. And we expect with these other projects that we have that we are going to be having that ongoing conversation um, with the, say, design of Mitchell's Cove, with the looking at Lighthouse um, Point. And so I know that Public Works um, also has their, the perspective, you know, from um, a, a standpoint of traffic operations and so I'll, I'll let Claire uh, touch upon that as well. Thanks, Tiffany. Yeah, Claire Globally, Transportation Planner. Just adding on what Tiffany said, conversion to one way on Wiscliff would be a, I would estimate, a multi-year community engagement process prior to moving in that direction. It would not only be the two and a half some odd miles of Westcliff Drive, but it would encompass almost the entirety of the lower west side because Westcliff right now, as it is in the two direction, two directions of traffic flow, enable lots of ways to get to and from where you're going. In converting to a one way, we would really need to look at traffic calming, partial closures, and other holistic tools with almost every street in the Lower West Side. That would involve direct engagement with all of those neighbors and neighborhoods. And as we know, when you do these projects, there are winners and losers, and it would take a lot, a lot, a lot of dedicated staff time and work on that. I'd also anticipate that it would take an iterative design process and a significant amount of budget just to move forward to consensus on that project if we could get to consensus which I think is a, a lofty aspiration for this project. Um, that said, it, adopting alternative one today as we move forward does make those incremental improvements for cyclists and pedestrians and does not preclude us from, in the future, council-directed um, work on an alternative two. At this time, I would say directing work on alternative two would take our very small but mighty team away from the other critical projects that we're working on implementing right now, namely the rail trail segments seven, eight, and nine, which we are really hoping can be our number one priority to really improve safety for our multimodal transportation system. Thanks, Claire. And I, yeah, and I just add to that that these near-term improvements that are in the plan really buy us time to do that engagement, to identify the resources that are needed. So I, I think that's important to remember as well. And um, Vice Mayor Bruner, I just want to get to your other question. You mentioned three different routes or alternatives, and I just want to clarify that so that there's absolutely no um, question about what's going on there. And so when when we uh, did our conceptual alternatives analysis, um, 
we also looked at, in addition to a one-way, and th these were alternatives that were called out in our grant that we needed to look at. In addition to the one-way um, traffic alternative, we also looked at reconfiguration of Westcliff Drive in the case of a catastrophic event that would make Westcliff Drive impassable. And this was conducted to inform community engagement and the development of the plan. And there were three routes shown, uh, Pelton, Monterey, and Claire, help me, I can't remember the third one. But Monterey Street should not have been shown as a potential re, uh, street for rerouted traffic um, since it's not one of the best detour routes. There's issues with that. So that was something that we acknowledged after um, the question came up uh, in November at our community meeting. Um, you know, we corrected that. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. We're not, there are no projects contained in this plan that call for any rerouting um, at all. This was something that we you know, tried to evaluate early on, but there are no recommendations. So just to be clear, there's the alternatives regarding um, the transportation itself and then the three rerouting um, routes that we're looking at, just to be clear about what we're talking about. Um, okay, and um, so, you know, you, you, you had mentioned that the Transportation and Public Works Commission voted unanimously to adopt the plan, and one of the emails we received was from the chair of that commission and several other community members um, regarding alternative um, Route 2. And um, so that's where I just wanted to get that clarification. It, it seems that if we adopt the plan, it, it's automatically adopting alternative two. No, that is not that is not the case. Okay. Alternative one, and yes, uh, we went to Transportation and Public Works Commission to ask for a recommendation to City Council to adopt the plan, and we did receive the unanimous recommendation to um, to recommend to Council to adopt that plan. But just to be clear, it, it is Alternative one, which is the striping and the signage, and not a one-way alternative. Thank you for clarifying that. And um, two would have further community engagement. Yes, indeed. Automatically, without direction from council. That it's going to be, as Claire said, we are going to need to come to some community consensus on this and there will be an iterative design process. With that said, again, as I mentioned, the, some of the projects that are called out in this plan, like the Mitchell's Cove seawall design, like the Lighthouse Point, um, Lighthouse uh, relocation or feasibility analysis, this will also be something that will be discussed in the context of those projects. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, Thank you. I, I see Council Member Brown has her hand up. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner asked the question that I was most interested in, uh, but I'm wondering uh, if you could, uh, and thank you so much for uh, for the report and the presentation and all of the work that's gone into this, and thank you for raising the, um, the that the plan moving forward, the process moving forward, will have many, many points at which uh, community can weigh in. Um, as I'm sure you are well aware, there's very strong feelings um, being uh, uh, transmitted to us, and you know, and I'm sure there will be as we move forward. So I'm wondering if. Um, just within that, you know, there's going to be community engagement. This is a long-term process. Is do you have like a a sense of? And I know there are many variables, so I'm not asking you to, um, you know, predict the future and say what's going to happen when. But um, just kind of where, how this might uh, proceed in terms of opportunities for community engagement. Um, just it, like talk about what you're thinking about that. Um, well, I did just mention the Mitchell's Cove and the Lighthouse Point, and those I think are the two most prominent um, uh, 
projects where community engagement is, you know, it will be robust. Um, the other piece then is developing out the triggers and monitoring program, which we're actively doing right now. And, you know, is there a trigger that would be developed that would initiate and, you know, that could be something like um, uh, a rate of erosion, say, or whatnot that um, could trigger us to go to that um, as an alternative you know, again, we don't we don't know, and we're not trying to assign time horizons because we're trying to utilize these triggers. Um, so that will be another piece that you know we really are trying to fast track the development so that we have a, a good understanding of what coastal change looks like and that we're able to be proactive versus responsive. And so I would say that that's the other area. Um, and and I didn't mention when I was on that slide, but we're thinking about bringing together cameras that exist, the buoy that just got deployed, potentially um, uh, community sourced science, previously known as uh, citizen science, um, to catch, you know, take snapshots um, in frames of specific areas and then do post-processing to understand what, okay, what does change look like? Um, because, you know, this, we need to rely on um, perhaps some new technologies, but there's a lot of existing observational technologies already focused on our coastline that we can leverage to be proactive. Um, so thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to follow up and say, I, so I, and I absolutely understand that. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to get um, you know, get as much information into the public's hands as possible since we hear about this and there's so much speculation when there's not information um, in many arenas. Uh, so I, I really appreciate, you know, your, your thinking about this and, and sharing your response and all of the work. Um, and I'll uh, probably follow up with you later about some specifics. Thanks so much. No problem. I have Council Member Watson. I think most of my questions have been asked already, so maybe mine's more of sort of a comment slash question, but first, just really want to compliment the, the team who put together this, this report and this, um, this document. It's really thorough and wonderful, and, and just really contextually speak to how important it is for especially coastal cities to be thinking this way and planning for these types of um, these types of changes that are really inevitable and how much is out of our control really in terms of climate change and adaptation um, and the decision points to make uh, mitigations, right, and to sort of change, uh, change our environment. And so um, I just appreciate the trigger points that have been outlined and kind of working from that place of trying to do the best we can to um, anticipate plan but not be able to predict exactly what will happen but i think extreme weather events and um increased uh, uh sea waters will will be uh something we're going to be addressing no matter what i guess my my question would be um at this point would be what when we're when we're maybe how how can we as a, as a council and community make sure that we're not um that this is actively part of our of our planning or updates or approach maybe it's just, maybe this is more related to the next item in terms of thinking about recovery but um if we're not centering a lot of our work on this i think we're really missing the ball and we will be stuck in a place of constant crisis response so um maybe the, the question would be then Will there be regular updates as to where we are, you know, to the council on how we're going to move forward with the plan, or how how do you anticipate this further being communicated to all of us in the community? Certainly, thank you for that question. Um, there's two mechanisms, I think. First of all, we of course need to come to council with um, what the what the approach is and the status of our uh, coastal commission. Um, hearings and so forth. So that will be the near term. Um, also, with respect to the interim recovery plan, Resilient Coast is called, the implementation of this plan is called out as a priority in the interim recovery plan. Very, I think someone may have mentioned uh, the green jobs and green economy piece and, you know, we are, we're trying to keep those jobs local. 
And then the last piece, so you'll, I think you'll be hearing more through the interim recovery plan implementation as well as um, the funding strategy development. Um, I, you know, we will be looking at a suite of funding strategies, again, from grants, philanthropy to additional revenue, and of course, any of that would come to you and we can certainly bring the overall approach, um, which would be in the context of the overall interim recovery plan uh, implementation approach to council as well. Um, so I see it as a project by project um, update in addition to the, the Coastal Commission process and the IRP process. And I guess my last question slash comment would be, um, I think that there is obviously a new or restored interest, especially at the federal level, to have investments in infrastructure. And we know how hard both you and Claire work on a regular basis to seek grants in addition to doing your day job. So if there's an opportunity for the council to provide extra support to you um, and to our city departments to pursue those grants, uh, Please, I, I guess I would just express my interest in wanting to have that brought forward to us because it's hard to do it all at times and we don't want to miss opportunities to receive additional funding to do this really important work. So. Absolutely. Thank you for that support. And I do know that the city manager's office is leading um, uh, uh, an effort to bring on uh, potentially a team to help us with both prioritizing and also pursuing um, as you said, the, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of federal um, opportunities as well as state opportunities that come up and we wanna make sure that we're capturing all of them. And we've already kind of begun that work. We've already kind of uh, begun to forecast uh, state and federal opportunities that are coming out, but they need to also be considered uh, within the entire interim recovery plan so that we can prioritize and, and start going after that stuff. So um, thank you for your support on, on that. Um, yeah, we will, you know, it looks like we're going in the right direction to get the, the resources we need to pursue that, that kind of uh, funding. That's great, thank you. You're welcome. Mayor, I think you're on mute. I am. I call that dog mute because always managing those little barks behind me. Um, I'll go ahead and take this out for public comment. Uh, I see we have one person in the audience and the phone is ending, phone numbers ends in 1884. You can press star six and that will unmute you. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Gina Cole. I'm with Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, I, as with all of you, I wanted to acknowledge um, the work that went into this plan and the expertise and experience that all of the folks that worked on it brought to the, this particular plan. It's so well put together and um, so well thought out. Um, I, I encourage you to approve this resolution. Um, I wanted to point out that there is a photo from uh, one of our favorite events, uh, Open Streets, included in this report. Thank you for that. Um, and and that's a, a piece of the plan too, is to for tying into goals from previous transportation plans and transportation. Um, you know, work plans was to encourage activities like that. And we're really hoping that we'll be able to do that um, in the near future or later future, but sooner, sooner than later. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, in the plan, um, page 12, when you're talking about tying this plan into transportation goals um, that, I'm oh, sorry, I'm not there yet. But that, that, again, community activities were part of it, but the other activity that was part of it was encouraging commute routes that ran along the existing rail line. Um, and we're glad that that made it into this plan as well. Um, so I, I thank you for your foresight in considering pedestrians and cyclists. Um, I, I do always have concern about folks riding fast on the on the recreation trail. Um, I would hope that the the marking of the road with the class class three markings would encourage folks to feel safer riding in the road way um, to keep everyone safe on that multi-use path. 
Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Next is Phil. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me, Mayor? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. This is Phil Boutel, the Chair of the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, I'm speaking here, of course, on my own behalf, but I just wanted to clarify the intent of my letter and one to say that I, on one hand, I apologize, I didn't mean to cause a campaign by this. I just wanted to keep this on the radar. And I, uh, through the, you know, the time that Dr. Wise West has brought this climate adaptation plan to the commission, um, you know, overall we've been completely supportive and she's been great at clarifying that you know, while this was a Caltrans grant, this is a climate adaptation plan and not meant to be an independent transportation plan. I think my ask in that letter was, um, I'm asking you to, you know, follow the Transportation Commission, Public Works Commission's recommendation to approve the plan as staff recommends, but then also pull that alternative too as an additional, like let's make it a transportation plan. I think that Claire Globally did a great job of outlining that it would be a big lift but it's a list we have to start at some point. Let's not wait a number of years until we kind of are forced into it by adaptation. Um, this is a choice we can make to start that process. It, it should take years of public engagement and probably some money, and let's go figure out how to chase some grants so that in a few years, we're ready to have those big public meetings and we're ready to go through the design, um, et cetera. I think this is about prioritization, and I hope that we can, now we've seen these beautiful renderings of what West Cliff Drive can be, um, let's have that conversation about do we want it as a community. That, that was all I was after. So uh, thank you, Dr. Wise-West, for this, and thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Commissioner. And next up I have phone number ending in 80, I'm sorry, 0836. Please press star six. Hi, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that any one-way planning is years away, but in response to Phil's letter that went out yesterday along with a couple of others, uh, I'm speaking now because I disagree about the concept of one-way Westcliff. Uh, it's certainly nice that we have the big volume of information about coastal preservation methods, and I'm pleased like everyone else and thankful to all the people involved, and, and yes, we should have a, a treasure for that inventory. But the plan to make Westcliff drive one way is misbegotten, not because it would make bicycle and pedestrian usage safer, it's misbegotten because it would punish people like me that live in the nearby neighborhoods and send all that traffic down our streets. We have an experiment where that happens all the time when West Cliff is closed. So it's also misbegotten because this decision about one-way traffic has absolutely nothing to do with sea level rise, as a couple people just pointed out, or to responding to it. It's basically a transportation decision and it would basically punish one or one part of our town those are within one to four blocks of the beach in favor of those who presently take their cars out on Westcliff Drive sadly it's because nobody has recognized that what we don't want is that automobile traffic along the coast at all nor do we want to funnel that traffic into our neighborhood streets the two aspirations are equally important and I think you just recognize that there are very good ideas about how to provide attractive transportation along the coast without having the carbon belching traffic at all. I can imagine a tomorrow where smart automated electric vehicles take people to and along the coast and no personal autos are there at all. Sure, I can visualize that and I know you all can too. And of course, all the bikes and pedestrians are there too and it's safe for everybody. So. It's actually really cool that there's an interactive map shown there, and it shows that only sand is going to be underwater in 2050. So let's get on the plan for doing smart things right now. Thank you. Okay, that's it for our public attendees or our public comments today. I'm going to go ahead and bring it back to council for any further deliberation or for a motion. And this is for the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan and we are looking to uh, a motion to adopt. Oh, okay, I see Council Member Watkins followed by Council Member Boulder. I was muted. Unless there's any other questions, I'm happy to move the recommendation and make a motion to adopt the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan, a public works plan with minor modifications as authorized by the city manager. Great, and Council Member Boulder? 
I just want to clarify. So you're going with the recommendations of option one? The one that's in the staff report. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I can second that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And then I have uh, Council Member Collentary Johnson and then Council Member Cummings for further questions. Do we have a motion and a second and further questions by council members or comments? Thank you, Mayor Myers. No questions. I just wanted to take a moment to um, thank Tiffany, Claire, and everyone who worked on this, the commissions. Uh, I was really um, uh, impressed with the level of community engagement, the intentional uh, community engagement. Um, and I think um, the, the what is it, the existing level of service for underrepresented groups by zone, those charts were very telling. Um, and it's clear that the decisions, well, I, I, I imagine that the decisions moving forward will be made based on all of um, all of that assessment and all of the community input. So I just wanted to acknowledge that process and, and thank you guys for the work. Thank you, council member. Council member Cummings. Yeah, I just wanted to echo some of the sentiments that, was, that were just expressed by Council Member Kalantari Johnson and, and by other colleagues. Um, as, as a member of the TAC, uh, I just was fortunate to be able to see how much work was really going into this. And I really want to thank all the um, members of our community who participated in the um, in the advisory committee uh, in the TAC um, for the uh, consultants that worked with us and especially uh, thankful for Tiffany and all the work that she did um, to bring this forward to us today. Um, I, one of the things that, um, that Dr. Wise West really emphasized was trying to connect with underserved and underrepresented communities in this. And so I also want to really appreciate her intentionality for trying to reach out to those communities and ensure that their voices were heard. And so um, this was a lot of, it was a big lift and it was really um, um, one of the things, the plans that we brought forward, well, another plan that we brought forward that had a significant amount of community input. And so I just wanna appreciate all the work that's gone in to bring this forward today. Thank you, council member. Okay, we have a motion by council member Watkins and a second by council member Colder to adopt the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan and with minor modifications as authorized by the city manager. And I'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to clarify that the recommendation doesn't include the adoption of a resolution, but there is a resolution. I was gonna, okay. Approving the, um, the plan, correct, Tiffany? Yes, there is a resolution associated with adopting the plan. Okay. And Bonnie, do we need to recognize that resolution or the motion is um, to adopt? Yeah, it would just be to adopt resolution, adopting the West Cliff and then the staff recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to make that part of the motion, to update the motion to include the resolution language. Great, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do a uh, roll call vote. All right, Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brenner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. And again, congratulations, Tiffany and Claire and the whole team. You guys did a great job, so thank you. Thank you very much, Council. Well, as you can see, we've been on a little bit of a uh, earth, 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 earth week kind of tear here um, with all these great um, last three items. We'll now move on to item number 39. We're hopefully gonna get caught up. Um, and this is item number 39 is the re-envision Santa Cruz interim recovery plan update. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by the staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. 
Uh, our presenter today is Laura Schmidt, from our Assistant City Manager, and this is on Reimagine Santa Cruz Interim Recovery Plan Update, and this is to accept the first quarterly progress reports and provide feedback as desired. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Laura Schmidt, your Assistant City Manager. I'm going to share my screen and give you a brief presentation. So we're here today to, um, as the Mayor said, get your first quarterly update on our progress as it relates to re envision Santa Cruz, building a future for everyone together, our 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan in response to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we've been up to since the end of February is we've been furthering the recovery plan, adding some definition and filling out the meat of the skeleton. And we're here to report for the first time on accomplishments related to the focus areas, as well as the performance metrics that you all identified in and approved in November to track our progress. So further advancing re-envision Santa Cruz, the two things that we have focused on um, offline are putting together a quick two-page summary that gives the reader an overview of re-envision Santa Cruz and outlines objectives for each focus area. The other thing that we've done in response to council member feedback was um, put some categories and further clarification around the list of projects and we've also refined and reduced the list. So our focus areas are fiscal sustainability, downtown and business revitalization and infrastructure. And you'll see in attachment one, the objectives underneath each one of these areas, as well as a high level summary that gives you an idea of what Reenvision Santa Cruz is all about. And that's our um, two page handout for our community members to be able to quickly understand what we're focusing on and trying to achieve in our recovery. On the fiscal sustainability side, we're really trying to rebuild our city's strong financial foundation while maintaining amazing, excellent customer um, service and our service delivery of our core services, improving the quality of life in our community and building resilience to face the challenges that are gonna continue to come during this pandemic and any other emergency that um, seems to be getting thrown at us these days. The other thing that um, downtown and business revitalization, our second focus area, is really investing in our amazing diverse locally owned business community and all of the great things that you see in our community that you wouldn't normally see in, um, another, in another community as far as chains and box stores. We have a lot of unique and diverse um, businesses here. And focusing on the downtown, but also as a center for housing, commerce, and transportation, and ensuring an equitable recovery for all of our community. Our final focus area is infrastructure, and this includes our traditional infrastructure, but also um, looks and focuses on improvements to facilities, systems, and our parks and open spaces, so our natural infrastructure, not just our built infrastructure. And we really wanna focus on resiliency, climate adaptation, and supporting here as well a high quality of life. The other work that we did during um, the break is for each one of these focus areas, we defined project categories. So within fiscal sustainability, we've further broken down and organized those projects related to efficient service delivery and new and improved funding sources. And then within downtown and business revitalization, we're focused on, focusing on downtown reinvestment, economic recovery and resiliency, and affordable and market rate housing. And finally, in infrastructure, you'll find our green economy and workforce projects. I'm terribly sorry if you can hear all the sirens. Emergency, hold for no one. Um, our parks, recreation, and open spaces, and uh, resiliency and improvements. So you'll find those project categories are reflected in the way that we've organized the projects in a little bit more detail. And then the full project list is in attachment four of your packet. So that's the work that we've been doing. 
the actual content of um, today's agenda item are our accomplishments and our first reporting on our metrics, our first baseline report on the metrics. So attachment two will give you our full progress report and you'll see a narrative organized by our focus areas and our project categories of all the amazing work that staff's been um, working on and coordinating over the last few months since we adopted the plan in November. And I just highlighted a subset of some of the accomplishments. So within fiscal sustainability, um, we've launched various floor cost recovery fee studies you saw coming back to council that, and also adopted in the second public hearing today were revised and new development fees and that range from um, sewer to water to development fees, child care impact and public safety. Um, council member Watkins had asked about grant writing. Uh, the city managers, and Tiffany had alluded to this, uh, the city manager's office has uh, successfully re received approval from all of the departments for a pilot concept where we will um, go out for a request for information and we've already done that for a grant writing managed service and that will give us an overview of all the different grant opportunities in, in the city and that's a citywide perspective. And um, we have amazing pockets of people within each department that really pursue grants and get a lot of them. But when you look strategically across the landscape, there's so much more available out there and we just don't have the capacity to do that, nor do we have the subject matter expertise in this area. So we're um, in the process of putting that pilot together to do a, a working with a, a partner company to do grant writing managed services as well as a strategic landscape analysis of where we should be focusing and what we should be going after and then picking the ones to go after, going after them and winning and getting uh, some additional grant money for the city. We're also in this fiscal sustainability area making a lot of progress on recreation programming plans and um, marrying that programming plan with revenue policies. So that's in our parks and rec department. In the downtown and business revitalization, there's a, a ton to choose from here where you've got, uh, we, we launched a while ago and are continuing to support and expand a business loan program. Uh, the outdoor expansion program that we temporarily launched in connection with COVID is continuing and ongoing and getting solidified. And then um, planning and community development, I think was here a, a meeting or two ago to launch the downtown expansion plan formally. We've done housing and uh, inclusionary ordinance updates to help with that affordable and market rate housing progress. And then we're working on objective standards for residential development proposals as well. And then the next agenda item on your um, list today uh, will be a great one in this space, the economic development. We'll talk to you about a uh, pulse program. On the infrastructure side, you just saw the West Cliff uh, Drive at our temptation plan and you approved that. And that one is an ongoing project in the infrastructure space and we'll come back to you for additional uh, reports and progress. We also initiated a framework for workforce development and all the uh, amazing things that we could be doing in that space. And then on the water system side, we uh, have a backbone reinvestment program that was adopted. And then you also know that you adopted the wharf master plan and we're continuing to develop and um, pursue those items within the wharf master plan. The full progress report, uh, for these accomplishments and more with more detail are in attachment two of your packet. Metrics, so you adopted 13, base, um, 13 metrics to track the recovery for the city of Santa Cruz. These are items that we thought we could impact as it relates to could our actions um, help us see and move the dials on these 13 metrics. So just some notes as we go through the list. The comparison year that we used, used was our last standard fiscal year, which was fiscal year 2019. Um, fiscal year 2020 has impact of COVID numbers. So to compare it would not have, fiscal year 21 to 20 would not have given us a good comparison. So the comparison year that you'll see in the report is 2019. Uh, the period as well that we're, you're looking at right now is July through December. 
um, rather January through March is not in this baseline report that we're giving you because the data was just not available for some of the metrics. So you'll see January through March during the next report in from us. We have one uh, metric that staff is recommending to eliminate, but we're recommending a replacement metric, and you'll see that in the report as well. And then um, next quarter, one of the things that we'll be working on and uh, Tiffany Wise West is helping is uh, suggestions regarding how, to, how do we apply health and all policies equity lens to these metrics and incorporate equity into the metrics that we're doing. We could not get that put together in time for this report, but we are working on it with staff and we'll, we'll report back into you with suggestions during our next quarterly report in. The full metric support is in an attachment three, and then I've got screenshots and we'll walk you through those. And then um, I'd like to walk through the actual metrics and what their numbers look like, get through the final slide, and then open it up for questions. Because I know these numbers, you'll be like, Ooh, what about this and what about this and what does this mean? And we've got the departments on the line uh, to be able to help out with some of those questions. So at the top of your Attachment three of the metrics, we have um, two that we translated into graphs, commercial vacancy and sales tax revenue. And you'll see on the commercial vacancy front that our vacancy rate is up by 23% in the six month period that's reported. So that's pretty substantial. The other thing that we did is because of these six months weren't impacted by fiscal year in fiscal year 20 for sales tax. Um, the report does look a little interesting in, the, in especially the second quarter when you compare the sales tax of fiscal year 21 to the sales tax of fiscal year 19. They don't look that far off, but that was due to a reporting change in sales tax. So we added fiscal year 20 in this instance to show that we have indeed lost on the sales tax revenue front. This is the top half of your metrics report. We, business licensing, business licenses renewed, commercial vacancy rate, business closures reported. Um, in the instance where we have two separate pieces of information within a metric, we did A and B. So on the closures reported, it looks like it's reduced, so that would lead you to believe that we had less, that we 50% less business closures, but we all know that that's not true. And this is, is self-reported by the businesses. So staff realize that that probably isn't an accurate reflection of what's actually happening out there. So uh, they came up with, based upon their research and talk with other agencies, uh, to look at utility terminations. So when you look at utility terminations, um, the increase in business closures is 33%. So as businesses um, close down their utilities, we capture that information, and then here's where you see the decline that you would expect during the pandemic. Number of permits issued, we have planning applications. We broke it out between planning applications and building permits. So we are down in those areas as well. This is the metric that new housing units that we're recommending to eliminate because between fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 21, we see an over 400% increase, and the housing units reflect um, units that have completed construction, and that can be so volatile depending upon any given month or quarter, and if a large development comes online, then you'll see those numbers spike. So uh, staff put their uh, brains together and came up with total valuation of building permits issued as a potential alternative metric for you to consider. And these permits capture mostly the residential, almost all of the residential, commercial, and industrial construction activity in our area. So that's an indication of overall investment. And when you look at that revenue and the valuation of it, um, we're down 54%. So that is the recommendation by staff as a replacement metric. 
Going on to the next group, um, transient occupancy tax, you see a decline in 30%. Sales tax revenue, you see that it, that increase of 5.75%, and that's why we included the fiscal year 20 bar so that you could see the difference um, and that this is probably due to a change in the way the state is um, timing the distribution. On the ad tax side, um, the startling 96% reduction in administration ad admission tax, um, this has a lot to do with the closure of the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Our general fund reserve, um, and this is a, an entire year, so we, we, we cannot parse out quarters on this one, where uh, it's a 27% decrease one year to the next. Our general fund capital maintenance budget, and this is like how are we investing on, so if, if you look at the infrastructure side intuitively, you know that investment in that area would be reflected in our general fund capital maintenance budget. So that was one of the reasons why we are capturing that. And again, this by necessity needs to be an annual number. And um, we had about 1.5 million designated in fiscal year 19, zero designated in fiscal year 21. Maintenance of parks, open space, the labor hours per acre for a fiscal year, budgeted versus actual. So you'll see in this one, budgeted, um, they're budgeted down less by 5% between fiscal year 19 to um, fiscal year 21. But conversely, they're budgeted as less, but the usage of our parks and open space has surged. So while the usage has increased, our maintenance budgeted and our maintenance actually done has decreased. So this is a, this is a concern area for us where budget is down 5% and actual is down even further by almost 14%. Uh, maintenance of recreational facilities. So this is not open space, this is our actual rec facilities, the labor hours per 1,000 square feet for the fiscal year. Uh, we have the budgeted number and uh, for each fiscal year is the same. And then Parks and Rec staff is currently working on a process to measure actual hours to be able to report that back to you. Um, I want to thank a lot of people that um, put all of this together. We obviously have our employees who are on a day in and day out basis contributing to the accomplishment and the, and the changing of the dials that you see in our metrics reporting. They're the ones that really make this all come together and have us be able to actually re-envision Santa Cruz and recover. Uh, we also have specific departmental staff who have been working with the city manager's office to give us report content gather the, especially the metrics and the data behind what you've seen. We've had department heads also help out a lot with the, with the re report content, um, the questions of, okay, we, we have this data, it doesn't look right. Help us research it some more and give us an idea to go back to the council to make a recommendation or a change. And then finally, we had a subset of department heads um, who were the re Envision sub team, and they really have spent a lot of time working with the city manager's office and focusing on um, getting this uh, come to come to life. It's pretty easy to put a strategic plan together. It's not easy at all to actually. Um, integrate that into our day-to-day -day work, be able to explain to council and the community what we've achieved as it relates to those focus areas and then show the actual data behind it. So um, that team has been amazing. And then I also wanted to specifically thank uh, Elizabeth Smith, our communications manager, and Ralph America, our principal management analyst in the city manager's office who have done a ton of work on this. So re-envision Santa Cruz, building a future for everyone together. What we're asking from you today is a motion to accept our first quarterly progress report on re-envision Santa Cruz, our 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan. And if there's any feedback you'd like to incorporate into the recommendation for us to make any adjustments, we'd appreciate that as well. So with that, I can cycle back to any slides or question areas that may come up. Thank you so much, Laura. The presentation was great. It's nice to uh, see uh, the cool colors and the graphs and everything you guys put together is really nice. It's a really nice way to kind of sort through a lot of information. I'll go ahead and um, 
see if council members have questions um, regarding the report or the materials in the packet. Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Laura, for that really good presentation. Um, when I was going through um, the, um, the report and specifically in the sections where it kind of um, lays out the table, um, the one, one area um, that I'm very much interested in is kind of the workforce of development in the green economy. And I'm just wondering if you might be able to speak to kind of any of the specific efforts that are, are gonna be implemented around workforce development. Um, it seems there's a number of different sections where it's kind of listed, um, but um, I just wanted to see if maybe you had some more specifics on kind of what approach staff is gonna be taking it with that workforce development. So I was looking on the list of participa participants and it looks like Rosemary is not on here. Um, I don't know, Tiffany, if you have any additional details. One of the key things that uh, Rosemary did on behalf of the larger city, which was amazing, is put in for a Civic Spark Fellow to help begin to outline the, the plan and the steps as far as workforce development and the things that we will be doing. Uh, I would need Rosemary to be able to help me answer the more details of that, or maybe Bonnie knows. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, I was, you actually um, answered it um, for me, but I will just add to that that we're um, kicking off a working group tomorrow um, with Tiffany and Rosemary and folks of the city that are working on these initiatives. And we're actually also meeting with the county um, tomorrow afternoon to talk about um, our, the Civic Spark Fellow, um, the apprenticeship program that we're hoping to start at the city and design it, which will be part of the scope of the Civic Spark Fellow this, this starting in the, late this summer, early fall, as well as the funding that the county has um, that Supervisor Trinity set aside for workforce development. So we're gonna coordinate on all these with the Workforce Development Board and the SEDS group at the county and you know work internally at the city to move these initiatives forward. That's great. Um, thank you. It's, it's just exciting to see all these different components kind of uh, coming before us and, and getting ready to move forward. So just want to appreciate um, all the staff's work thank on you, Bonnie. Okay. okay, I've got uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, for the, um, the report. Super thorough and really helpful and extremely exciting. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm excited about all of it, but in particular about the grant piece. So thank you for moving forward with that, um, as well as uh, putting in the, yeah, the health and all policies metrics. This may be too like zeroed in, but I had a question on, um, and if it's, if it's not appropriate to ask it now, I can hold it for another time. I had a question. I was curious about the cannabis ordinance um, amendments um, and coordinated efforts to uh, basically enforce illegal cannabis activity and what kind of cost recovery that would generate. Um, just, I was interested in, in hearing more about it and how much funds we can get from that and where there's, what kind of partnerships are happening. And if right now is um, not the time to go into that level of detail, we can, I can follow up. Thanks, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. I'll uh, give you a high level and then feel free to reach out to me uh, separately if you'd like some more details. Essentially, we met, uh, the, the police identified that um, the county has been going through a program of enforcement that had um, a different penalty structure. Um, and it was a very straightforward structure based on um, the number of plants and the weight. And um, so if you're doing an illegal grow, for example, you know, they would go out and they could easily count and just take photos of like, you have 100 illegal plants, like this is how much you owe. And, and so they were able to um, <clears throat> eliminate a lot of the appeals and they were able to, um, where they were estimating certain things like, all right, well, you've been in violation for six months and penalties could be, you know, based on that six months 
uh, of timeline, um, it, there was arguments. Well, those plants aren't six months old, and so you know it, it got complicated. So they went to that specific approach, and um, they have um, had way fewer appeals of their um, uh, of the violations that they've had. Um, so it's made that process go faster and they've been able to um, really um, identify um, here's here's exactly how much it is that you owe and we've got we've got the documentation to show it. Um, so we're looking at restructuring that and actually, um, partnering with the county because they already have a uh, a unit that is set up that does this. In fact, um, they identified um, a location within the city limits, and, and at least this was how it was called to my attention. Um, they identified a location within the city limits, and they reached out to say, "Hey, you know, are you undergoing any permit process?" For these guys and we at this location we said no we're not so then they went there and that um at least on the planning side initiated the conversation so they would then we would then um, partner with that group um, at the county to assist with the enforcement and um, they would be able to to um, we can cover some of those costs that they have but then the the violation um, revenue would come into us so that's that's essentially it in a nutshell great thank you so much yeah maybe i'll follow up i'm interested in learning more Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I have Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you so much, Mayor Myers. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the update. And now I want to get a light blue blazer. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, so my question is this, the recent City Arts Recovery Design uh, Grant that went out the card, um, how does that play into this and, and will there be updates on that? How, how? Uh, Mayor, can you give me the Good afternoon, Council Member Bruner. Um, we um, will come to Council with updates on that. Um, we did receive 60 submissions um, to the call for artists, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and we have, yeah, it, it, it's really exciting. And we have over 36 panelists who are going to help us review. Um, and it, it's a whole cross section of artists, um, downtown organizations, other stakeholders, uh, business representatives, you know, just sort of across the community who are really gonna help us look at all these proposals and come up with um, the, the short list for um, the book of ideas. So we will come back to council and report on that um, to you and we have a, a pretty robust process ahead of us. Thank you. I just love that idea of incorporating the arts and its many forms into the recovery process and specifically with, yeah. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And, and I, as I was leaving my home today and I looked down what I was wearing, I'm like, did I subconsciously dress to coordinate with my presentation? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, any other council member questions on this item? I'm not seeing any. Well, Laura, again, um, I appreciate it, and it, it's really nice to. Um, it's just a, you know, it's just nice to be able to check it. There's so many big projects and so much work going on, and you guys are just doing so much that it's really nice to sort of have it all condensed in a you know fairly short format. I think it gives us um, a, a great tool to talk to people about what's going on in the city, um, and um, also just provides a really great way to kind of see the overlapping with regards to the three priority areas. So it's it's really helpful to see it in this graphic, graphic, graphical kind of layout and a little more engaging than the Excel and all that. So appreciate the conversion. And, uh, and 
all the questions that you guys had, um, whether it's something that is currently in our first narrative report or, you know, more details about workforce development, give me a little bit more about the cannabis side. You know, we just launched the art program. Those are the types of things that even if they don't show up in the narrative report, they're on that list. So that was kind of, that's the way for to prompt you and to be able to ask us, well, what about this one? You know, if, it, if it didn't make this quarterly report, <clears throat> what's going on with it? So this is exactly the type of interaction that we were hoping the reports would invoke with you. So we, we appreciate that. Great. Thank you. I'll go ahead and take this out for public comment. I'm not seeing any hands raised at this point. So this will be on item number 39, the interim recovery plan update. Okay, I'm not seeing any, so I'll take it back to council and I would look for a motion uh, to accept the first quarterly progress report. And I see Vice Mayor Bruner followed by council member coming. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to accept the first quarterly progress reports on the city's re envision Santa Cruz strategy, a 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan and provide well, we've provided feedback. <laughs> thank you, Vice Mayor. As staff recommended, thank you. Thank you for all the work. And I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Bruner, a second by Council Member Cummings to accept the first quarterly progress report on the city's re envisioned Santa Cruz strategy. And uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Watkins. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Boulder. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. We've got one more item tonight, um, and I think we'll power through and get this done, and then we've got oral communications. So next up is item number 40, vacant storefront activization, activation pilot program, downtown POP, uh, and this is a budget adjustment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Our presenter is Rebecca Unit, David McCormick, and Bonnie Lipscomb, all from the Economic Development Department. And this is to authorize the creation of a vacant storefront activation program in downtown Santa Cruz, adopt a resolution approving a budget adjustment in the Economic Development Trust Fund to fund the six month pilot program and authorize the city manager or his or her designee to execute in the form approved by the city attorney any leases, licenses, or any other such agreements, documents, or administrative duties necessary for the implementation of the downtown POPs program. And I'll turn it over to Bonnie. Great. Thanks, Mayor, and um, good afternoon, <laughs> Mayor and members of the, of the council. It's good to see you again. Um, I'm really excited uh, to kick off this item. Rebecca Unit and I will be giving the presentation. I'm going to just provide sort of the initial context um, for this program and how this fits into our larger recovery efforts. Um, Laura obviously just you know finished a great overview of our interim recovery plan, and, and this is part of that plan. So I'll give that context of what we've kind of done so far um, through the pandemic, and then Rebecca is going to go into the details of the program, and then we'll conclude by sort of going back to sort of what the timeline next steps are and then the recommendation. Um, with that, um, Rebecca, if you could go to the next slide. So you've seen this slide before. I'm just sort of bringing it back because we are moving a little bit along the timeline. You know, March to May of last year, we were really in survival rescue mode and immediate needs, deferments, you know, our own sort of city leases, um, some of the uh, kickoff programs, revitaliza revitalization programs we had, including our microloan program, into the stabilization, more substantial assistance, SBA loans. Um, and now we're into just starting the recovery and rebuilding. And 
and, and 2021 and beyond. And I'll go into just a little bit of detail on that. So um, just to review, I don't want to go into the details of these. You all have seen them before, but these are some of the efforts we did citywide. So it's not just our department. This is across the city um, with support across the departments, including the city attorney's office. So residential and commercial eviction moratoriums, rental assistance, um, rent deferments for city tenants, um, city utility and parking fee payment flexibility, um, alternative city pack, uh, pay schedules, um, the city executive order, um, delivery fees, um, insurance, and right out the way, um, just to name a few. Um, specifically, efforts that we were working on, um, in addition to that, in sort of that middle zone stabilization and jumpstart the restart kit. Um, and for businesses out there, we still have um, some of those elements, um, particularly if you need hand sanitizer, we have that for refills. Um, we kicked off over, and, and really, it's, it's been pretty amazing to see the number of businesses that have already repaid our Resilience Microloan Program. We have almost, I think, a third that have repaid that funding already, which is pretty incredible. Um, our temporary COVID outdoor expansion program, where we have over 90 businesses participating currently, we are actually working on the permanent expansion program. Hope to bring that to you um, early summer, sometime in the next couple of months. Um, our Get Virtual program, uh, which really takes uh, retailers across Santa Cruz who don't have an online presence, really works with an um, entrepreneurship program at UCSD to get them online so that they can have an e-commerce business. And then, of course, the holiday campaign um, collaboration with the Downtown Association, Shop Santa Cruz, um, Shop Local, and all of the Shop Local campaign, which we're continuing round two now going forward. And then rebuilding, um, as I mentioned, uh, developing the permanent parklet program, um, launching, which we did last month, um, the expansion of our revolving loan fund made possible through the grant um, that National Development Council applied for on behalf of the whole county. Um, so we can leverage that up to a really expanded, um, flexible financing for businesses in need um, up to, you know, four and a half million, five million within our city. Um, ongoing Shop Santa Cruz campaign and banners, and this one's also reflective of the Economic Recovery Council recommendations for us to coordinate on countywide. We've been um, meeting with ERC and businesses across the county to really share um, in some of the recovery efforts for consistency, you know, from the loan to the shop local campaigns and hoping to be able to see some of this in both English and Spanish countywide. Um, City Arts Recovery Design Program, as Councilmember Bruner mentioned, um, is, is up and running. And um, a partnership that we have with SBDC, the Quicks to Bricks um, Incubator Accelerator for Retail, is really an expansion concept of uh, the Get Virtual program. So we're excited for that to be launched soon, of getting businesses online and providing them business support as they go forward. And so then we turn to sort of the downtown pop. Um, and a vacant storefront activa activation program. And Rebecca's gonna go into the detail, but I wanna provide just a little bit of context of why downtown. Um, you know, obviously the pandemic has hit the entire city, um, but when we looked particularly at the downtown economy, we realized that the downtown really stands alone. Not only is it the heart of our community where we have the greatest concentration of businesses, we also have the greatest concentration of businesses in a very dense area. And along Pacific Avenue is where you see that great greatest vacancy rate, and you really experience some of the biggest impacts. Obviously, the outdoor expansion um, that many of the restaurants have done has really helped to activate our downtown streets. Um, but if you look, we have, I think it's over 18 vacancies on, on Pacific Avenue alone. Um, it's really high in the, in the downtown, and we really want to support those businesses. You have that impact of when you start to have a number of vacancies, people, um, you know, are, it's going to impact their experience when they come downtown. We want to really help um, help our existing businesses thrive and help that long-term viability of downtown and sustainability. When we look at sales tax, in addition to vacancy rate, you also see you know, the largest number of businesses which, with the biggest sales tax decline over the last year. It's over 31% in the downtown. That's really reflective of those vacancies and those businesses that have had to close. 
Um, our interim recovery plan um, that you approved, you know, last November really reflects that, reflects the focus on uh, the importance of our downtown for our community. And uh, you really said, you know, this is one of our focus areas that we, that we re really need to um, put a lot of effort around recovery. Um, so attracting and retaining businesses and supporting long-term investment in downtown is really what this program is all about. It's reducing some of that risk, particularly for new business ventures. It is a really tough time to start a business, a new business during the pandemic. Um, so this reduces the risk for those businesses and it provides a little flexibility and enables property owners, landlords to take that risk because they know they're at least going to get a minimum rent um, guaranteed by the city. So I won't go into the details of that, but I did want to put that context of why downtown, why this program now, and how that fits into our larger recovery efforts. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca um, to really go into some of our program goals and then some of the uh, specifics of the program. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Rebecca Unit, business liaison for the city of Santa Cruz. I'm really excited to give you an overview of this program um, that we've put together. So um, downtown POPs, our vacant storefront activation program, um, we have three major goals here with this program. Um, First and foremost, helping to stabilize the downtown um, is one of you know our core commercial areas in the city. Um, we're really looking at finding a way to um, support businesses towards a permanent uh, installation in the downtown through some of these temporary activations. Um, a major factor in a successful commercial district is having a low vacancy rate. Um, and unfortunately, we've, we've suffered a lot of losses in the downtown uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, so being able to fill these spaces is really gonna create the vibrancy that the existing businesses need and, and can build off of. Um, and then looking at reducing barriers to entry, um, as Bonnie stated, you know, it's a really risky environment right now for new businesses to get started. So if we can help lower some of those barriers and create um, some stability for potential um, businesses, uh, it's going to be a really good resource to them to get um, get underway. And then um, we're looking at, um, you know, maintaining downtown, creating that exciting and dynamic uh, post-pandemic retail environment, hoping to get some fresh faces into these spaces, um, getting entrepreneurs that maybe haven't been able to access downtown and Pacific Avenue because of the high rental rates or just not having that um, you know long business experience being able to give them an opportunity to test out their concept here on Pacific Avenue um, and similarly really encouraging local entrepreneurship um, attracting women and people of color business owners into these spaces um, and giving businesses an opportunity to really test pilot some of their concepts um, where they might not be able to get their foot in the door with the landlord um, previously, just if they don't have that experience. Um, and so just to give you um, a picture of what we're dealing with downtown in terms of vacancies, um, some of the closures that we've experienced, uh, this map shows about 18, uh, vacancies just on Pacific Avenue alone. Um, and it also shows uh, 37 vacancies in the downtown uh, as itself. Um, so I've highlighted a few of our Pacific Avenue vacancies here, um, just to give you a picture of what these spaces look like. Some of these uh, have been vacant prior to the pandemic, uh, have been long running vacancies that could really use that uh, reinvestment and activation. Um, some of them are the result of the pandemic directly, just businesses not being able to hang on. Um, and then we also have opportunities like some of our brand new development at 1547 Pacific that you know opened during the pandemic and didn't even have a chance to really get their you know get their feet underway. Um, so looking at which of these spaces makes the most sense for this activation and uh, the property owners that are interested in taking part of this program, um, being able to fill some of these holes and really support. Uh, the businesses that are on those blocks um, by giving them some good new neighbors uh, that they can that they can partner with. Um, so the concept here uh, for the for the uh, downtown pops program is what we're calling a master lease uh, program. So um, with a master lease, the city would be um, the leaseholder with the property owners participating. Um, we would have a lease with the property owners that allows us to sublet uh, those spaces to individual tenants. Um, and it would also provide indemnification of both parties, which is really important for the property owners and for the city as leaseholder. Um, 
we, you know, our ultimate goal in downtown is to have long-term tenancies, and the property owners absolutely want to have that as well. So being able to have the opportunity, if a permanent tenant comes along, to be able to uh, free up a space that we might be using for this program for a long-term uh, tenant, we're going to have that in, in the lease agreement. Um, once we have those leases executed, um, we're issuing an RFP for prospective tenants, um, and we would execute license agreements with those tenants uh, to sublet the space. Uh, our I, our uh, intent here is to have a six-month lease on these spaces, um, which will give, uh, it'll run from June, uh, or sorry, July through December, so that'll give us a great summer season and into the holidays, um, which is really the peak time for downtown uh, that we need to have some coverage and activation in there. Um, the city will be collecting rent on behalf of our sublet tenants and, and paying it to the landlords. Um, and we'll be monitoring the, the tenant sales uh, production and doing percentage of sales uh, lease for those spaces. Um, and then uh, we'll show you some examples here of how um, our percentage rent and our minimum and maximum rents work um, to really illustrate how this format goes. Um, I'll, I'll get into those details uh, a little bit further. But on the tenant selection side, um, we're looking at creating an online application process uh, similar to what we've used for our other uh, programs, the Temporary Outdoor Expansion Program, um, as well as our micro loan program. We'll have that available in both English and Spanish, and um, we're gonna be doing a lot of outreach to broader community partners, really trying to um, you know, get a very diverse applicant pool here. Um, and we'll also be sure to provide one-on-one -on -one support for businesses who um, might need assistance with the application if they don't have access um, online or if they just need more help um, figuring out how to apply. We'll be happy to provide that assistance. Uh, and then in reviewing the applications, uh, we'll have a panel of representatives from the Downtown Association, the Downtown Management Corporation, as well as our economic development staff. Um, and we'll be looking for candidates that are a good fit um, and can, are ready to move into a space. Um, and we'll look at the appropriate locations of what we have available um, that'll best meet their business uh, operations. Um, we're really giving priority here for um, women and people of color. And then um, if businesses that do apply are not eligible for the program, um, we're going to help them um, you know, be ready for the next round. If there's another opportunity that opens up, if they need assistance with their business plan, we can help connect them to uh, the SBDC. Um, if they need any other resources, you know, we'll find them the right fit for what they need so that we can help them be successful. And then also consider other options if, um, if they're maybe fit for a, a longer term lease or something like that, we can help get them connected in that way as well. Um, really wanna be uh, driving strong businesses into spaces where they can be successful. Um, so an example of how uh, this could work with a 1,500 square foot space. Um, so if we have 1,500 square foot space, uh, the city is guaranteeing a minimum rent of $1 per square foot, so that would be $1,500, and then a maximum monthly rent to the property owner of $2 per square foot for a total of $3,000 uh, a month in rent. And just to give you um, some perspective on that, our downtown retail um, rents are typically around $2.70 right now. Um, they can be upwards of $3 or more. Um, so $2 is a pretty fair rate um, considering the circumstances that we're in right now. Uh, so in this example, we've got um, $45,000 gross income from the business. Um, with our percentage of sales uh, lease at 5%, that'll collect us $2,250, um, which equals to about a $1.50 um, per square foot rate. And so to get to that $2 maximum amount, the city would then uh, guarantee $750 towards that, towards that gap. Um, an example of if a business is uh, sort of having an overperforming month or um, very successful month here. Um, if they're collecting 65,000 in, in gross income, our 5% uh, of sales would be $3,250 or $2.17 per square foot, so over our maximum rents of $2. 
Um, what we would do in this instance is the city wouldn't need to provide any guaranteed rent because they're already covering that. And instead, um, we would be collecting that $250 reserve surplus there and holding that in account for the business to either be able to apply to their rent later on if they have a low performing month um, or be able to hold that for them if they need um, you know for their long-term growth so we can help if they're looking for a longer term space we can help hold that money and they can be able to use that for their next step um, and then in our final example here this is a uh, just that case where they're having a, an underperforming month, but we do have that reserve available. So as an example, they were only able to bring in 23,000. Um, so their percentage of, their 5% of sales is $1,150. So the city provides the dollar minimum guarantee and we can uh, provide the reserve of $250 that they had. And so they're able to get up to a rental amount of $2,900. So it's just under that $2 max. Um, but we were able to cover a bit of that gap with the reserve that they had from prior a uh, prior month. Um, and so I will turn it over to Bonnie for the timeline and next step. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so um, just giving you an overview, this is, a, a, you know, just like many of our programs during the pandemic, we're, we're trying to get up and, and running pretty quickly. And we do see the importance of looking at a six-month timeline, um, both for recovery, but the idea that we're trying to reduce the risk but uh, we want to evaluate the program starting in you know month three, month four, and if there are businesses that are doing really well, we don't need to be supporting them, you know, and making up the difference. Or we probably actually already haven't because we haven't need to subsidize. But we also don't need to be in the equation. So we want to be able to, for those businesses that are doing well, have the business negotiate for future lease terms directly with the property owner. So this is really a um, both, uh, you know, a, a sort of a stimulus program and recovery program. Program, and that's really what it's geared towards. So we're really looking at for the month of May, um, if you approve this today, to finalize the lease template um, and the license agreement, which we would most likely use that format um, for our subtenants. Um, and we secure the locations from property owners. We've been in discussions with um, the majority of the property owners that have vacancies downtown. We received some really good feedback um, about the program as well. And then we've also informally been um, obviously both working with the downtown association, the downtown management corporation, and just getting feedback from prospective businesses and, and entrepreneurs who are, have heard about this program and are really interested to apply. So we'll have the formal uh, process of soliciting and securing tenants. Um, Rebecca went through the details of what's involved in that. And then our goal is to hit the ground running um, at the beginning of July um, with initiating the six month leases. Um, we'll start reviewing, as I mentioned, October, November, um, the performance of those of those leases, and then come back to you to sort of tell you uh, kind of how the program's going, what our initial recommendations are um, for the program, if we recommend any of them to be continued and what's happening with the businesses. So that's our overview of the timeline and the next steps. Um, over the next, um, you know, six to eight months um, of the program. And next slide. And so um, the recommendation before you today, um, which the mayor read at the beginning, um, is to uh, you know approve the program for downtown Santa Cruz, um, approve the resolution uh, approving the budget adjustment for the program. And I'll stop here just a second to just. Um, uh, mention the ED Trust Fund. Um, and if you're not familiar with the ED Trust Fund, I know a number of you are, um, but for our new members on council, the Economic Development Trust Fund was created in the wake of um, the dissolution of the Redevelopment Agency. And it was specifically created by the city council um, so, so that the city, that we can continue to invest um, in our community and economic development projects and initiatives in order to create jobs and provide tax revenue for the community. So this is a fund that's specifically set aside for economic development initiatives. And this will be, uh, our proposal is to come from this fund to um, fund this program. The range for that program of up to 200,000, it could be substantially less. We wanted to give you the maximum of what the program could be depending on um, if all of the businesses in the program perform extremely low, which we aren't anticipating, 
Um, and we had to provide that maximum guarantee of a dollar per square foot for all of the leases. We wanted to make sure that we were fully covering the program, but we do expect it to come under the, um, the uh, total program costs um, that we're asking for the budget adjustment. The funding is available in the ED trust fund. And then finally, um, we're asking for a motion to authorize the city manager or his designee to execute any of the leases, license agreements, or related program documents to continue on this program under our pretty tight timeline. Um, so that's uh, the recommendation before you today, and Rebecca and I are, are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Bonnie and Rebecca. For that great presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and see if there are questions from council members. I see council member Cummings, council member Colontari Johnson, council member Watkins, council member Brown, and vice mayor Bruner. Thank you, mayor. And I just wanna thank the staff for bringing this forward. It's such a really great idea and, and something that, you know, not only will benefit some of the property owners whose businesses have been vacant, but it'll really give, you know, some people who wanna give their businesses a shot and opportunity to try it in a commercial space. And it's so exciting to, for what um, potentially may be to come and that the city can help support, you know, um, small local businesses to kind of launch themselves. So it's really exciting. And I just wanna express my appreciation as well for um, really, explaining um, why there's so much an emphasis on the downtown. That was something that I was kind of, you know, wanting to better understand and, and you all explained it really well that um, it's where we're seeing the greatest vacancy rates. And so I just really want to appreciate highlighting that so that, you know, especially when members of the community are reaching out to us that we can give them a, um, a clear answer as to, you know, why there's so much focus on downtown businesses. Um, I did have um, two really short questions. Um, the first question is, I was wondering if, is there any, well, actually, I'll, I'll ask that question next. I was just curious how many, because you all mentioned that there are 18 properties that are vacant, and I was just wondering how many of those, the people who you've done outreach to have expressed interest. Um, I, I know that some of those properties that are vacant are, are gonna be demolished um, for when the Laurel Street project uh, goes up, but I was just curious if, if there are other, uh, like how many, uh, of the property owners are, are really interested in this program. Yeah, uh, thank you, Councilmember Cummings, for that question. Um, we've had a series of stakeholder groups um, in the downtown um, with brokers and, and sort of representing the property owners to just sort of get a sense of, you know, how receptive are they to this program and this concept? And um, overall, they're very receptive. So, you know, we at the beginning we were talking about we, we hope to be able to enter into anywhere between eight, you know, and 12 um, leases over this period, which we think will make a big impact in the downtown. Downtown. So we've had a really good response. Um, so we're we're pretty hopeful that we'll be able to do that. Thanks. And then a uh, follow-up question. I was just wondering if there's any kind of type of business that's being targeted. So um, you know, I know there's you know there's retail and there's um, like restaurants and food service. So and I know that there's also you know discussions around well you know retail hasn't been doing so well and. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any, um, you know, if there's any attempt to target specific types of businesses or whether it's just gonna be open to any and all kind of businesses. So I'm gonna let Rebecca answer that, but I will say as part of the RFP effort, you know, we're gonna be encouraging the greatest response so that we can look at, you know, what, what are these creative ideas, sort of similar to the cards program, card program, it's like we're opening it up. Um, we have ideas of our own, and we've certainly received some ideas and working with some of our creative partners, both at the Downtown Association, Downtown Management Corporation, who also has some great ideas, um, and then Event Santa Cruz and some other folks out there. So we've been, we've been, a lot of things have been percolating, but we don't want to discourage people from applying um, because we just think that creativity is what's needed right now during the pandemic. Um, we will be vetting the, um, the proposals that come in with what's in the downtown so that we can sort of have this complimentary use. Um, with that, I probably said too much. I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca who um, may have some specific um, specific ideas to share. Yeah, thanks Bonnie. Um, I, you know, I think very similar to what Bonnie was saying, I think, you know, we're really interested in creating a good mix of um, 
of business types in the downtown, so complementary retail to, to the businesses that we already have there. Um, you know, we've always had uh, hopes of having children's toy stores there. We've had a pop-up of that over the holidays. Um, just things like that that are maybe filling the gaps um, that we don't already have downtown. And then, um, you know, the experiential retail and the experiential businesses is really the path forward for a lot of places. So. Um, if people have exciting ideas like that um, that we can get behind, we're definitely looking for those. Um, I think, you know, whatever we can get into this space with a really quick zoning process and um, and get them up and running uh, is going to be good, but um, definitely looking for some creative ideas. And I think, you know, we've always had a really interesting um, food business, uh, you know, industry here. And so if there's opportunities for pop-up um, restaurants, things like that, or any of the... Um, sort of artisan uh, food makers that we could get into spaces uh, that could be a really fun thing too. So just looking at um, what people are, are proposing and, and how it fits within the downtown. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Great, thank you so much, Bonnie and Rebecca, for um, the work on this and the presentation. I love the innovation and thinking out of the box. Um, I had some follow-up questions. Um, I'm really excited to see the focus on uh, women-owned and people of color businesses. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit about what that targeted approach, um, what that targeted outreach approach looks like. Um, and sort of along the same lines, what are some of the criteria that the selection committee will be looking at? And what would make someone ineligible? I heard you speak to that, Rebecca, that if someone's ineligible, then so those are those are kind of lumped together. And then I have another question. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to take that. Um, so in terms of targeted outreach, uh, definitely looking at some of our community partner organizations that maybe aren't in the traditional business support atmosphere. So, you know, we tend to really look at our chambers and, um, you know, the DTA, which is a fantastic partner and who's, we're going to be relying on heavily for this, but looking at, um, you know, the NAACP or, um, you know, Barrios Unidos or Community Bridges or any of those partners that um, are really reaching a broader audience than we might reach uh, within just our sort of business support silo um, and just trying to get entrepreneurs um, from outside of our normal networks. And then um, in terms of the eligibility or sort of what we're looking for in the application process, um, typically in these processes we'll ask for um, a a pretty basic business plan, um, some projections of what they're um, going to be looking at in terms of sales, um, what what uh, capital they already have um, at the beginning to help them get started, just so that we can know that you know they're going to be able to make the pay, you know the rental rates with how we've got it structured. Um, they're mm -hmm. going to be able to have sort of a good on ramp to get going. Um, yeah, so it's just making sure that they have like a base level of financial readiness, um, and then that they have a concept that they've that they've thought through and they've got that plan um, pulled together. And Bonnie, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that um, you know, depending on the ultimately on the spaces that we have, it's also what is that complementary use that also works for that space. So, mm -hmm. for example, there are a few spaces downtown um, that have multiple tenants that have a non-compete clause. You know, so there may be a great idea that we can't fit in a space if we don't have the right space for it or if there's a non-compete clause for that type of use. So we're going to be, you know, looking at it. That's why it's really exciting to have the opportunity to have multiple spaces. So hopefully for those ideas, we can find the right space for them. But there, there will be, just by the, you know, virtue of the number of spaces and the uses, um, some limitations that, that do govern um, what we can select for the spaces. And I'll also say another partner that we have um, that we've really relied heavily on um, during the pandemic has been the Economic Recovery Council and all of those participating businesses across the county and a support organization. Um, as we're working through the Economic, uh, Economic Recovery Council recommendations, um, mm -hmm. we'll be looking at those as well and coordinating with them to provide support um, across, across the county on this. Okay, great. And then um, my other question is, um, so it's a six-month pilot. Um, is there an opportunity for that business, if successful and, and if they've met the metrics, to stay beyond?
beyond the six months and if if not, or if they're not successful and, and we're transitioning them out, um, I don't know what the role of the city is, if any, but what, what is the role of the city in helping those businesses that weren't so successful find a landing place? Um, just to clarify, because um, I'm starting to answer for if they were successful, so maybe I'll just actually approach both. Um, okay. So if, if a business is really successful, we don't need to be in the, in the middle. We don't need to be in the equation. So as we're evaluating three, four months, and if they have hit on their 5% sales uh, a return that's $2 or greater, there's no reason for us to even be engaged anymore because we're not subsidizing anything. So we would encourage at that point, and that's why we have built in there those termination clauses of 60 and 90 days, is that if they're doing really well, we'll start that process and saying, you know, if, if, you know, coordinating them with the property owner landlord and really encouraging them to have a lease going forward on their own. Um, if it's a business that's not doing so well, that's part of sort of what we do in our partnership with SBDC now, is we try to get them that additional business support um, mm -hmm. and see if that can bring their sales up. And that'll be part of what we come back to you, you know, next November, mm -hmm. December, with sort of an evaluation of the program, um, seeing, you know, if they met with SBDC, if their sales in this brief period were able to increase because of that, what their plan is, and then we might make some recommendations for a longer period or might get them into some more um, support services at SBDC. Great, thank you so much. I have Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to our economic development team and just for bringing this to us. I think it's so awesome and really a great opportunity to incubate, you know, potential, and that's fantastic as well as we kind of envision our downtown, and we know downtowns need that uh, periodically, and this is one of those times. Um, probably no surprise to you is uh, one of the things that I have maybe a question or sort of an idea around is that if we're gonna target women, particularly women of color, we um, have to support them with their childcare needs. And it's hard for them to see themselves, um, you know, and I don't want to overgeneralize, but for many people who are struggling to stay home as well as to pursue entrepreneur, entrepreneurship um, and have kids without childcare, it seems really difficult to imagine that being possible. And so I guess um, one of my kind of slash questions would be how we could potentially see if some of those vacant spaces could be pop up after school or childcare facilities potentially um, and or other locations and um, really trying to complement and encourage uh, the, the success of those uh, female entrepreneurs and by doing so I think uh, what really off offer a lot of opportunity and support for them, as well as to encourage the childcare industry, which you know is really struggling as well. Um, so I don't know if you had any thoughts to that, but that was something that kind of came to mind um, when I was uh, kind of hearing the presentation, particularly the target population that we're speaking. And I had another question, but it escaped me. So it'll have to come back to me, because I was just, um, I was stuck on that one. But um, welcome your thoughts and or we can have further discussion later. Yeah, I'll just give you my initial thoughts and then Rebecca may have some more detail. Um, so part of our prioritization is for Pacific Avenue. However, there are many more vacancies downtown than just Pacific. And obviously on Pacific, we have some retail requirements, you know, for that ground floor retail. But I do think that there um, could be an opportunity, um, particularly if we had a council direction, um, to um, include uh, looking at a, a available space to have um, a sort of a companion pop-up around childcare. We would focus it, our preference would be to focus that off specific, um, but in the downtown. Perfect, well I'll go ahead and um, at, the, at the time make that as part of the motion, and I did remember my last bit. And I'm speaking on behalf of my 10-year-old daughter who was saying how she loved to see an indoor or some sort of um, place where you could have a skate park in our downtown, particularly an indoor one. She said, it's like if it's raining or whatever, and um, if there's big facility, like it's like she said that would be rad and awesome for kids. So I, I know that kids don't really feel they can have a voice in this, but since I have one who has shared with me this like many, many times, I'm speaking on her behalf. So this is for Evangeline. <laughs> And that's Thank it. Council member. Council member Thank Brown. You. 
and then Vice Mayor Bruner, and then Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. And then I'll take it up for public comment. Thank you. Um, and I, first I'll just second Evie's request. Uh, that's a great, that's a really great priority. And I know, um, you know, how, how uh, awesome it is for these skate parks that we have been able to develop in Santa Cruz. Uh, so I, um, let's see, I have two questions, I think. Um, I was really glad to see the priority for um, women-owned and, and BIPOC-owned businesses, and I, um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, it sure would be nice to think about, uh, you know, living wage jobs, well-paying jobs as part of that as well, to prioritize um, enterprises that um, intend to pay living wages. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, economic economic activity and you know um, vitality is measured by you know activation of those sites, and I, I think that's really important, and certainly sales tax revenues, but also by uh, you know in, income uh, generating opportunities, you know, in, in, in uh, for workers. So I, I'm I would hope that we could maybe include that as well in the prior, you know, just in terms of preference. Um, we have a living wage ordinance on our books, um, and we have for many years, for tw almost 20 years now, actually more than 20. And, um, you know, so we do have, and we have made a commitment, I think, just more generally through health and all policies and, you know, questions of equity um, that we want to attract those kinds of jobs. So I, I think it would be great if we could at least, um, you know, put that in there and um, make it clear that that's, a, you know, a priority for us. Um, and then I have a, so that's a kind of a question if you, if there's anything that you want to say about it um, from the staff's perspective before we move into deliberations and a motion. Um, and then the other question I have is, is related to the, the, the rent, the question of the downtown property owners, um, because I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, um, so, so the intention is to support the businesses, and I, I, I think that's absolutely critical right now. Um, and so, I, I do want to, um, you know, to support this. I'm wondering though, how? Um, so, some of these businesses, these storefronts, have been empty either for a while now or have never been occupied, and um, and somehow. Uh, the developers are not, um, or the, excuse me, the property owners are not um, losing, you know, they're not being foreclosed upon. There's, you know, there's, so there's some indication that they're able to um, carry on in this context. And so I'm just wondering if, um, you know, how that works in terms of subsidizing business, you know, property owners that may not need it. I've said this many times and, um, you know, I, I, We'll say it here in this context that, you know, I think that our job uh, as a as a city government and elected representatives is to represent the public interest, and I think that increased economic activity certainly is in the public interest. Um, but I also uh, so, and so, but I'm not sure to what extent that um, should involve subsidizing. Um, you know, uh, property owners, commercial property owners, um, rents. So I, you know, I, I just feel a little uncomfortable with it, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how. And I know there was some in the in the staff report, but just how you're you're envisioning that there are um, kind of differences in the um, different uh, property owners' ability to kind of manage with uh, a lower or you know reduced or no rents. Um, I'll just make a few general comments. Again, Rebecca may have some additional additional thoughts on this, but um, for the majority of the spaces that we're looking at, um, we are also focusing on some of the smaller spaces, which tend to have some of the higher turnover in the downtown. Some of the larger spaces are a bit of a challenge, um, and unless we look at doing license agreements and having multiple subtenants in there, that could be an interesting concept, but it's also an unusual concept. And it's one that many landlords and property owners aren't really going to be willing to take a risk on because, one, they don't have expertise in that area, or it's not a traditional uh, tenant, you know, to have to really handle or manage multiple tenants in a space. So I think we're looking at some of these non-traditional ideas, and it's not necessarily a matter of subsidizing the owner. It's, it's all about reducing the risk 
so that they take that opportunity and we really establish what could be some long-term viable options for the future of retail in the downtown. So I think we're doing a little experimentation, really trying to go creative and really stretch the envelope of uh, what can be possible in some of these, these tenant spaces as we move forward. I mean, Rebecca mentioned it earlier as we're looking at some experiential retail. I mean, we recognize that downtowns are changing with the impact of online sales. And so we're looking at what can be some non-traditional ideas or concepts that landlords, when they look at the surface of it, if it's not a tried and true, they're going to you know, be a little risk adverse on that front. So that's where we're putting some of our focus um, for this going forward. Obviously, we're balancing that because we're very conscious of, of particularly in this time of, of the um, commitment of, of city revenue. So we are you know, tr really trying to balance that. But we're also looking at uh, the majority of the spaces that are going to be a good fit for pop-ups. And that's not every space in the downtown. So it is really going to be a balanced approach. There are some spaces that may just not um, really, unless we can come up with a super creative idea, be a really good fit for this program. Thank you. Yeah, I, and I so I just I I appreciate the response, and I'm I'm trying to just grapple with the the tension there between supporting these you know potential new businesses and the creativity and the innovation that we obviously would love to see and. The, that part. So I appreciate your response, and um, I also just wanted to say that I am. Uh, uh, I, I really support the idea that Council Member Watkins brought, brought up about um, childcare, and there may be other, um, you know, other uses uh, in some of those spaces, maybe off of Pacific Avenue, um, that would be, you know, for you know, important for um, you know other other purposes for you know community needs. So thanks. Yeah. Thank Thank you for that. I just had one other thought on this that we've sort of talked back and forth. That's also as part of the thinking that went into us establishing the um, maximum uh, monthly, you know, square foot at two dollars a square foot. There are some landlords right now in the downtown that are getting substantially more than that. Um, so we're not we're not an option that someone's going to jump on and be like, oh my gosh, here's all this free money. I mean, from a an owner already, we are setting it what we, we think is enough to, to get interest, but it's not something that um, is going to be in itself compelling for uh, property owners who may have had long-term vacancies. Thank you, Bonnie. Next, I have Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Bonnie, for the work and the presentation. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I've received uh, correspondence as well as what Council Member Brown has brought up. And um, it could, uh, you know, the concern of it um, being supportive to property owners. Um, but I really have to say that I'm really glad in the presentation you kind of took a step out and showed the, that this is a piece in the whole picture um, of uh, a lot of the com community support programs and the current small business uh, support programs and um, that this, you know, I think it's... Um, in the in that this supports those small businesses and the health and well-being of the neighborhood um, in addition you know to the properties when they're when they're vibrant and activated we see a whole lot less of um, you know uh, some of the conditions that are downtown and it really helps the the small businesses are hanging on by threads right now we you know i keep track of the businesses as part of my job um and even though we have more vacancies downtown 17 of those businesses have left downtown during the pandemic and you know some of them moved consolidated to their other locations. Some went to online only, others closed down completely. Um, you know, and, and I think it was Council Member Cummings brought up the um, Laurel Pacific Front development that has started there. So, you know, we had six businesses on the 800 block of Pacific Avenue just there that had to leave, you know, they were on limited leases. 
Um, and some moved. Uh, Avatar import, Imports, for example, moved down the street further in Pacific Avenue. But, um, you know, it, this, this uh, has so much potential, and I'm glad um, that all those little details were worked out in terms of the, the length of time, the six-month pilot program, the tenant reserve fund, all of that. And so maybe um, speaking to some of the questions I've received, if you could just quickly um, talk about Downtown Commission, Downtown Management Corporation, Downtown Association, and the difference there in those three and why it was not brought to the Downtown Commission or why that was not mentioned. Uh, we actually are happy to take it to the Downtown Commission, but uh, historically the Downtown Commission has um, is largely responsive to the Downtown Parking District. And so I think over recent years, we've been really engaged with them, I should say actually even during the pandemic with the Outdoor Expansion Program. But typically it is around sort of the parking district. And in fact, the Public Works Department staffs that uh, commission and a lot of what they approve on are related to transportation and parking um, specific issues. Issues. So um, that's why we didn't uh, take it to the, the downtown commission, but we actually are, are uh, happy to, um, you know, sort of vet it and, and give a presentation to them. We, um, I will say, sort of the overlap we have with the downtown um, management corporation and the downtown association is that some of the um, commissioners on the downtown commission are also downtown businesses and are very familiar with the program um, because we've had really active outreach um, on this um, with, the, with the downtown association and, and with the downtown management corporation. The downtown management corporation, and I, I'm, I'm looking at you, uh, council member Bruner, but I know you know this, um, so I should just look in general. Um, but uh, the downtown management corporation is a property-based improvement district in the downtown, and it includes representatives of property owners and downtown businesses and then some city representatives. And it's an assessment district um, that actually uh, helps support and fund the ambassador program that the downtown association runs. And the downtown association is a business improvement district um, and those uh, that assessment is um, paid by business licensees and um, the, um, or the business assessment district that businesses pay um, to be part of that. And it's largely um, a management um, marketing and um, it's part of the budget of the downtown association. So they're really focused on downtown and marketing downtown, where I would say the overlap with the downtown management corporation is it's often additionally focused on safety and security and sort of larger um, property-based concerns. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and um, and the assessment fees that would be um, assessed on these properties during this program, who would pay that? So uh, the t if though it would work the same as it does now. So the city would not pay those fees. They, if the property owner, um, it, it, it's interesting right now because many property owners will pass those on to the tenants, but not all do. So whatever the system in place that's worked now, um, that would be the additional um, charges if those are passed on to the businesses that they pay now. So um, for some properties, um, they do as far as the Downtown Management Corporation for those property-based assessments, um, they pay those on behalf of all the tenants and sometimes then that becomes part of their CAM fees. So um, their you know, common area maintenance fees. So those would still be what the tenant would pay on top of the rent. So the city is coming in and we are guaranteeing a minimum of a dollar, you know, up to a dollar per square foot for rent, but we're not paying any of the other um, related fees. Great, thanks. And for just to add on that, we we can uh, we would prorate as well for the shortened time period. Some of them are annual fees, um, and so we can prorate those so that they're only paying for the portion that they're using. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Council Member Watkins mentioned uh, her daughter Evie. <laughs> I've had the same dream for 1117 Pacific Avenue, the old logos building for a roller skate rink. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So, um, but yeah, so I know that um, some of the smaller uh, locations are being identified for this program and really um, uh, the, the, the emphasis on that equity of uh, diversity and business types and women and uh, BIPOC community entrepreneurs. So um, thank you. Those were the end of my questions. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, I will take it out to the public now for public comment. And I see that we have two callers. One ends in the number 1424. Please press star six and you'll be unmuted. Hi, this is Jorian Wilkins calling in from the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz. Um, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, well, I'm really heartened by the enthusiasm of the council in your comments and definitely appreciate the initiative of um, staff in proposing this exciting uh, recovery initiative for downtown. Um, I wrote into you earlier that um, you know we really believe this program will help fill downtown's vacant spaces, which have increased by over 20% last year. Um, this program is needed to keep our neighborhood activated and vibrant, um, discourage the negative behaviors that are attracted to unoccupied space, and to enable our community's entrepreneurs to bring their energy downtown to be part of rebuilding the heart of Santa Cruz while building the next generation of community businesses. Um, in short, it's, uh, you know, we represent the existing businesses who are already um, have lived through this pandemic, and it's a lot easier to run a thriving business next to another thriving business. It's a lot harder to run a thriving business next to a ported up window. Um, so thank you very, very much to staff and to council. Thank you so much for calling in. Uh, next up is caller ending in uh, phone, uh, number 0030. Press star six and you'll be able to speak. Hello, uh, this is Rafa Simonfeld. Um, first off, I just wanted to uh, say uh, the uh, uh, Downtown Pops program, if that's what it's called, sounds really great and seems like a really good opportunity for, for our community. Um, the, what I wanted to add was um, I would hope that there is a way for us to um, look at uh, trying to uh, uh, provide more opportunities for folks to get out of their cars and for new businesses who maybe wouldn't necessarily be able to afford some of the uh, parking fees that they normally might have to pay. Uh, uh, in the course of this uh, this pilot program, maybe there's a way for the city to explore uh, eliminating some of the parking fees that uh, that might have to get paid. Uh, for example, if a uh, storefront uh, was converted uh, had a different use type or something like that, it just seems like like this is a good opportunity to um, uh, explore. Um, uh, you know, offering opportunities for businesses that wouldn't necessarily be able to afford uh, to to succeed without some uh, some parking pilot programs, um, and and it w could be a way to help uh, uh, explore the possibility of of decoupling the costs of parking for businesses uh, from from the uh, the use space. Um, you know, we might end up having to have just certain types of businesses that can sit downtown because of the kinds of fees that those businesses have to pay. And if there are um, there are ways to uh, have alternative structures for for these businesses uh, to to test out what they're doing, um, I think that's that's great for for uh, entrepreneurship and managers. Thank you. Okay, I will bring this back to council for deliberation and we'll look for the motion here. Let me grab my agenda. 
So I will look for a motion from council. I see uh, council member Watkins and council member Colin Johnson. And again, this is the vacant storefront activation pilot program, downtown pops and uh, three items to the motion. Uh, council member Watkins. Yeah, and, um, I'm happy to move the recommendation as presented in the agenda report. Um, shall I go ahead and read that, Mayor? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so my motion would be to authorize the creation of a vacant storefront activation program in downtown Santa Cruz, uh, to adopt a resolution approving a budget adjustment from the Economic Development Trust Fund uh, to fund the six-month pilot program, um, to authorize the city manager or his or her designee to execute in a form approved by the city attorney any leases, uh, licenses, or other such agreements, documents, or administrative duties necessary for implementation of the downtown POPs program. And then I have one additional um, add to the, to the motion, which is to direct staff to look into the reuse of other vacant space for pop-up childcare uh, to complement this program. Okay, and Council Member Contari Johnson. Thank you, I'll second that motion. And, and just wanna add um, Evie's uh, skate comment, just made me think as, as we're thinking about businesses and types of business we wanna attract, that um, it would be great to think about a family-oriented environment that, that youth can um, uh, get benefits from. So just Evie's comment made me think, yes, let's think about the families and youth and what would attract families downtown. Thank you. Great. And uh, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. Now, I just wanted to ask the maker of the motion if you would be willing to add a preference for uh, business enterprises that intend to pay living wages to their employees. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. We're fine with that. And um, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, this is, an, this is just a comment, um, but I also hope that there might be consideration in some of the, you know, if there's spaces that are um, maybe not on Pacific Ave, but that are vacant in the downtown area, that there might also be consideration for nonprofits that are looking to provide day services for homeless individuals, because I know that um, Recovery Cafe has been interested in, you know, trying to find space possibly in the downtown where they can, you know, provide day services and provide people who are experiencing homelessness somewhere to go. And, you know, I think it could be really beneficial for the downtown if we had a place for some of the, some people to go to so that they wouldn't necessarily just be stuck kind of wandering around downtown and, um, and occupying some of those spaces. So, and it's an opportunity for those individuals <clears throat> to get connected to services and um, receive support and potentially, um, you know, can better and improve their lives. So I just wanted to put that out there that if, um, that I know that Recovery Cafe has reached out a number of times and they might be interested and I hope we can consider somewhere if, if they may be able to um, um, open services and be a part of this program. And also it would be a great pilot since it's just six months. So those are my comments. Okay, great. Mayor, can I ask a question really quick? Sure. Before we, if, if, if that's appropriate at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, just because there is interest in Evie's idea, which I think too is a really great idea, because I think especially with activation of and a safe place for families and kids, and I think there could be a storefront with potential uh, for retail if necessary. But could it be possible to have a pop up like that, it, or has like I mean I know it's sort of a different type of use, but could that also be a potential pop up opportunity? Yeah, I'll I'll weigh in there. Um, Yes, um, we actually have been talking with Event Santa Cruz uh, about some non-traditional sort of experiential that concept of how do you activate space and potentially bring people down to downtown that don't normally come downtown, you know? So something like that could be something um, that, you know, has has a level of interest. So we just have to balance that with, um, you know, leveraging the funding that we have in the program and, you know, that minimum rent, because we're trying to, we're, right. we're trying to balance getting the most leverage and the most spaces filled with the with the funding that we have. So we kind of need to look at that. But 
one of our, which we didn't go into detail here, one of our goals um, also is to help activate. And um, part of a larger effort that we've had in the downtown for some time is that activation of public spaces. So whether it's indoors or potentially outdoors, we've been looking at both and looking at what are those what are those, you know, really interesting and creative ideas? Um, and certainly roller skating is one of those. My daughter recently has taken up roller skating and just, at, you know, goes everywhere. Um, so I think that's resonating with a, with a lot of uh, folks right now. So um, I, I think that's something that we'd be happy to look into. Awesome. And she would get mad at me if I didn't say it, it was actually for skateboarding because she uh, okay. <laughs> roller skating is great too. Um, that is, as you're exploring the potential for that, there's the the rotary um, a pump track that they did in partnership with the parks department, I think is at the Grant Street Park right now. But there could be, you know, ways to, to leverage and partner our, park, our parks services and programs and partnerships beyond um, what we have in mind. So anyway, thank you. Okay, that's my last comment, Mayor, thank you. You're muted, uh, Mayor. Uh, we have a motion. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Brown, did you have another question or comment? No, you're good? No. No. Oh, no, I just didn't lower my hand, sorry. Okay, no worries. Uh, we have a, a motion by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Cal Councilmember Calentari Johnson to go with the staff recommendation of authorizing the creation of a vacant storefront activation program in downtown Santa Cruz, adopt a resolution approving a budget adjustment from the Economic Development Trust Fund to fund the six month pilot program, authorize the city manager and his or her designee to execute um, any of the forms of leases, licenses, and agreements as necessary to implement downtown POPs program. There was also direction to staff to look for the potential for um, use of downtown vacant um, storefronts for um, uh, child care services and to express um, in uh, advertising materials um, the intent for people who are um, supporting a living wage as well. I think that captures everything. So we'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. If I could just add, ask for clarification, um, Councilmember Cummings, your um, comment about consideration for nonprofits looking for day services, was that um, just a comment or were you asking to put that in the motion? That was a comment and I guess I should just ask um, city staff, would, does that need to be a part of the motion or would, could nonprofits be considered um, currently as the, the pop-up um, program stands? Um, you know, we hadn't contemplated that particular use when we were brainstorming, but I, I, we don't, we certainly were thinking nonprofits in general could be eligible depending on what they were proposing for the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just a comment. I don't, I don't think there's a need to include in the motion because it sounds like it, it's already covered. Okay, great. Do a roll call vote, please, Bonnie. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. <clears throat> Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Can you say that again? You are muted, sorry. Aye. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion uh, passes unanimously. Okay, our last item tonight is um, oral communications. So thank you, Bonnie and crew, for that wonderful program, and I have the feeling it'll be wildly successful. Thank you, Mayor. And if I could just say one last thing, I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, some of our partners and staff who worked on this. Um, I did mention at the beginning, you know, obviously the Downtown Association, the Downtown Management Corporation, but many of our businesses, stakeholders have given us so much feedback um, on how to go forward and do this. So I just wanted to acknowledge them and thank them. And then particularly thank Rebecca Unit and actually David McCormick, who um, wasn't part of the presentation today, but was definitely behind the scenes. Um, brainstorming and coming up with some really great ideas of how to make this program successful. So I just wanted to acknowledge them and thank you. Um, thanks to all of you for your support. 
Thank you so much, Bonnie. Okay, uh, so the next item we have is oral communications. Mayor, can I ask, can I ask one final question? Yeah, let's All right. <laughs> make it quick, though, because... Yeah. Uh, I was just curious, Bonnie, um, so when this program gets rolled out, where, like what website or where should people kind of go if they want more information? I'll let Rebecca answer that. <laughs> uh, so we'll have all of our information on com, and we'll make sure to link to that um, from the main city website. Um, but yeah, we'll be sure to send out to the council um, that webpage when it's up and running for you all. Thank you. Great. Okay. We'll move on to oral communications tonight, and this is a time for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communi communications, now is the time to call in. Oral communication instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. And I am looking at our attendees today. I am not seeing any hands. So uh, with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you everyone for attending today and we will see you in a couple weeks. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Goodbye.